Hello guys, how are you all? Welcome to my channel. So, today we are gonna see, what if Naruto gains all 9 Bijuu and the ultimate Sharingan, part 1, subscribe if you enjoy the video, let's start the story. The cages and the elemental nations lost the fight against the fully revived Madara Chiha, and now he and Sasuke were performing the ritual to seal the final Kaiubi into the seal and revive the Juubi, so Madara can become its host and rule the world. Nine ethereal dragons came out of the demon statue Jito Mezo and headed for the unconscious form of Naruto Uzumaki Namikas. When they wrap around the blonde's body, they form into an orb, and Naruto floats into the air. Madara smirks behind his mask, while Sasuke smiles evilly also. Soon I shall have the power of the Juubi, and the world will be mine. Madara says. In the end you have failed. Now the world belongs to the Achiha clan like it should have in the beginning. The prick says, and chuckles evilly. They started the process, and the demon statue started to act up and tremble. The chakra coming out of the dragon turned white and started to reverse itself, shocking Madara and Sasuke. What's going on here? The founder of Kanoha yelled while Sasuke kept looking at the scene in shock. Madara narrowed his Sharingan eye on the blonde and noticed a smirk on his face. He then saw Naruto mouth a word with his lips, and Madara's eyes widened in horror when he realized what he said. Fool. No, he couldn't have Sasuke stopped them. He yelled out in fear while Sasuke looked at him like he's crazy. Why? We are close to obtaining the ultimate power Madara, so why are you he was cut off by his ancestor, releasing a blast of murderous intent upon his only surviving relative. Don't be stupid. He's placed a power on himself that'll reverse the effects of the ceiling. We must stop it. Madara declared until the reversal in the chakra started to move faster and faster, until the black vortex formed around the seal on his stomach, and the chakra of the other tailed eight beasts started to get sucked into the vortex. Madara's eye widens even more when he sees what's happening. All the effort and planning he made throughout the years in order to make the world his and control with the power of the original Biju and the power of his ancestors was all thwarted and by a mere child. His eyes glowed in anger and rage, and he grits his teeth in fury. No no my plans. That damned Uzumaki has ruined my plans. He yells out and tries to cancel them by forcing his chakra into the ritual, but it doesn't work, and he curses. Sasuke help me stop the jutsu. He yells out getting a nod from the teenager. He adds his chakra to cancel that, but it fails, and something else happens. He notices his hands fading away and being stretched and drawn to the vortex. The wind directing to the vortex grows stronger, and Sasuke's eyes widen in horror as he is drawn into the sea. WH what's going on I'm being drawn into the vortex. He says and tries to pull himself away using his chakra only to be drawn in faster. No this can't be happening this can't be happening. Damn you done. Damn you. He cries out as his head and the rest of his body stretches out and gets sucked into the vortex. Madara saw this and the same thing was happening to him. Naruto started to chuckle and then laugh as this was happening. He trembled in fury and glared at the blonde with every single ounce of hatred he could muster. Damn you damn you Hashirama and your Uzumaki brethren. Damn you Minato Namikas and your family for ruining my ambitions. I will not die like this. I am immortal. I am an Ichiha. I am good. He screams out in denial as he is sucked into the vortex while the multicolored chakra continues to enter the vortex that was on Naruto's stomach. Naruto's mindscape. He opened his eyes to the familiar blood red walls, but inside the cage was a rather house surrounded by grass and wildflowers. It wasn't overly big like that of a mansion, but it had two stories and had a lot of room. He looked around and noticed the lake, river and waterfall behind the house and foxes running around yipping. He smiled and shook his head at this. Itomi-chan. He called, waiting for the Riti to walk out of the red house. The door soon opened and the sight made his eyes go wide. The woman with blood red hair walked out of the house with no shoes on, leaving her feet out for the world to see. Her toenails were painted blood red, and they wriggled as they walked through the green grass. His eyes traveled around her body, and he looked at her sleek and smooth legs that curled up her body and hid themselves away under a miniskirt. Her skirt was a red-orange color, and it went up to her curvy waist. Her black shirt had a red nine-tailed fox on it, and it fit her hergless figure perfectly, and it showed off her bust, which was a nice size, but not too big. Her arms swung at her sides as she walked, the nails painted black and red as she sauntered over to him. He can clearly see the muscles which were lean and increased to her feminine appearance. His eyes traveled from her torso to her slender pale neck and ivory skin that was light and soft, it would make you want to kiss it. As she approached the blonde, he looked into her ruby red slit eyes and his expression went from happiness to sadness and sorrow. Hitomi Chan I he starts to say until she puts her finger on his lips to silence him, smiling sadly at the young sage. I know Naruto-kun, but it is the only way. 
If there was another way I would have found it, but sadly I'll end up being one with the other also, and you will be the new Juubi in a way because you'll have its power. You've also gained both Madara's and Sasuke Sharingan's, as well as their abilities when you absorb their souls into yours. You also have the Eternal Manjiku Sharingan, and the DNA of the Achiha clan is now part of you. Once you absorb the other eight, and then me I'll be no more dot. She finishes, and looks down at the ground, and notices droplets falling on the ground. She looks up, and sees Naruto's shoulders shaking, and tears falling from his face in anger, and sorrow. It deeply hurt her to see her lover in such a state, and that this has happened to him, but it had to be done otherwise the world would have ended under the rule of Madara for all eternity. Be damn it this isn't fair first my family, then my friends, my godfather and godmother, and now you. Why Kami? Why do you always take away those I love? He chokes out in sorrow. Hitomi pulled him into a hug while he sobbed into her shoulder, and she rubbed his back and stroked his hair. I know Nerukan, I know. Life can be cruel to even those who don't deserve it. I'm sorry. I want you to know that I love you too, and she started to fade, and Naruto's eyes widened in fear as he looked at her while more tears fell from his eyes. She smiled at him while tears also fell from her eyes. Goodbye. She fades away into a shower of sparkles. Naruto falls to his knees as the house, forest, and everything else fades away, and he's left into a black void. Naruto looks at the darkness with his hair shadowing his eyes. He then clenches his fist so tightly that his knuckles pop and blood seeps through his fingers. He then draws his head back and lets out an agonizing scream while tears flew from his face. Outside his mind. Goodbye Hitomi-chan he whispered as tears fell from his face as he continued to absorb the rest of the chakra. After that, the demon statue turned to sand and dissolved while Naruto fell to the ground and hit it with a thud. He then opens his cerulean slit blue eyes and looks up at the dark cave. He then slowly gets up but then feels a huge amount of pain in his eyes and clutches his face. He rolls over onto his knees and starts to shake while a black aura surrounds his body. It then goes from black to rainbow colored and it flares around the trembling cave. He then smashes his fist into the ground, creating a small crater, and then does it a few more times making the crater bigger every time. He then rears his head back and then lets out an earth-shattering yell, and a large pillar of multicolored chakra shoots out of his body and tears through the cave. It shoots up into the cloudy sky and causes it to slowly clear. He collapses and pants heavily while sweat drips from his face. He then slowly gets up and opens his eyes. They were now red and it had a six-bladed windmill shuriken, but a small hexagonal star shape was on the inside of the shuriken. Naruto walks over to a small pond of water and looks down at it to see his eternal Manjiku shuriken reflect off the water. Well Madara team I guess I have to thank you and Sasuke for these eyes. He then feels the knowledge from Madara's and Sasuke, as well as the abilities of their Sharingan go through his mind. After that, he focuses his eyes and finds himself being warped out of the cave. On a hilltop, a pair of black sandals appear, then black cargo pants and a dark green flak jacket and the Yandame's cape appears. After that, a masculine face and wild spiky blonde hair appear. Naruto finds himself standing on the hilltop while looking at the destroyed and ruined environment and sighs sadly. If only I knew a way to prevent this from happening. He says, but then realizes something, and smirks. He focuses his eyes, and says only one word. Hamui. He says. The sky turns into ripples, and a human-sized vortex appears in front of him. He then jumps into it, and the vortex disappears. Dimensional vortex. Naruto is now flying through the multicolored ripples and lights, and his eyes are squinting from the flashes. Naruto then starts to feel funny, and his body starts to twist and turn, and then it starts to get all wavy, as if it was changing. He then sees a flash of white light and is consumed by it, as does everything else, everything else becomes white, and Naruto blacks out. After being out for a while he hears a feminine yet young voice. Aniki Aniki the voice calls out. Naruto lets out a groan when a body jumps on his torso. Aniki, wake up. It yelled again. Naruto then opens his eyes slowly, and his vision was blurry at first. The face he saw was barely visible, but he did see red hair. When his vision becomes clear, he sees the face of a girl who seemed to be six. She had the same blue eyes as him, but her hair was red and it stopped to her back. She was wearing a red shirt and black pants. Naruto blinks at her for a while and the redeed raises her brows. Aniki. She asks and that's when Naruto screamed in her face and she jumped off his waist and fell off the bed hitting her head on the ground. Naruto jumps up and looks around frantically. Who? What? Where the heck am I? He yells out as he sees he's in a large room and not that filthy apartment. He then looks at his hands and gasps. He jumps off the bed and lands on the ground and runs to a mirror that was on a dresser. He looks at himself and his eyes nearly bulge out of his head. 
He was six years old again, but this time he looked like his father. The Reedy gets up rubbing her head in pain and glares at her brother. And hey, Nikki, what is your problem? Why did you do that? She demands. Naruto turns around and sees the Reedy who was walking towards him. She then stops and crosses her arms while staring at her brother. Naruto again stares at her and points a finger at her. WH who are you? He asks and the girl looks at him in shock. What do you mean who am I? I'm your twin Shinku. She yelled at him while Naruto jaw dropped. What? I have a sister a twin sister. But how? He thought while Shinku just puffs her cheeks up at him. How could you forget that we're siblings, you baka? She wanted to know. Naruto stopped contemplating on this and decided to act differently now, so he rubbed the back of his head in embarrassment. Heh, sorry I didn't recognize you Amato, I'm still waking up from my nap. He lied, but was inwardly sweat dropping, as Shinku gave him a look of suspicion, but then shrugs. That was when they heard the door downstairs slam open, and the two ran down the hall and saw Kashina walk in the house with a pissed off expression. She was wearing a red and black ninja outfit with a green flak jacket on. Her long red hair was tied into a ponytail, and strapped to her back was her okatana. Naruto's eyes widened when he saw her mother and couldn't help but smile due to the fact that she was alive at this time. Shinku was the first to come downstairs with Naruto following her. Kashina removes her sword and sits down on a black couch rubbing the temples on her face. She then mumbles about those bastards on the council and here is in not growing a backbone and dealing with them. Ever since Minato died and Kashina became the head of the Namikas and Uzumaki clan, the civilians and elder council have been demanding that she hand the boy over to be executed or turn into a weapon, but today they went too far. The elders and civilians were demanding that Kashina have her son and daughter become a breeding factory when they turn 15, so that the two clans can be revived for the good of the village, and the moment they said that Kashina killed four of the civilians with her sword. And after beating Danzo within an inch of his life, she ripped her headband off her head and threw it at Hiruzen, stating that she quit and she's retiring from the ranks and taking her children and everything Minato left to her and their children. As well as everything her clan created out of the village. Hiruzen and the clan council tried to reason with her, but she told them to piss off and left, but not before warning Saratobi that if he even thought about stopping her, she'd reduce half of the ninja population. She then felt two tugs on her pant legs and saw Naruto and Shinku looking at her. She smiles at the men ruffles their heads. Kasan are you okay? Naruto asked his mother. She looked at them both and gave them each a warm and loving smile. Hey you two go to your rooms and go pack your things. We're leaving Konoha. She instructed and Shinku's eyes widened as did Naruto's. Why Kasan? Naruto asks and Kashina sighs. Because you two are not safe here anymore now go on. Your godfather will be here soon she says, and they nod. Naruto was confused at first, but then realized that this timeline was different from the original. So he and Shinku went upstairs to pack up their things. Three hours later. The house was now empty, and Kashina had three large scrolls on her back. One was black, the other was red, and the last one was blue. Naruto and Shinku were wearing the same thing and had their packs on their backs. Kashina then takes each of their hands, and when they exit out of the compound gates, a puff of smoke appears, and when it clears Inu, Akami, Hibi, and Niko appear in their Anbu masks. Kashina narrows her eyes and stares at them, reaching for her sword until Inu waves his hand in front of her. W wait. Kashina-sama. The Hokage didn't send us. He replies while the other three nod. Kashina stares at them for a moment and removes her hand from her sword, getting a sigh of relief from them. So why did you four come here? Kashina asks. Kakashi removes his Inu mask and speaks up. We want to leave with you Kashina-sama. He replies, getting a shocked look from her. May I ask why Kakashi? Kashina asks, and the copy nin sighs. Well you see Kashina you and Minato-sensei were like a mother and father to me since my parents died and I think of Naruto and Shinku as my and dot. I promise and say if anything were to happen to him or you then I'd look after them and if I have to become a missing nin to make sure they're safe then I will. He says, and Kashina looks at Akami who nods and removes her mask, revealing Rin's face. Same here Kashina-sama. Rin said while well, Niko and Hibi removed their masks, revealing Yugao and Anko. And why do you two want to join? Kashina asks her former students. To be honest, Sensei I am also tired of how the villagers in Kanoha treat Naruto-kun, and I don't wish to protect a village that would dishonor the dying wish of the man who saved us from absolute destruction. The female user says. Kashina looks at Anko, and she also speaks up. You already know my reasons. She says, and rubs her left shoulder blade. Kashina looks at them for a while, then smiles. Very well, you all may join us, but where is your equipment? She asks, and Kakashi smiles. 
I sealed them up, and Pakin, and the pack took them back to the summoning realm. He answers. Oh, well let's go. Jirei is waiting for us at the west gate. She ordered, and they nodded. Kakashi picks up Naruto, and places him on his shoulders, and Rin does the same with Shinku. They manage to make it out of the west gate, and are now running on the path, until a puff of smoke appears, and a horse-sized toad that was black and red is seen on the path. They all stop when they see the frog, and Kashina smiles. About time you showed up Jiraiya. She says, and that's when a man with long wild spiky hair appears on the toad's head with a grin on his face. Well well, if it isn't Kashina and her Gakus. Naruto eyes twitches at being called a brat, but then a smirk appears on his face. Hey Iro Senen. He says out loud getting gasps from the four former Anbu and causing Jiraiya to fall off the toad. Ashina had to hold in a laugh, and Shinku was laughing and pointing a finger at her godfather who got up with an angry expression on his face. Don't call me that in public. He yells, and Naruto only grins. Jiraiya calms down and looks at the other four. Hey Kashina, why are they with you? He asks, and Kashina shrugs. They wanted to join me. Now we need to just find a village. Iwa is definitely out of the question, and Sana is allied with Konoha, Kiri is still in the middle of a war, and the minor countries aren't strong enough to handle Konoha right now. So my only option is Kumo. What do you think of Jiraiya? Kishina asks, and Jiraiya rubs his chin in thought. I say Kumo is our best option. They are neutral to Konoha, and they also have two containers like Naruto, but the thing is that they treat them like guardians instead of pariahs. They also happen to be related to the Rakage with one being his younger brother and the other his niece. I believe the girl is the container of the Nibi no Nekamata, and his brother contains the Hachibi no Ushi. He answers, and her eyes widen in shock. I see. Well it is. Now let's go. I don't want to stay here and wait for that warhawk to send his drones after us. Iwagao pulls out her ninjato and vanishes, shocking everyone, and then the sound of two slashes and screams are heard, and she reappears with a bloody sword in her hand and swipes the blood away. We have to get out of here and fast. She says, and Kashina curses. You four, get Naruto and Shinku out of here. She yells, and they nod and shunshin away. The toad disperses, and Kashina pulls out her Okatana, as she and Jurei were surrounded by 20 Rit Ninja, who had their blades drawn. Where is the demon brat and the girl? The leader demands, but instantly regrets it when a murderous grin forms on Kashina's face, and Jurei cracks his knuckles. Is that crippled old fool serious? Sending only 20 of you to deal with us? I'm insulted. He complained. I'm gonna enjoy carving you fools up. The redhead says, and then charges at the soon-to-be-dead Rude Anbu. Order of High no Kuni and Kaminari no Kuni. The Kashi, Rin, Anko, Yugao, Naruto, and Shinku were waiting at the border for Kishina and Jiraiya. The twins were sitting under a tree, and Shinku was sleeping on her brother's lap. Naruto was resting his head on the tree with his eyes closed and was in his mindscape. Mindscape. Naruto is now the same as he was when he was in the future. He walked up to the cage and sensed a powerful aura coming from the other side. That was when a pair of large red slit eyes opened from the opposite side as a pair of long white shark teeth and the figure growled. The what are you doing here Yandane Kayubi no Yoko roared out while the entire place shook violently. Naruto simply stood there staring at the vixen before a small smile formed on his face. Sorry to disappoint you Hitomi-chan, but I am not my father. Naruto answers. Her eyes widened in shock because standing before her was her vessel, and not Minato Namikaze, the man who sealed her away like Hashirama and Mito did, but what surprised her the most was that he knew her name, since no one short of her creator father figure ever called her that. She narrows her eyes in suspicion for a bit before her entire body glows, and she is now in her hybrid form. Naruto walks up to the cage and looks into her ruby red slit eyes. Care to tell me how you know my name, my dear vessel? She questioned. Naruto's smile grew and proceeded to roll up his right sleeve. Hitomi watched as a series of complex seals formed around his forearm and into the palm of his hand while a spiral appeared around his palm. He reaches for the paper that said seal on it and rips it off, revealing a lock to the gate and then pulls up his shirt, showing the shiki fuin pattern on his stomach. As blue chakra flames form on the tips of his fingers, he places his hand around his torso and twists it counterclockwise, resulting in the lock clicking and slowly unlocking until the gate split apart and open up. The vixen remained stunned beyond belief as she witnessed her vessel free her from her seal, unaware of Naruto who reaches out and places his hand on her face, and she tenses up at the contact but then calms down and purrs when he strokes her right ear. The simply put it hit him Chan, I am not from this time and am from another realm like this, only it was destroyed by the man who used you to fight Shadame and my father. He says and feels her release a lot of Kai in his mind. Madara Chiha I swear if I ever see that man I'll rip him apart. 
she snarled in anger. Naruto approaches her angry form and pulls her into a hug, making her freeze up from the contact since she had never experienced this form of contact once in her life. WH what are you doing? She questioned, startled at the physical contact only for Naruto to pull away, and his gaze met hers. She was baffled by the amount of emotion she could see emitting from his eyes, ranging from happiness to regret and sorrow, and she wondered what it was about this that made her feel slightly warm. I lost you once in my timeline hidden chan, a small blush appears on her face when she hears the suffix when I was captured by that man, and another Ichiha, they were preparing to extract you and seal you into a demonic statue in order to revive the Jubi. But I created a seal that reversed the effects and I ended up absorbing the spirits of the other eight including you. I also absorbed Madara's and the other Ichiha's souls and powers into my being gaining this. He closes his eyes and opens them again, revealing a pair of red eyes with a six-bladed shuriken on the outside and a hexagonal star shape on the inside. Her eyes widened in shock as she looked into the eyes that Madara Ichiha had, only they weren't filled with malice, hatred, and evil. They were filled with compassion, kindness, and love. The aura she sensed from those eyes was one of protection. In my time we fell in love and I had created a seal that would have set you free which I just currently used. I'm also in a way the new Jubi since its power and soul is now a part of me and I am also in some sense immortal. I know you are different from the Hitomi I knew and loved but regardless of that I have granted you the same thing. Whether we fall in love or not is up to you but I won't let Madara or his organization capture you or the other vessels and their dot. His eyes return to normal and he changes his mindscape into a beautiful forest and a house similar to the one he created from the future. I will protect you Hitomi no Yoko and I will kill Madara Chiha. He swore. She just looks up at him for a while and then lets out a chuckle and she smiles. This must have been the reason why my future self fell in love with you. You have the desire to protect everyone, even those who despise you for containing me. I'll hold you in regards to freeing me of the kid and when you do well I'll leave that to your imagination. She says in a sultry tone and kisses him on the lips and he returns it. After that, they stop and Kaiubi gives him a look of lust. I can't wait till you free me, my future mate. She says, and then he vanishes from his mindscape. Outside his mindscape a smile appears on Naruto's face, and then he opens his eyes. I will not let the Akatsuki win this time. He vows and looks down at the sleeping form of his sister and strokes her hair. Kakashi, Anko, Yuigao and Rin were looking out for the root Anbu, and that was when Kashina and Jiraiya appeared. Jiraiya was unharmed, but Kashina had blood on her flak jacket and her sword. She flicks the blood off her sword and removes the flak jacket, then burns it with a dot Naruto sees this and slowly gets up, putting Shinku on his back and carrying her piggyback style. He places his arms around her leg so that she doesn't fall off and walks towards his godfather and mother with his sleeping Amato on his back. Are you okay Kasan? Hiro Senen. He asks and Kashina smiles and nods while Jiraiya's eye twitches from the name. Yes we're fine Naruto-kun. She then looks at Kakashi and the three Kinoichi. Well let's get going everyone. She says, and they cross the border to Kaminari no Kuni. While taking the path to Kumo, Naruto couldn't help but wonder how his presence in this time would affect it, but now all he cared about was being with his family and starting a life away from Konoha. Kumagakur was without a doubt a beautiful place despite being a little colder than Konoha. The skies were as clear as day, mountains practically rose into the sky surrounded by clouds, and the rivers and lakes were as clear as day. Different varieties of birds soared through the sky, while Kishina, Jiraiya, and the others walked on the path that was routed to Kumagakur. Naruto was currently carrying Shinku on his back while she was playing with his hair and giggling. Naruto's brow kept twitching the whole trip. Rin was watching and was inwardly squealing kawaii at this. Kishina had to hold in her laugh as she saw Sachi's brow twitch at Shinku playing with his hair. Jiraiya nudged Kishina on the shoulder, getting her attention and speaking to her quietly. So Kashina, when do you plan on training the squirts? The toad sage asks. Little did he know Naruto was listening to this with his enhanced hearing and was smirking. He already had the knowledge of all that he learned from Jiraiya during his training trip and the ones he gained from the Achihas from his time. Once he's strong enough, he'll make sure that Madara, the Akatsuki, Orochimaru, Danzo, and everyone else who is a threat to him and his loved ones die and have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the Shinigami before going to hell. I will not let them win this time. Madara Achiha. You better pray we don't meet soon because if we do you're the first one I kill. He thought, as his eyes flashed to the eternal Manjikyu Sharingan for a few seconds and back to his normal eyes. He then felt a small fist bop him on the head lightly and he turned around to see Shinku grinning at him. Am I too heavy for you Aniki? She asks and a small smirk appears on his face and he shakes his head. No, not really. Though you do need to cut back on the Dango Amado. 
he said with a cheeky grin on his face. Shinku gasps and then stretches out his cheeks with her fingers and he cries out in pain, getting everyone's attention. Are you calling me fat she yells at him. They all sweat drop at this, while an I'm tears go down Naruto's face from the pain of having his cheeks stretched out. Kishina giggles at this until her eyes widen and she draws her sword, as do Kakashi, Yugao, Rin, and Anko. Come on out, Anbu-san. She says, and that was when six Kumo Anbu jumped out of the trees and in front of the eight travelers. The one wearing a lion mask and a silver white hooded cloak walked forward. We didn't come here to fight Akano Shai, Red Death, we wish to know why you, Jirei of the Sanin, four Konoha Anbu, and two children are in Kaminari territory. He asked, and that was when Jirei spoke up. We're here to seek temporary asylum in Kumagakur and would like an audience with the wreckage about it. He answers well Kishina and the former Konoha Anbu sheath their swords. The leader eyes them for a while and then speaks up. Is there a reason why you want a temporary asylum in Kumo? Shishi asks. Kishina tilts her head to her son and daughter. Yes. From Konoha and for my children. She says and he looks over at the blonde boy and redeated female. I see. I'll inform the guards at the gate to let you pass, as well as Reikage Sama, but you might want to seal away your weapons, as a warning. He says, and they shunshin away. Bishina lets out a sigh of relief, and then walks over to Naruto and Shinku who was getting off her brother's back. Kakashi seals away their weapons into a scroll, and Kishina picks up her two children, holding them in each arm, and they head towards Kumagakur. Kumagakur Reikage Tower. Sitting in his office doing paperwork while doing arm curl-ups with a large dumbbell was E, the Yandame Reikage. He is a tall dark-skinned man with a large muscular build, slick back white hair with a yellow tint, a few wrinkles, and a small mustache and beard. He wore the cage hat and robes without a shirt underneath which further displays his bulky physique. He has black shuriken tattooed on both shoulders. On each wrist he has gold bangle bracelets, which seem to have protrusions, and has a gold belt on his waist, with a lion's face engraved in the center. All of these aspects combined give him the appearance of a professional wrestler. As he was on the last piece of paperwork, his secretary walks in and bows. Reikage Sama, there's a group of people here who wish to have an audience with you. She says, and he drops the dumbbell out of his left hand and it hits the ground with a metallic thud. He looks up at the woman with a raised eyebrow. And who are they? He asks, and she speaks up. Gureya of the Sanin and the Aka no Shai. The rest seem to be Kanohan in and have two kids with them. She answers, and his eyes widen as he hears the names Jiraiya and Aka no Shai. Send them in. He orders, and she nods, leaving out the door to inform them. The door opens, and Jiraiya, Kishina, and the others enter the office, and the rakage stops writing and looks at them. So tell me, what do the Sanin and the Akano Shai want with my village? He asks, and Kishina speaks up. Rakage Sama, me, and the group who are loyal to my family, wish to have a temporary asylum in Kumagakur. She answers, and the man's eyes widen a little before they return to normal. Is that so? Why should I even offer you all asylum here? What is it that you and your group can offer me as the cage of the village? He asks, as he places his hands together while laying them. Ashina closes her eyes for a moment, then opens them. Tell me Reikage Sama, you have two living here in the village right? I believe one is your brother, and the other is your adopted daughter Karabi, container of the Hachibi, and Yujido Nai, container of the Nibi correct? She asks, and he nearly falls out of his seat and looks at her in shock. H how do you know this? He asks, and she tilts her eyes over to Jureya who was smirking. He looks at the toad sage and chuckles. I see. But what does my brother and Yugi have to do with your group? He asks, and she lets out a sigh and brushes her red hair back. My son is the container for the Kaiubi no Kitsune. She answers, and his eyes were now the size of saucers. Naruto walked forward and looked at the large man with no hint of fear in his eyes. The rakage analyses the kid wondering why he wasn't nervous by his appearance, but then shakes it off and looks back at Kishina and notices a smaller redeed who was behind her brother and looking over his shoulder. He then looks up at Kishina. Are they the children of the Kairoi Senku, Minato Namikas also? He asks while the four former Anbu stiffen at this until the man chuckles. Don't worry I hold no ill intentions like that fool of Itsuchikaj does. I actually respect your husband's power and to think that he went head to head with the most powerful of the nine. Tell me how your son is treated in Konoha. He asks and she frowns and looks at her son with sorrow in her eyes. He sees this and sighs. So they praise the father and damn the son, eh? I never would have thought the so-called strongest village in the shinobi world would sink so low. He says and looks up at Kishina who looks back at him and speaks again. We, meaning me, Kakashi Haddock, Anko Midarashi, Rin Yazuka and Yugao Yazuki, would like to work as freelance nin for Yurekage-sama. The same goes for my children when they're old enough. She answers. 
B looks at the four former black ops who nod, and he lets out a hum and thinks for a while. The son of the Shirai no Kiba, the former apprentice of Arachimaru, and Inuzuka, a Kanoichi, and the heirs of the Kairoi Senku, and Aka no Shai. I'd be a fool not to let them join even if it's only temporary. After all, Kano has lost his Kumo's gain. He thought, and then looked at them with a small smile. Very well Kishina-san, I will allow you and your group to stay in Kumo and work as a freelance nin for us. He says, and a smile appears on her face. I only ask you of this. He says, and she raises an eyebrow at him. And what would that be Reikage-sama? She asks. I would like to train the boy personally and have my brother teach him how to use the power he contains. He answers, getting a shocked look from her and the others. I'll consider your offer, but I want them to get the basics down first before they do any serious training. Do you understand my reasons correctly? She asks. He just laughs and waves at her. Yes I do. Since you and your group want to work as freelance nin for my village, what mission ranks will you all accept? He asks. B, A, and S rank missions that consist of espionage, tracking, and assassination. Those are what we specialize in. Kashina answers, and he nods. He was about to speak up until the door was kicked open, and a man who looked like a younger version of E walked in. He was a 6'5 dark-skinned man with a muscular build, as well as white hair and a beard. On his right shoulder, he has a tattoo that says, iron, and on his left cheek, he has a tattoo of a bull's horn. He also wore oval-shaped sunglasses and a white-colored forehead protector. He also wears a white-colored one-strap over one-shoulder flak jacket of a Kumagakur Jinin, with a red rope tied around his waist, white handbands, black pants and sandals, and a white scarf around his neck. He also carries seven swords on his back. He was Karabi, Killer B, a shinobi of Kumagakur, and the Jinch Kriki of the Eight-Tailed Giant Ox. Karabi walked in with a huge grin on his face. Big bro, big bro what's happening yo? He raps getting sweat drops from the former men of Konoha and Shinku. Naruto was inwardly groaning because the Karabi in this time was the same as the one from the future. Been dry and was very obnoxious. But he was without a doubt the one person you don't want to face one on one. He smacked his forehead while letting out a groan. Karabi, what do you want now? If it's another vacation request then the answer is no. He says when his brother gets ready to speak up, but then slumps his shoulders. Aw oh, come on big bro. Cut me some slack yo. I've been spending the last month training little Yujito. He whines until he gets kicked into the back of his head by a nine-year-old blonde who had blonde hair that was tied into a ponytail and wore a purple short-sleeved shirt and grey pants with purple shinobi sandals. She was Yujito Nai, the Jinchuriki for the Nibi no Nekamata. Karabi just stood there scratching his cheek with one finger while Yujito landed on the ground and glared at the man. Karabi turns around and sees the female blonde glaring at him with her blue slitted eyes. Oh hey kitty cat. He says causing a tick mark to appear on her head. Don't call me that. Why did you leave me wandering the cave for three hours? She yells at him while the sweat drops on the other's heads become bigger. Call it a survival training kitty. Besides, you would have found your way out due to your heightened senses. He responded while she growled at him, but then noticed the other people in the room staring at them, and she blushed in embarrassment. Hey bro, what's Aka no Shai, Toad Senen, and Anbu doing here? He asks, pointing to them. They're here to work as freelance nin for our village. He replies, and Karabi looks at them, and then back at Nato with a raised eyebrow. So the kid contains the fox, eh? Interesting. He says, as he looks at Naruto who looks back at him. And you contain the ox. Naruto replies, and Karabi laughs at him. Hey the kid's got spunk bro. Oi Yujito, introduce yourself to them. He says, as Yujito walks up to the six-year-old, and they look at each other for a while. You're short for a boy. She says with a cheeky grin on her face, and Naruto's eye twitches. I'm six. Of course I'm short Kitty-chan. He says while her eye twitches too. Aniki. Shinku whines while the grown-ups watch this. After that, Jiraiya leaves to go check on his spy network, while Lee gives them a two-story house that was near the mountains and a large lake connected to a river. Once they settled in, Kishina, Anko, Yugao, Rin, and Kakashi unsealed everything she took from her former home and set the house up. Shinku was sleeping on a bed while Naruto was sleeping on the other one. In his mindscape, Naruto's older form was sitting on a bed with Hitomi, who's in her hybrid form, resting her head on his lap while rubbing the back of her right ear, getting a purr out of her while he chuckles. You know your future self loved getting scratched behind her ear also, and I can see why. He says while her purr became a little louder. Less talking, more scratching. She mumbled out while he chuckled. Whatever you say Barachan. He draws out, and one of her tails brush against his neck. So when do I get my freedom? Or do I have to earn it? She asks, as she sat up and wrapped one of her tails around his waist and gave him a view of her cleavage. 
Naruto chuckles, and from behind his body a yellow tail appeared from behind his back and placed the tip of it under her chin and gently pulled her face forward until she was a few inches away from his face. A small blush appeared on her face as Naruto leaned over into her ear and whispered into it. Her eyes widened and her blush became bigger as she shivered as he kept talking into her, then moved away from her ear and looked at her frozen yet blushing face. Naruto raised an eyebrow at this and then he snapped his fingers in front of her face and she blinked a couple of times. She says only to see a grinning Naruto chuckling at her and she huffs and puffs her cheeks out at him. Pervert. Anyway, how do you plan to free me? She asks but then starts to purr again when Naruto rubs her behind the ear. Simple. He says with a grin on his face and then he places his index and middle finger on the collared seal on her neck and removes his other hand from behind her ear. He then performs a series of one-handed seals with his right hand and stops at the ram seal. The collar seal around her neck glows a bluish-white color. Fuinjutsu, Tenma Tohoku Gakuen. Kai, Sealing Jutsu. Demon Imprisonment Seal. Release. He mutters out and the seal suddenly vanishes and a bead of sweat drops from his brow. Naruto lets out a sigh of relief and that was when Hitomi tackles him on the bed and before he could say anything she locks lips with him and his eyes widen in shock. She then releases the kiss and smiles at him. That was to free me of the seal. When you're a little older, I'll give you my thanks. She says with a grin on her face while Naruto just blinks and fades from his mindscape with Hitomi giggling. Naruto wakes up with a blush on his face and mumbles about perverted vixens. He looks at his six-year-old form and lets out a sigh. Guess I'll have to wait until I turn 14. Damn it I hate time traveling. Well at least I still have the knowledge on the things I know in the future, and I know the secret to the shadow clone. He mutters to himself until he hears the door open, and Kakashi walks in wearing an all-black jonin outfit with a silver flak jacket. The copy nin looks and sees Naruto staring at him, and the blonde grins. Hey, Kakashi Nai-san. Naruto says, and Kakashi responds with an eye smile on his face. Hey Itaudo. Finished sleeping. He asks, and the blonde nods. Yep. Where's Kasan and the others? He asks as he jumps off of the bed and walks towards the man. Getting some supplies for the house while I look after you too. He answers. Oh. Hey Naisan when Shinku awakens, can you teach us how to use chakra? Naruto asks while Kakashi's eye widens and he rubs his chin in thought. Who oh, sure why not? We'll wait for Shinku to wake up before we start. He says and Naruto nods. 30 minutes later, Shiku wakes up and jumps out of the bed while rubbing her right eye. She walks out of the room to see Kakashi reading an orange book while her brother was twirling a fake shuriken on his finger. Kakashi looks up from his book and sees the repeat walking towards him. Hey Shinku-chan, did you have a nice nap? Kakashi asks, and she nods. Guess what? I'm gonna be teaching you and your brother some of the basics of being a shinobi and how to use chakra. He said, getting a shocked look from the chibi repeat. Shinku then squealed and glumped Kakashi's leg. Kakashi chuckles at this and pats her on the head when she lets go. Come on you three, let's head outside. He said and motioned them to follow him, and they did. Ishina, Rin, Anko, and Yuga were heading back to the house while carrying bags of groceries. They managed to make it back to the house and entered the front door. When they walked into the kitchen, they realized that Kakashi, Naruto, and Shinku were not in the house, so they ran around back to see Kakashi showing them a series of hand seals. Shinku was blinking and tried to mimic Kakashi's hand motions. She messes up on the board sign, but surprisingly Naruto was able to get them all down, and then he starts to increase the pace a little after he gets all 12 down. Shinku pouts at this, and Naruto looks over at her and tries to hold in a laugh, as does Kakashi, but she glares at Kakashi who looks the other way. Naruto then sits in front of Shinku. Here Dot will help you with the seals. He says, and Naruto shows her the seals in a slow pace, and she does the same. Kakashi watches the siblings work on the hand seals, and when Shinku manages to get them all down without messing up she cheers and hugs her Aniki who was turning blue. Kakashi was chuckling at the sight, as were the four Kinoichi. Ahem. Kishina coughs out loud getting Kakashi's and the twins' attention. Kakashi rubs the back of his neck nervously. Oh hey Kishina-san. I was just teaching the kids some shinobi basics and hand seals. I hope you don't mind. He said praying that she wouldn't hurt him, but all she did was shrug and smile. It's okay Kakashi. As long as you don't teach them anything dangerous. Otherwise I'd have to end your life as a male. She says while the cyclops pales and starts to sweat bullets. Naruto didn't show it but was sweating bullets on the inside. Man now I see why the males in the Nara clan are afraid of their wives. He thought while in Konoha, Shikaku sneezed and mumbled trouble only to get hit in the head with a frying pan. That was when Yugao spoke up. 
Pashina Senpai, I know you plan on teaching Shinku and Naruto, but may I teach them the basics in a few years? She asks. Yes Sensei I want to teach the Gakis too. Anko asks with a grin on her face. Me too. Rin cries out. They then appear in front of Kashina using the puppy's eyes. The redeed sweat drops and lets out a sigh. Fine, you can train them. She answers while they squeal and do a group hug with Kashina who was in the middle and turn blue. C can't breathe. She squeaked out while her children laughed at a predicament. Eight years later. When Naruto and Shinku turned seven, Kakashi taught them how to throw kunai and shuriken and chakra control like the tree climbing exercise and water walking. He also taught them how to compress their chakra and become undetected. When they turned eight, Anko and Yugao started to teach them the academics, as well as how to set traps and some survival skills like hunting. Yugao then taught them the basics and amazingly, they both adapted well to it. When they turned 9, Rin taught them the basics on human anatomy, Aijutsu, medical jutsu, like the mystic palm, and chakra scalpels, and poison extraction. She also taught them how to attack certain parts of the human body, as well as how to treat injuries. When they turned 10, Kakashi decided to check them for their elemental affinity. Shockingly Shinku had 3, and they were wind, water, and fire. Naruto, to everyone's shock, had 4 affinities. They were wind, water, lightning, and fire. Ashina knew mostly wind and water, so she taught them both a few D and C ranks for said elements. Kakashi taught Naruto some low-level lightning and fire while Yuugao and Anko taught Shinku some fire they knew. The two siblings also met Kari, Samui, and Amoi who were genin and were trained by Karabi. Said container taught Naruto how to use his Bijuu's chakra, so everyone knows. Naruto is actually using the Juubi chakra he gained when absorbing the demon's soul when the from the future became the Juubi's soul. He taught Naruto some lightning, as well as his form of fighting. When Naruto and Shinku turned 11, Jiraiya showed up and taught them some of his personal jutsu like the Hari Jaizo, Yomi Numa, and got them started in learning Fuenjutsu. Due to the knowledge on Fuenjutsu Naruto had from the future, he managed to get the basics down. Jiraiya was shocked with how well Naruto's and Shinku's skills were. It was as if they were adapted to knowing the sealing arts like their father. It took most beginners a long time to understand the concepts, but both Naruto and Shinku learned it without difficulty and even started to create their personal stories. He also let the twins sign the Toad contract and Kashina had them sign the Hydra contract. A contract that belonged to her clan and Whirlpool before it was destroyed. So far, they could each summon a horse-sized frog and Hydra. One time Shinku summoned a saltwater crocodile and Naruto summoned a Komodo dragon, shocking both cage level nin since you needed level chakra control in order to summon them. That was due to all the physical and chakra exercises Kakashi, Yuugao, and Anko made them do, and the same went for Naruto when he trained with E and Karabi. When the two turned 12, Kishina taught them her sword style, Shikuchi, and Jiraiya decided to teach Naruto and Shinku the Rasengan. Naruto got it down in less than a week, but it took Shinku two weeks, but Naruto helped her understand the steps and she was able to make it. Naruto was also working on something similar to the Horatian, the only difference was that it was based on pure speed and not a kunai. When they turned 13, the twins were at Itachi's level when he was 13. Naruto's skill level and the ninja arts were already at mid-anbu level, and Shinku was at a high jounin level. Sitting in a lotus position in the middle of the lake surface with his eyes closed was Naruto Uzumaki Namikas. He was now 14 years old, 5'7", and was wearing a black sleeveless muscle shirt and deep blue cargo pants that had a silver lining going down it and wore a pair of Anbu-styled sandals. He also wore a pair of fingerless gloves that had metal pads on them. He was now like a teenage version of his father, but the only difference was his slitted blue eyes and he had fangs jutting from his upper lip. He also wore a black headband that had a metal piece attached to it and it had the symbol of a whirlpool on it. His eyes snapped open and he instantly leaped up in his feet and jumped out of the lake when he saw four black snakes shoot out of the water and head for him with their mouths open, revealing their fangs. Naruto bit his thumb and swiped his left wrist, which had a containment seal on it. A small puff of smoke is seen and an ninjato appears in his right hand. He then places it in a reversal position. When the snakes are close enough, he spins, performing a counterclockwise slash, and slices the snakes apart, and he flips again in midair, landing in the water in a crouched position, as the snakes fall into the water. He then twists his body to deflect a barrage of kunai that were headed towards him, and he then pulls out one silver throwing knife, and flings it in order to deflect a shuriken. He runs towards the throwing knife he threw, and catches it. He places the knife back in the pouch he had latched to his back, and grabs the shuriken. The yellow blur was seen heading for him from behind, and Naruto threw the shuriken at the blur which moved to the right and kept charging. 
Naruto plants the ninjato on the ground and leaned back as a fist came for his head but missed and passed by. It was Yujito Nai. She is 17 years old now and her attire was different. Her hair was longer and tied into a ponytail. She also wore a silver and black shirt that hugged the curves in her body and showed off her developing D-cuffed breasts. She wore a pair of tight black pants with purple sandals and wore fingerless gloves. On her head was a Kumo headband. Ever since Naruto started to train with Karabi the two started off as friends, but when got older, she'd tease him about checking her out when he thinks she isn't looking, and Naruto just flirted back, calling her Kitty-chan which ticks her off a lot, even though she contained the Nibi. What was even better was that he, Shinku and Yujito always pulled pranks on the Reikage or in the village, just to liven the place up. Even though Naruto was a lot more serious than he was in his time, he was still a prankster at heart with Jiraiya and Kakashi being the main victims of his pranks. Naruto then grabs her outstretched hand, shocking her, and twists his body around and behind her and presses her arm behind her back. He then wraps his other arm around her neck and applies pressure to it, getting a gurgle from the blonde. He then smells her hair while she struggles in his grip only to wince when he squeezes her wrist tighter. Guava berry Yugi-chan. He asks. Yujito smirks too, and then she pushes backward, adding her weight to his, and they both hit the ground. This causes Naruto to let out a grunt and loosen his grip on her. Yujito flips backwards and lands on her feet. Naruto flips back on his feet, and with a tug of his finger, the ninjato is back in his hand, and he twirls it for a while before charging at Yujito with his sword poised in a stabbing position. Yujito reaches in the back of her two pouches and pulls out a pair of gauntlets that have three jagged claws attached to them. She charges at him too, and both swing their weapons at each other. Plang. The blades clashed and grinded against one another, sending sparks everywhere. Yujito smirks and then swings her left clawed hand at the blonde. Naruto sees this and then jumps over the attack and uses her arm as a spring and kicks her in the back while landing on the other side. The redhead who was wearing a black and red outfit like her mother and seemed to be the same age as Naruto appears behind him and goes for a roundhouse kick. Naruto ducks and does a sweep kick at her other leg and it makes contact, causing her to fall towards the ground, but she plants her arm on the ground and then twirls in midair, landing back on her feet. Charges at Naruto again and swings her clawed arms at the blonde who sidesteps her and she then sends a kick to his head. Naruto blocks it with his left arm and Shinku, who has a kadachi with a black hilt with red diamonds on it, does a horizontal slash at his back. When she slashes him across the back he disappears in a puff of smoke and replaces himself with a log, shocking both girls. Said blonde grabs Shinku by the back of her jacket and swung her around violently and slams her into the ground getting a grunt from the girl and then palm strikes Yujito in the stomach, getting an arm from the girl who is sent skidding backwards. Naruto then pulls out three kunai and throws them at Shinku whose eyes widen in horror and she leaps off the ground while the weapons hit the ground. She then felt a tug on her heel and the next thing she knew, she was caught in a net and started to struggle. Naruto grins at this. One down. He says and dodges to the side when a beam of yellow lightning misses him but scorches his cheek a little. Yujito appears behind him with a kunai near his throat and she smiles. Naruto frowns at this but Yujito grins. Gotcha foxy cunt. She says only for her eyes to widen when Naruto dissolves into water and feels one arm wrap around her waist and the blade of a throwing knife near her neck. No kitty-chan I have you. He says as he holds her even closer, getting a small blush from the older blonde. Oi. Aniki. Get me out of this net. Shinku calls out. Naruto points the blade he had at Yugi's neck towards the rope Shinku was ensnared in. He throws it with a flick of his wrist and it cuts one of the lines, resulting in the redeed falling out of the net and landing on her feet. Naruto then wraps both hands around Yujito's waist and rests his head on her shoulder, making the girls blush even more. Shinku walks towards the two blondes and sighs. We almost had you that time, Aniki. She says sheathing her sword and placing her hands on her hips. Naruto chuckles and says. Almost doesn't count Dottie replies while she dot whatever, I'm going home to get something to eat. You two are coming or are you gonna stay there holding Yujito? She asks while Naruto smirks. Yep. He says and Yugi's eyes widen. Shinku shrugs at his answer. Okay bye then. She says and disappears into a swirl of water. The blush Yujito's face remained there while keeps his head on her shoulder. Yujito lets out a sigh as he sits down with her in his arms. You came close to catching me again, Yujito-chan. Then again you are the youngest in the village. He says while she chuckles. True, but why can't I catch you? She asks. Because Yugi, foxes are tricksters. He says and kisses her cheek. Yugi lets out a small grunt and places her arms over his while lying back on his chest. A smile then appears on her face. 
I bet you Samui is complaining about her neck and back hurting and wants you to give her a massage. She says while Naruto laughs. Probably so. Why do you want one? He asks and she shakes her head. Nope. I'm fine. She says. You're a lying kitten. You want him to give you one of those heavenly massages. Or did you forget that I can hear your thoughts? Nibi asks her to blush the vessel. SH shut up Nibi. She screams into her mind while the two-tailed cat giggles. It's not my fault you want the blonde fox. What's this? An image of Naruto-kun stripping you down to your underwear and taking you as one of his shut up. And stop looking at my private thoughts. She roared at the now meowing demon cat. Naruto saw how red her face was and spoke up. Is Nibi telling you to get in my pants again? Naruto asks for a nod from the blonde female and he lets out a laugh. Tempting aren't I? He asks her and she scoffs and caresses his right cheek, making Naruto purr a little as he grabs her hand. Please don't do that, Yugi. He says while she smirks. Naruto then tickles her sides and she giggles. Okay I'm sorry. She says and he stops. He then lets go of her while getting up and helps her up. Well I have to go to Naruto-kun. Maybe next time we can do more than cuddle. She says and poses for the blonde. Naruto chuckles and then kisses her on the lips while she returns it. After that she shunshins away and Naruto vanishes in a swirl of white fire. Namika's compound. Naruto appeared in the house and saw Kakashi who was sitting on the couch watching an action movie on the flat screen TV with his arm wrapped around Rin who was sleeping on his chest. Shinku was in the kitchen eating an apple. He walked upstairs and then went into his room. After unsealing all of his weapons, his headband and removing his weights and sandals he fell back onto his bed and shut his eyes. He then feels an odd weight on top of him and when he opens his eyes, he sees a pair of red slitted ones staring at him and grinning. It was Hitomi. She was wearing a sleeveless black tank top that hugged her herdless figure and a pair of reddish orange shorts. Hey, Naruto-kun. Did I disturb you? She asks while tilting her head to the side. A smile appeared on Naruto's face because she looked cute when she did that. No, not really. So what do you want? He asks her and a pout appears on her face. I want to snuggle. Being in that mansion inside your mindscape is boring and I have no one to scratch my ears or pet my tails. Please. I'm lonely. She pleads and pulls the puppy's eyes. Dot. Naruto snickers and nods, getting a fox-like grin from Hitomi. Yay, I get to cuddle with my foxy cum. She says and wraps her arms around his waist and rests her head on his chest. Naruto wraps an arm around her and scratches her behind her ear, getting a purr from Hitomi he then moves her head near the crook of his neck. Naruto then closes his eyes and falls asleep. A few hours later, Kishina was walking down the hallway towards Naruto's room and turned the knob. When she opens the door and looks inside, she sees her son sitting on his bed Indian style with a red fox that was curled up into his lap purring as he stroked her back while wagging her tail, which meant she was happy. Naruto-kun, where did you get that fox? Kishina asks while her son looks up at her. She followed me home and when I tried to get her to go back into the wild, she just wouldn't leave my side, so I just let her come home with me. He said while the fox sits up and stretches. She then sees Kishina and yips. Oh say hi to mom Hitomi. He says. The fox leaps off of his lap and runs towards Kishina. She then stops in front of the redeed and stares at the older redeed. Kishina crouches down and reaches out to rub the fox behind her ear. The fox lets out a happy yip and then licks her hand, getting a smile from the redeed. Well she is cute. She says and scoops Hitomi into her arms and the fox starts to lick her cheek, making Kishina giggle. She then sets Hitomi down, who was smiling at the redeed. Oh Naruto, the rakage wants you and Shinku to patrol the shores of Kumagakur for three days. She says and the blonde nods. Okay. I'll get my stuff ready. Does Shinku already know? He asks and she nods. Naruto then gets up and gets his supplies ready. After he finished that, he walked downstairs with a backpack and duffel bag and Hitomi was wrapped around his neck like a scarf. He sees Shinku who had her gear ready and raises an eyebrow at the living scarf on his neck. What's with the fox Aniki? She asks, pointing to the wagging tail. She followed me home. So you ready? He asks and gets a nod from his sister. See you Kakashi Nai-san. The siblings called out while the man waves without looking at them. The two then away while Rin moans and snuggle into the man's chest while he holds her even closer. Meanwhile a yellow and red blur was racing to the shores of Dot while this was happening, Shinku spoke up. Hey Nikki, how far are you with your new technique? She asks. Not, as far as I hope. I can only use it 25 times before tiring why? He asks and she blinks. Wow. That's actually good. She says as they leaped over some large rocks that were in a river. 
After running for three hours and checking with them at one of the patrol bases, Naruto and Shinku set up their camp near the shore and kept a calm link and talked with them. As they went in separate directions. They also created some cage bushes, Komodo dragons and crocodiles to patrol the waters and lower levels. Naruto was currently leaping through tree branches and looking in different directions for any intruders. Naruto then tilts the small microphone near his mouth and speaks up. Hey Shinku, have you noticed anything suspicious yet? Over. He asks through the calm link he hears some static in his ears and hears a feminine voice. No Naruto I haven't. What about you? Over. She asks and he shakes his head. Nothing yet. He says while leaping through the trees. He then lands near a cliff where the shores are and watches the waves hit the sand. He then notices long red russet hair and a body sweeping into the sand. His eyes widen and he leaps off the cliff and skids down the rocky edge until he hits the soft sand. He then runs towards the shore where the body was. When he's close enough to the body he turns it over and his eyes widen when he realizes who this is. Mei-chan. He whispers to himself. Her outfit was torn in some places and she had some cuts and bruises and was wearing a metal plate that had the symbol on it on her left shoulder blade. He then places his head near her chest to check her heart rate. It was slow, but she was alive, but she wasn't breathing. Naruto clicks the red button on his walkie-talkie and speaks into his calm link. Shinku, it's me. I found an unconscious Kanoichi from Kurigakur washed up on the shores and she is still alive, but barely. I need you to go to the closest hour and have a medical team come to my location. He says, and she speaks up. Hi. Where's your location Aniki? She asks, and he speaks up. I'm in the northeastern section of the shoreline and seven miles from our camp over. He replies okay I'm heading to the base now to get the medical squad. Keep her alive until we get there. Over and out. She says. Naruto sighs and unzips her flak jacket and is thanking Kami that she was wearing a mesh shirt under it because he couldn't keep his gaze off her chest. He then shakes his head to clear the thoughts out. He pries her mouth open carefully and places his hands over her chest to perform CPR and presses down on it a couple of times and then locks lips with her to get air into her lungs. He stops and presses his head near her chest but doesn't hear anything. He then continues the process a few more times and after the third time of breathing air into her lungs, he quickly removes his head away from hers and she sputters and coughs out a lot of salt water while sucking in oxygen. He helps her sit up and rubs her back while she takes in more air. His hand glows green and the chakra was healing her lungs so she doesn't strain herself while taking in air. Her breathing becomes normal but she collapses into his arms while he holds onto her. He then gets up while holding her bridal style. He turns to see Shinku and three Anbu medics coming towards him. He walks towards them until they are a few feet from him. I manage to heal her lungs but we need to take her back to our camp so she can get more treatment. He says to them and they nod. They then head back to Naruto's camp to give her better treatment and to find out how she ended up on Zip the shore. ended up getting washed up in Kumo's shoreline. He asks her. Mei finishes the fruit and then sighs. War. She answered while Shinku blinked in confusion. Kurigakur is in the middle of a civil war called the Purge. It was ordered by our current Mizukage who believes that bloodlines are the reasons why we have wars and want to get rid of them by purifying our village. She answered, making their eyes widen at that. That's terrible. He's killing those that possess bloodlines just because he believes they're responsible for the wars that have been happening. That's sick and unfair to those who are innocent. She says, and Naruto sighs. That's just how the ninja world is sis. Naruto says, and she looks at the ground. I know, but still. It's not fair. She protests, and Naruto nods, and looks back at Mei. Mei-san, are all of the nin from against the genocide? He asks. Half of them are, and they created a rebel army to fight against the Mizukage. Most of them are clans with bloodlines, but there are also those who don't have bloodlines that are with them. I happen to be a part of the rebels. She answers that it was when a thunderclap was heard and Naruto performed a few hand seals and the area around them glowed and became a barrier. Mei blinks when she feels the chakra spike and looks at Naruto. I created a chakra barrier that'll keep the bad weather out. It's not as easy as it sounds because you need a lot of chakra to keep it active. Luckily I placed some seals that are linked to each other and they create a double layered barrier around us. He explains. Wow. Was all Mei could say due to the fact that it was a very difficult art to learn and there were very few who knew it. Yeah I've always been fascinated with it. You could say it runs in my family. Shinku is also good but she's not close to my level. He says with a cheeky grin on his face but then ducks as sandal flies past his head. Shut up Aniki. I'm still better than you at water. She said while he sticks his tongue out at her. 
That's because Ka-san taught you defensive-based ones. Well Kakashi Nai-san taught me offensive ones he says, but then catches the second sandal while she pouts at him, crossing her arms over her chest. Jerk. She mumbles while he chuckles. Anyways our patrol mission is over tomorrow morning. We'll take you over to the Rakage's tower and you can explain everything to him. He states while she nods. Will I be able to return back to my rebel base? I don't want to involve a neutral village like Kumo in our country situation. She asks. Sure if that's what you want to do, but do you honestly think that you can beat the Mizukage with a few rebels and bloodline users? He has Shuinen, Jounin, Anbu, and Hunter Nin in his forces, and it's possible that they outnumber you and your rebellion. He states, and she frowns. I have no other choice. She says, but Naruto shakes his head. Yes you do have a choice. Be patient. If you try to pull a kamikaze attack against the Mizukage and his forces, they'll wipe you out before you can even enter the village gates. He replies. Mei looks at the ground and clenches her fists. You'll just be leading those who believe in you to an early grave, Mei-san, and you know my brother's right. Shiku says and lays back on her futon. Naruto yawns and lays backing his futon also. Look Mei-san, I'm pretty sure the Rakage would love to help you out if you ask. He's a great cage and he has been looking for alliances for a while. Once the civil war in Kiri is over I'm sure he would like to make one. He says and she thinks about it. Are you sure I can trust the Rakage? She asks and Naruto looks at her and smirks. In my opinion, yes. He can be hot-headed and ignorant most of the time, but he's also a man of honor. Something that you don't see in most ninjas due to our lifestyle. He replies and she blinks at him. So what is your connection with the Rakage? She asks. I'm his former apprentice. He says and her eyes become the size of dinner plates. Apprentice B but you don't even wear a headband representing Kumo. She stated and Naruto shrugs. I know. Me, Shinku, my Kasan, and a few others work for him, as ninjas for hire. He answers while Mei's jaw drops. Naruto looks at her and chuckles. Well you might want to get some sleep, Mei-san. Tomorrow we're going back to the Rakage Tower so you can talk to him. Oh, and also if you can ignore his younger brother's antics. He says and falls asleep. Mei blinks for a few minutes but then lays back and closes her eyes, hoping that the boy no young man was right and can help her save her village and country. If he did, she'd forever be in his debt. I don't know why, but for some reason I feel like I can trust him. You are a very interesting person, Naruto. She thought before drifting off in her sleep. Morning. The sun shone down in the forests, and Naruto opened his eyes to see Shinku snoring lightly and drooling slightly. He saw Hidam in her fox form sleeping on top of her bare torso. Naruto chuckles at this and sees Mei whose chest was rising and falling as she slept. The Tomi stirs and blinks a few times and yawns. She looked up to see Naruto who was smirking at her, and her eyes smiled. She then sees Mei's sleeping form and leaps off of Shinku. She walks towards Mei until she is a few inches from her face and then starts to lick her cheek. Mei stirs and giggles when the vixen does this, and Mei opens her eyes to see an eye-smiling fox who yips at her. Mei smiles at her and then sits up, picking Hitomi up and setting her on her lap. Why hello. Is this young man's friend? She asks as she rubs her behind the ear getting a purr from the fox. Naruto chuckles and speaks up. Her name is Hitomi. She followed me home when I finished training and hasn't left me since. He says while she smiles at the purring fox. Don't let her innocent form fool you. She's a trickster and will steal anything shiny or pretty that she sees. He says. Hitomi glares at him and he gives her a mocking glare. Don't you glare at me, little thief. He wags his finger in front of her and she does the puppy eye look. Oh Kawei. Mei says as Hitomi looks up at her and yips. What's that? He's a meanie and doesn't give you any attention. She says, and the vixen nods. You poor thing. Naruto, how could you be so mean to something so cute? Mei asks as she holds Hitomi in front of him and she grins at the blonde whose brow was twitching and sighs. He then takes Hitomi from a pouting Mei and places the yipping fox on his shoulder. Come on you sly vixen. We're gonna go catch some food. If you behave I'll catch you a rabbit. He says and her eyes now had stars in them. Naruto pulls his sandals on and he shunshins out of the tent. Shinku then wakes up and stretches. She looks around the tent only to see Mei. Good morning Mei-san. Where's Naruto and Hitomi? She asks. They went to get some breakfast for us. Do you happen to have any clothes I can wear? She asks and Shinku nods. She pulls a scroll out of her duffel bag and opens it revealing a black long-sleeved shirt and shorts that seem to stop over the knees. These should work. She says and places them beside her. Thanks. She says as she removes the covers and takes off her shirt and shorts wearing a matching blue bra and panties underneath. 
She puts the shirt over her head and pulls it down and puts the long shorts on. The shirt isn't too tight is it? Shinku asks and Mei shakes her head and pulls her long hair back and ties it back. No. Thanks for the spare clothes. She says and Shinku smiles. You're welcome. Say how old are you Mei-san? She asks. I'm 22, why? She asks and the Riti giggles. Well I just wanted to let you know that my brother, he has a thing for older women. She replies and Mei's eyes widen. What? Why older women? He's a pervert isn't he? She asks as she narrows her eyes and her brow twitches. No, he's not a pervert. Naruto is a decent guy and he respects women, well not shallow and snobbish ones. He stays away from them. The reason he likes older women is because they are more mature than the ones that are his age. Shinku explained and Mei blinked at her. Oh? He likes older women because they're more mature. But he's what? 14? 15? She asks and Shinku nods. Yeah. We are both 14 and turn 15 next year. So do you have a boyfriend? Mei asks. Shinku rubs the back of her head and blushes. Me? No. Mostly because my brother is very overprotective of me and the last boy who made a pass and tried to grope me ended up with all four of his limbs broken and being sterile for the rest of his life. She says with a grin on her face. Mei's eyes were now the size of dinner plates and she gawked at him. Wow. You're really lucky to have a brother like him. She says and Shinku nods. Yes I am. But he can be a pain sometimes, especially when he pulls his pranks. One time he switched my shampoo with orange hair dye. She says, and her brow twitches. Mei giggles when she says that. You seem to have an interesting family. She says. Yeah. Just wait till you meet my mom and the others, but you'll have to watch yourself around Kakashi Nai. He's a closet pervert. She states that Mei's brow twitches. Back at the Namika's household. Kakashi was reading his book and he sneezed on the page. And I'm tears fell from his eyes and he threw a tantrum, flailing his arms and legs around in chibi form. No. My autograph limited edition of Itcha Itcha Paradise Volume 3 is ruined. He cries out. Enko, Yu Gao and Rin saw this and sweat drops appeared on their faces. What the heck is wrong with your boyfriend Rin? Anko asks and Rin sees the book and twitches. I have no clue. She says. Senpai just keeps getting weirder and weirder every day. Yu Gao asks as her sweat drops grew bigger when he started sobbing over his baby with a grey cloud hanging over his head. That was when Kashina walked in. Hey Mina I'm ba hey what is wrong with Kakashi? Why is he mourning over Iro Senen's book? She asks, pointing a finger at the morning copy nin. The three women shrug. We have no idea. When are Yande Chibi and Shinchan coming back? I miss the blonde haired cutie. Anko says with a pout on her face. Rin sweat drops, Yu Gao faces faults, and Kashina groans. They should be home today, Anko. Kashina said in a deadpan voice, and Anko's eyes lit up. Yu Gao gets up and stares at Anko. Are you still trying to jump Naruto Anko? You're 23 for crying out loud and he's 14. She states and Anko shrugs. So what? He's a ninja. If you're old enough to kill then you're old enough to do adult things like have sex. Anko states. Bakashi hears the word sex and a perverted giggle escapes his mouth. You're hopeless Anko. Yuga states and Rin nods. Oh please I've seen you check out his ass when you think no one's looking. Anko says with a smirk on her face. Rin looks at her in shock, as does Kashina and Kakashi. SH she's lying sensei. You know how Anko is. The female swordsman says while a tint of pink appears on her face. Anko's grin grew even bigger. Oh please I even hear you mumble his name, calling him Naruto-kun. She coos out and Rin's jaw hits the floor, as does Kashina. Anko? Shut up. Yugao growled out as her facial appearance darkened. It's true. She even mumbled about how long his sword is. She says. That was when Yu Gao did the big demon head with her face glowing red. I was referring to his blade you pervert. She yelled. Sure you were, but don't feel embarrassed. I'm sure he'd let you play with his sword. She said, but then she had to duck from a sword slash that took some of her hair, and Anko was running out of the house laughing as Yu Gao went after her with her katana in her hand. And her eyes were glowing red. Come back here Anko Midarashi. I'll show you what I can do with a sword. She yelled, and the others had huge sweat drops on their heads. Her mouth is gonna get her killed one of these days. Kashina mumbles and Rin nods. Kakashi just rubs the back of his head but then appears behind Rin and whispers some things in her ear, making her eyes widen and a blush appear on her face. You hentai. She says and playfully slaps him on the shoulder but beeps when he picks her up bridal style and sunshine to their room. Kashina's brow twitches and she lets out a sigh. I need a boyfriend. She mumbles and heads towards the kitchen. 
Meanwhile Naruto is heading back to the camp with two bags that were filled with wild berries and herbs, and two clones were carrying a dead boar that was tied to a long pike. Itomi was in her hybrid form walking backwards in front of Naruto grinning. You know Naruto-kun, you should tell your family about us soon. She says, and he nods. I plan on Hitomi-chan just not right now. I'll tell them after we help Mei save her village and deal with the Yande Mizukage. So do you think it's possible for Madara to use his eyes on you again? I know the team was capable of doing it twice, and the second time he was in his weakened state. But what's got me worried was even in his weakened state, I still couldn't beat him. If he was that strong when he was weak, I don't want to know how strong he was when he was whole. He says, and she frowns. I agree. The only good Ichiha is the dead one in my opinion. They have been nothing but trouble especially for me and my kin. They are power-hungry, arrogant, self-centered bastards who would kill even their loved ones for more power. Madara is a prime example. He took the eyes of his own brother just to gain his sight back. That is sick. I may be a demon, but even I wouldn't do something like that. Taking the eyes of a sibling. Disgusting. She says, and Naruto nods. No kidding, but the only Achiha I will ever respect are Itachi and Ibido. Abido saved Kakashi Nai Sen's life by giving up his own. Itachi may have been cold and odd, but at least he isn't a traitor. I still can't believe that in my time, he let himself die by Sasuke's hand, just so that a brat could be a hero for killing the traitor and murderer of the Achiha clan. Had if only Kanoha knew that they were gonna do a coup to overthrow the Sandame. He states, and Hitomi nods. Then there is Orochimaru, Kabuto, and Danzo, and his root. I need to kill either one of them soon. I'll probably have to deal with Danzo first, especially when he has those Sharingans and the Shadame cells implanted into his right arm and eye. I swear that Izanagi technique was a pain to deal with. But then there is Orochimaru and his infatuation with the cursed bloodline. That parasitic body snatcher has to be dealt with also. I don't even want to think about what he would do if he found out about Shinku. He growls out and his eternal Manjiku Sharingan flashes and spins for a few seconds and then his eyes return to normal. Hitomi saw them and smiled. You know Naruto-kun whenever I see your eternal Manjiku Sharingan I can't help but be drawn to them. Unlike Madara's whose eyes reeked of malice and evil, yours show compassion, warmth and purity even when you're angry. So how far are you in learning the abilities from those eyes you gained when you absorbed Madara and Sasuke's power from your timeline? She asks. Naruto rubs his chin though and speaks up. Well I can use Tsukiyomi for at least 120 hours and 4 days. I can also summon the flames of Amaterasu and dissipate the flames. Kamui is a little difficult to control, and my aim has to be precise like Kakashi's, otherwise I'd just be wasting chakra. I can't summon Susanoo yet, but I'm working on it. Madara's teleporting technique is very tough to use. I have to keep my concentration firm, or else I'll end up tearing apart my body, so that'll definitely take a while to master. The techniques I gained from Sasuke were easy to learn. I managed to upgrade Chidori and Rikiri and use their variant forms. I can say this about Sasuke. He was a genius when it came to making variant forms of original techniques. Too bad he grew evil otherwise I would have respected him as a rival. Hell, what impressed me was when I learned how to use Kirin. I have to say, that's one hell of a he created, especially since he used real lightning with the attack. That right there takes a lot of skill and patience to master. Hell, Kakashi would have a heart attack if he found out about that technique. He'd probably give up Icha Icha just to learn it. He said jokingly, and Hitomi laughed knowing about the copy of Kakashi and how he had a thousand in his arsenal. He probably would, Naruto-kun, say you said that in your timeline that you absorbed the soul and powers of the Jubi, right? She asks, and he nods. So how many tails can you control now? She asks, and he thinks about it. Right now at least four tails. I don't like to rely on it because of how dense and potent the chakra is. While it doesn't destroy my body, I will end up completely exhausted and it'll take me a while to recover. But the good thing about it is that I have two chakra sources and can switch them at will, since the use of Yubi's chakra will make them more powerful and cause more damage. He states, and she had a look of awe and amazement in her face. So would that make you the new Jubi or are you still as she asks, and Naruto looks up at the sky to think about it. Honestly Hitomi I never thought about my status as are the new Jubi. It's possible that I'm the Jubi in a way since it's all merged with mine. He answers, and she nods. They were suddenly approaching the camp, and Hitomi morphed into her kit form and leaped on Naruto's shoulder. Naruto looked at the clones and spoke. Get a fire ready and start to skin the boar, but leave the fur and tusks clean. Once you're done gutting it, remove the parts we don't eat and toss them somewhere out in the woods. I don't need predators and scavengers getting into our camp. 
he says, and they nod, as they drop the pike, and pull out some blades, and get to work on the boar. Naruto opens the bag, and pulls out a dead rabbit. Here, Hitomi. He says. She yips, and grabs the rabbit, running off with it into the forest, so that she can eat it in peace. Naruto chuckles at this, and walks into the tent with the bag of fruit. Hey you guys I'm back. He says, as he places the bag of food down. Is that all you got Iniki? Shinku asks, and Naruto shakes his head. No. I have some clones outside skinning, and disembowelment a boat outside. He says, as Shinku grabs the bag, and pulls out two apples, and a mango. Who wants the mango? Shinku asks. Naruto holds his hand out, and she tosses it to him. Naruto grabs it while she hands the second apple to Mei. Shinku's cheeks bulge, and she sprays water onto the apple. Mei does the same while Naruto peels the skin off the mango, and sprays it off with water. After that they start to eat the fruit until Naruto speaks up. Hey Amado. Yeah. She replies, as she bites into the apple. How far are you on the elemental manipulation part for the Rasengan? He asks, getting Mei's attention at the end of the last war. Not that far. The manipulation of pure chakra is tough enough, but adding your affinity and stabling it is even tougher. She says, and Naruto nods. No kidding. I'm halfway through the wind manipulation part. I need to find a way to control it and keep it balanced, otherwise I'd end up blowing my hand off. He says, and Shinku cringes at the thought of losing an arm. So you two are working on mastering your father's technique. Interesting. Mei says, and they smile. Yeah that would be amazing. Iwa would have a heart attack if they found out that the children of their most hated enemy improved one of his. I'm also working on making different versions of the Rasengan. I made one that's based off a windmill shuriken, and one where it's a larger version of the Rasengan. Another one I'm creating is based off of a drill. Naruto says, and Mei's jaw drops. He made different versions of Yandame's technique. Shinku giggles at a reaction. Don't be so shocked Mei-san. I'm also making my own versions of the Rasengan, though mine are based more on speed than strength. Right now I'm working on one that I can use for long distances. Kind of like how the puppet users use their puppets. She explains. May look like she was about to pass out, but then spoke up. If I may ask, how strong are you two? She asks, and Naruto answers. Me, I'm at low to mid anvil level, while Shinku is around low to mid level. We just lack the experience they have. If we go all out then I'm around high anvil, and she is high. He says, and May just gapes in awe. Our mom and other members of our family trained us to the ground. That and the rakage and his brother are psychos when it comes to physical training. Naruto says, and back in the lightning brother sneeze. If I may ask if I were to fight you both would I win? May asks, and Naruto grins at her. Yeah you would since you have more experience than us, but we can give you a run for your money. He answered, and she smiled back. Well at least you're humble about it. Most teenagers your age wouldn't be this strong, and if they were, they'd gloat about it. She says, and they nod. Naruto then smells burning meat. Looks like my clones are done with the boar. I'll be back, Shinku, Mei-san. He says, and gets up, and leaves the tent. When he exits the tent, he sees the skinless boar being roasted over a flame on a pike. One clone was cleaning the fur skin, while the other was cleaning the tusks it removed from the boar's head. That was when Hitomi appeared from the bushes licking her muzzle which had some rabbit blood on it. Naruto sees her approach her, and smirks. Did you enjoy that rabbit? He asks. She looks at him, and releases a belch, and a tint of pink appears on her muzzle, making him chuckle. I'll take that, as a yes. He says, and she glares at him which in his opinion made her look cute. You know no one will take that glare seriously Hitomi-chan. It makes you look like an angry puppy. He says, and she yips while her ears fall down. Naruto laughs at how she's acting, and rubs the top of her head. None of that now Tomi-chan. He says, as he picks her up, and places her on his shoulders. She then licks him on the cheek while he strokes the side of her neck and watches the boar cook. Naruto pulls out a small scroll and opens it. In a puff of smoke, a pair of plates with forks and knives appear. Naruto pulls out a knife and cuts into the boar, removing small slabs of cooked meat and placing them on each plate. Naruto heads back into the tent. With the three plates. Who wants boar steak? He asks with a cheeky grin on his face. Shinku rolls her eyes and takes two of them and hands the other one to Mei. This smells great. Mei says, as she takes the fork and knife, and cuts a small piece off with a knife, and places it on a fork. She lifts the fork to her mouth, and bites down on the warm tender meat, and chews on it for a while before swallowing it. This is good. She says, and starts to eat more of the steak. Yeah. I prefer this over deer meat. Shinku says while Naruto nods. No kidding. Hey, remember when Anko and Yugao took us on that survival trip, and you ate those glowing mushrooms? 
Naruto says, as he snickers at the memory because Shinku's entire body glowed green for three days, and after that, she fell into a bush filled with poison ivy and had rashes everywhere. Then she ended up eating green berries by accident, and her skin broke out, and she swelled up like a balloon, and during their final day, she picked up a skunk by accident and got sprayed. Naruto had never laughed so hard in his life. Shinku glared at her snickering brother and huffed. That was the worst survival trip ever. I have never felt so humiliated in all my life. She mumbles, and Naruto laughs out at the memory. Oh man what a trip. Anko would never let you live it down. You know she still has the pictures right? He asks, and she pales. What? I thought she got rid of them. She says, and Naruto shakes his head. Shinku, this is Anko we're talking about. You know she's a prankster like me, only worse. I still can't believe you picked up that skunk. Mom had to leave you out in the backyard for a whole week. He states, and she blushes in embarrassment and anger. I was eight for crying out loud, and I thought it was a cat. She yelled, but Naruto laughed even harder. Please, that's the lamest excuse ever. Even I know the difference between a weasel and a cat. I'm so glad I bolted out of there before you realized what it was. He says while recalling the memory in his head. Flashback. Eight-year-old Naruto and Shinku were done with their survival trip and were currently packing their gear up. Anko and Yuga were cleaning up the camp, making sure that they didn't leave anything the wildlife could get. Shinku had put an empty oil lamp in her pack and noticed something that was black, white, and furry. Naruto had finished burying some leftover bones on the ground when he heard Shinku. Hey Nikki, look what I found. She called out. Naruto groaned and walked towards his sister who had her back turned. What is it this time Shinku, and please don't tell me it's poison ivy. He asks. No, I found a cat. She says, as she turns around grinning with a black and white cat in her arms. Naruto's eyes widen, and he steps back. Th that's not a cat Shinku, and please put it down slowly. He says, as he backs away slowly. Shinku blinks in confusion, and walks forward. What's wrong, it s just a cat. She says, but then Naruto bolts out the area screaming about a skunk. Shinku blinks, and holds the skunk away from her face. What's a skunk? She asks the cat, and it wags its tail, and grins evilly. Shinku once again blinks, but then her eyes widen. Oh. She said until it was too late. Naruto ran towards Anko and Yuigao and pulled on their pant legs, getting their attention. What's up Yandame Chibi? Anko asks, and a tick mark appears on his head. Don't call me that. Yu-chan, Shinku just picked up a Shinku screamed. Skunk. He finished making their eyes widen, and they head towards the spot where Shinku screams. When they get there, they see Shinku surrounded by a green mist, and she is coughing and rubbing her eyes. Anko caught a whiff of the skunk scent, and she suddenly moved backwards while clutching onto her nose and mouth while her eyes watered and twitched. Naruto was hiding behind Yuigao with his shirt over half of his face, while the female swordsman had a hand over her mouth. Oh sweet Kami. Shinku, what the hell were you thinking about picking up a skunk? Anko asks. Cough cough I thought it was a cat. Shinku says and continues to rub her eyes. You thought it was a cat. Oh great first the glowing mushrooms, then the poison ivy, now a skunk. What's next? You're gonna play fetch with a wolf. She says sarcastically. Don't jinx it Anko. Naruto yells, and Shinku glares at Naruto and crosses her arms. Kami Kishina sensei is gonna strangle me when we come back with the skunk princess. Anko mumbles. So who's gonna take her? She turns around to see Yuigao, and Naruto is gone leaving a dust trail, and a tick mark appears on Anko's head. Boy. Get back here you cowards. Don't you leave me here with Ms. Le Pew. She yells while shaking her fist. Flashback ends. By the time Naruto was finished talking about the incident, Mei was clutching her sides while laughing. Shinku's face matched her hair color, and right now she wanted to throttle her older brother. I hate you Aniki. She mumbled while Naruto grinned. Love you too. Did I mention that Kasan made her stay outside in the backyard for a week? He says, and that only made Mei laugh even harder. That's it. You're dead Aniki. She screams and tackles him out of the tent. They rolled over on the ground for a while, and Shinku was now on top of him. Naruto was currently laughing as he held her wrists away from his neck. That was when two Kumo Anbu appeared and sweat dropped at the scene. The one with the lion mask coughed to get their attention and they looked up. Can we help you Shishi-san? Naruto asks as Shinku blushed due to the fact that she didn't have a shirt on and ran back into the tent while Naruto stood up, dusting off his pants. We were sent here to inform you that your border patrol is done and that a different squad will be taking your place. Shishi, lion, stated and Naruto nodded. Thanks. We'll be leaving soon. Naruto says, and the two Anbu shunshin away. The Namaka's siblings managed to clear the camp, and Mei also. 
After they packed up, they headed back to Kumagakur with Mei following them. Naruto had given Mei a black flak jacket so that the males of the village wouldn't look at her chest. As they walked through the village, Naruto and Shinku were greeted by some of the villagers and ninjas there. Mei saw and talked to Naruto. You two are pretty popular with the citizens of this village. She says, and Naruto chuckles. I think it's due to the pranks I played when I was younger and when I was training with the Reikage and his Itado. When me and my family got here, the place was dull, but when I came well, let's just say that the village hasn't gotten boring, especially when the Reikage sent an Anbu after me whenever I prank him or certain members of his council. But I can say this about the civilian and shinobi council members. They can take a joke better than those stuck-up snobs that live in Konoha. He says, and Mei raises an eyebrow at this. Shinku started to get frustrated and spoke. Aniki, do we have to walk to the tower? Why don't we just shunch in there unless you're hoping to run into Yugi-chan or Samui-chan? She said with a grin on her face. Naruto blushes and glares at him. Shut up. He says and grabs Mei's hand and doesn't realize the blush she had from the contact and they shunch into the tower. Breakage tower. B was currently doing an arm curl up with a dumbbell in his right arm but had his chin resting in his hand and had a bored look on his face. Why did I take this boring job again? I've been doing arm curl ups for the last 3 hours and I'm bored as hell. Where's Karabi when you need him? At least I get a good workout with him or Kishina. He thought until Naruto, Shinku and a woman with russet hair appeared in his office. He blinks when he sees them and then drops the dumbbell causing the office to shake and Naruto sweat drops. Bored Rakage sensei. Naruto asks with a grin on his face and the man's brow twitches. Shut it unless you want to be my sparring partner for the next 4 hours. He says with a smirk on his face when he sees Naruto pale and waves his arms up in defense. Even though he knew how strong he was in the past, there was no way in the world that he could fight the guy in his current state. The man could split a small mountain in half with just one of his arms or legs and possess strength that rivaled if not was on par with a Jinchuriki's. He's even seen the man leave dents and steel plates with just a headbutt. Karabi was just as bad even without his Biju's power. These were the last two people you'd ever want to face in the battlefield, and he saw how powerful they were when they took out Kisum during the Fourth Shinobi War. Sorry sensei, but I like living and not having my bones broken. He says, and the man snorts. Cheeky brat. So would you like to explain to me who your companion is? He asks. Oh this is Mei Turumi, a Kanwaichi from Kurigakur. She washed up on the shoreline near the border and stayed with us since. Shinku explained, and he looked at the nervous woman. I see. Isn't Kurigakur in the middle of a civil war right now? He asks me who nods. Yes. I'm a part of the rebel group. The Yande Mizukage and his elite guards were on a ship, and my group made an attempt to raid the ship and capture if not kill the man, but he expected to pull that stunt. The last thing I saw before I blacked out was him being covered in some kind of chakra cloak, but it was more potent and in a way sinister. She says, making their eyes widen. Mei said it's possible that the Mizukage is a Naruto says, and her eyes widen in horror. Oh Kami. No wonder I couldn't face him. He's a container for A. She says quietly. Yep. There aren't a lot of nin out there that could fight let alone beat unless of course you had the abilities of the Shadam Hokage or you're also a vessel who is stronger. Like me. I'm the vessel for the Kyubi no Kitsune. Naruto says and her eyes widen in shock. But unlike the Mizukages, me and Kyubi are on good terms despite the fact that it was my dad that sealed her into me. Kumo also has two vessels living here and they two get along with each other. Naruto states, and Mei just stares at them. He coughs to get her attention. My Deshi is right. My Itado and my adopted daughter contain, and they cooperate with each other to secure their survival. He says, and she just nods. I see. Reikage-sama I know this is asking a lot, and I don't want to involve you with Kiri's situation, but I was hoping that it was possible for you to aid the rebel side in the war. We are mostly clans with bloodlines, and some are regular or former Anbu. She requests, and he raises an eyebrow. You're requesting a neutral country to aid you in a war we have no part in. Do you understand that this action could start another great shinobi war? He asks, and she lets out a frustrating sigh. Yes, but what choice do I have? We're being hunted non-stop, and half of our forces are already gone. We can't keep this up, and it's only a matter of time before the Mizukage decides to purify the other nations that have bloodline users. She answers, and he rubs his chin in thought. It's possible that could happen would most likely be the first since we're a lot closer than Kanoha is, and I will not let that ignorant fool of a Mizukage try to pull that stunt. This is a lot to think about Mei-san. I'll allow you to stay in Kumo until I make my decision. Do you need lodging for the time being? He asked Mei was going to answer until Naruto spoke up. She'll stay with us for now, Reikage-sama. My mother won't mind. 
Naruto says, and Shinku nods. Are you sure? I don't want to impose May states only for Naruto to wave it off. Don't worry we have plenty of room, but a little warning. Keep your distance from Anko. He says, and she blinks with a confused look on her face. Shinku giggles, but then grabs her hand, and they shunch in away. See ye sensei, and try not to put another human-shaped hole in the wall. He says, and sunshine away also. He mumbles about blonde cheeky brats getting on his nerves. That was when Karabi kicks the door off its hinge, and it collides with E's head, but it doesn't even phase him, as it bounces off his head, and a tick mark appears on the cage's head. Karabi had a grin on his face, and started to rap. Big bro big bro, Karabi, and Yujito Nai, have completed the mission yo. He says. Yujito kicks Karabi in the back of his head while her brow witches, and she has a tick mark on her head. Shut up with the stupid rhymes. I'm surprised he hasn't killed you yet. She yelled while Hachibi was in his container's mindscape begging the man to him and put him out of his misery and saying that Karabi's rapping was a fate worse than death. Please don't encourage me, Yujito. He mumbled as he wiped the debris from the door off his face. She then sniffs the air and a grin appears on her face. Naruto and Shinku have been here, right? She asks. He nods, but before he could say anything, his adopted daughter was gone via flame shunshin. I swear she can't go one day without playing with that boy. He says. Karabi snickers and speaks up. The fox likes to play with the cat. What's up with that? He asks, and the tick mark on E's head grows even bigger. Ten seconds later, Karabi was seen flying across the village courtesy T. Harry, Omeo, and Samui see this, and sweat drops appear on their faces. They see the man land in a hot spring bathhouse on the women's side and hear them scream pervert, and the sounds of Karabi getting beaten are heard and their sweat drops grow. Should we go help him? Amoy asks, and the three Kanoichi shake their heads. Nope. I'm gonna go find Naruto Kung. My neck and back are sore. She says, as she cracks her neck. Barry rolls her eyes and grabs a lollipop from Amoy's bag and sucks on it. Did you take the last strawberry flavored one? He asks. She pulled the sucker out of her mouth and it was blue. Go ahead and keep it. I hate blueberries. He says and walks away while she heads to Naruto the hot spring Shinku to rescue and Mei were walking through the forest of Kumo, heading for the Namika's estate until Naruto stopped in his tracks and smirks. Hey Shinku-chan, you and Mei Sen head back to the compound. I remembered I needed to do something important. He says and before Shinku could say anything, Naruto shunshin away and she lets out a frustrating sigh. Baka. Come on Mei Sen. She says but Mei blinks and looks at the redeed. Where is he going? She asks, as she follows Shinku. You don't want to know. She mumbles, as they head for the Namika's compound. In the forest, Yujito was perched up on a tree branch, waiting for a chance to pounce on Naruto when he suddenly sunshine away, and to her shock, couldn't detect him. Naruto suddenly appears behind her, and pinches her ass cheeks. Yujito keeps, and jumps up on her feet blushing. She growls, and turns her right hand into a fist, and turns around, ready to knock Naruto lights out. Naruto you damn pervert I'm gonna she started to say, but then stops and sees no one there. What the? I could have sworn he was. She started to say until she felt a pair of arms wrap around her waist and looked down to see they belonged to Naruto. Hey, Kitty-chan. He says and releases her from his grip. How do you keep doing that? She mumbles and crosses her arms over her chest. I'm just that good. He says with a grin on his face making her huff. You're so lucky you're cute damn it. Naruto shrugs and pulls her into a hug and kisses her lightly on the lips. You're lucky you're so damn sexy Yugi-chan. He says, making her grin and revealing a pair of canines. Love you Foxy. So are you gonna head home or keep holding me like this? She asks only to receive a kiss in return. You were gonna try to pounce me weren't you? He asked the vessel for the Nibi. I was, but you ruined it. She said with a pout on her face making him chuckle. No need to pout you behind. How about I take you out for sushi after you meet Mei-san? Yujito nods with a grin on her face, but then speaks up. Who's Mei? She asks. We were found unconscious near the shores of Kumo during border patrol. She's staying with us until further notice why. He asks. No reason. What is it with you and older women? She mumbles. Hey, you're only three years older than me, and so is Samui-chan. He states as he lets her go. What about Anko and Yuigao? She asks. Anko's not that bad okay maybe she is since she's been trying to jump me and make me her plaything since I was 13. Yuga chan is normally quiet and I can be around her and not fear for my virginity. He answered while she giggled. Did Anko have her way with you yet? Naruto's response was a blush. She almost did and if it wasn't for Rin Ni chan I would have been scarred for life. He said with a shudder causing Yujito to laugh at him. Oh you poor thing. 
must have been a traumatic experience for you. She cooed out and gave him a hug. And now I have to head back home and fear for my innocence again. He mumbled with a fake pout on his face and looked up at Yujito using the puppy's eyes. You'll protect me from her won't you Yugi Haim? Naruto asks. Yujito's grin became wider and pinched his cheeks. You are so cute when you pout. You look like a sad puppy. She cooed out but then beeps when he pinches her ass again, releasing Naruto. Said blonde grin and runs away with an angry and red Yujito chasing after him. Come back here and face me like a ninja you damn pervert. She yelled at the running and laughing blonde. Meanwhile. Shinku and Mei made it to the Namika's estate and Kiri Kinoichi was impressed by the sight. Wow. This is a nice compound. She stated. Thanks. The Rakage gave it to us as a welcome gift even though we aren't ninjas for his village. She says as they approached the door and were about to open it until Naruto appeared in front of them grinning while an angry and red Yujito leaped out of nowhere with her clawed gauntlet drawn. Come here you pervert so I can use you as a scratching post. She said and slowly approached them. Shinku tried to dissolve the situation by stepping in between them. Whoa now I know Naruto should pay for whatever he did to you, but let's not forget you started it and Iniki stop being a pervert or I'll tell Kasan. She said to Naruto who was performing the raspberry but then stopped and paled when she said she'd tell their mother, but then glared at her. Tell and I'll tell her who's been going downstairs at night and stealing her private dango stash and we both know it's not Anko since she knows better. He says making her pale. Fine. Jerk. She mumbles while Yujito puts her weapons away while Naruto walks towards the door but then pauses and rolls his eyes. Hey you guys might want to step away from the door. He warned. Shinku and Yujito move to the side leaving a confused Mei, but Shinku pulls her to the side and says just watch. Naruto rolls his eyes and opens the door and that was when a blur tackles him to the ground and they roll away for a while and then stop to see Anko grinning and sitting on top of Naruto. Hey Yonatam Chibi, did you miss me? I missed you. She says getting an irked look from Naruto who smirks and puffs away. Anko blinks in confusion only to see the real Naruto between Shinku and Yujito with an arm wrapped around their shoulders. Anko pouts and folds her arms. Damn it. I was so close to getting my hands on you. She mumbles and looks at the ground. Naruto chuckles and removes his arms from their shoulders. He then appears behind Anko and leans into her ear and whispers a few things, making her eyes widen and a blush appear in her face. Naruto motions for the others to go on and while he talks to Anko. Shinku leads them into the house and that was when Naruto wrapped his arms around her. You know Anko I'm flattered that you would be interested in me despite the age difference. So what set up this form of attraction you have towards me? He asks while she blushes a little and fidgets. Well you see Akinda just happened to be honest. I've seen how you treat that Yujito girl, Yuga-chan, and those other three, and she explained. I see, but we have fun too, you know. I mean you're a great prankster and I love teasing you and you are hot in your own way even though you tried to make me into a man that day you were drunk. He says while she chuckles slightly from the remark. I remember. Your mom was ready to kill me that day. At least she didn't make you go through four hours of kinjutsu training with her. He mumbled as he released her and helped her up. Ah, sorry. She started to say but then winced and grabbed her left shoulder. Naruto frowned and had her kneel down and pulled part of her trench coat and arm away and saw the three Tama marks on her and saw it pulsing. Wait Naruto didn't look at she started to say, but he cut her off. The curse seal. Hiro Senen showed me a picture of it once. Has it been getting worse? He asks and she nods and hisses in pain. Bam painkillers don't even work anymore. She mumbles and looks away. Naruto places his hand on the seal and channels some of Yubi's chakra into it and makes it stop pulsing. Anko's eyes widen when she doesn't feel any more pain and looks at Naruto who slowly pulls his hand away. How did you do? She started to ask until he smirks. I used this. Naruto holds his hand out and reveals a paper with different seals on it. It's a compression seal Lee Rosenen taught me and said it can be used to seal up foreign chakra. That should help for now. He says and once again helps her up. That and Yubi's chakra is keeping it in check. He thought while Anko glumps him and gives him a kiss on the cheek. Thanks, Naruto-kun. I'll have to thank you later on today. She says with a mischievous grin on her face. Naruto smirks and gets out of her hug. I think you want to do more than thank me Anko-chan and remember I can't do anything serious yet. He says and makes her shiver when he rubs her rear with his hand and gives it a good squeeze. Come on. Let's go in. He says while she follows him into the compound. As they enter, Naruto saw his mother talking to Mei, Yugao, Yujito, and Shinku on the couch in the living room, and Kakashi was leaning against the wall, eyes smiling at Naruto. What? 
Naruto asks his surrogate brother who was grinning under his mask. You have no clue how proud I am of you Naruto. Bringing home older women. Sniffle they grow up so fast. He says, wiping a fake tear away from his eye. His response got him a slap upside the head by Rin. Shut it you or you're gonna get reacquainted with the couch again. She growled out while Kakashi sweats a little. Well I think I'll go and see if we need anything for the compound. And Naruto remember the talk we had and be sure to use protection. He says sunshine away with a red face Naruto yelling shut up. That damn pervert. I swear one of these days I'm gonna kick his ass. He muttered until he heard his mother cough to get his attention and succeeded. Oh hey Kasan. How was your day so far? He asks and was a little nervous due to the fact that she was giving him the look mothers give when their son brings a girl home. Or in her son's case, a woman. It was fine until you brought another female home with you. She says while he slumps his shoulders. Oh for Kami say Kas and I had no idea and Shinku would find her barely alive near the shoreline. Plus I couldn't leave her out there. He started while she looked at him for a while and sighs. If Hiro Senen was here he'd be having a field day with all the females in the house. She mumbled, getting a nod from her son. Do true, Kakashi Nai San is bad enough, but at least he has some control over his perverted side, thanks to Ranni Chan. He said with a small grin on her face while she blushed lightly and glared at her little brother. So Yugi Chan, where's our sensei? Did he do something to piss the old man off again? He asked for the Nibi container, and she shrugged. Knowing him, he probably did. So Mei San Kiri is still in the middle of a war, right? Yujido asks the dual bloodline wielder who nods. I'm afraid so. I'm on the rebel side, but we're slowly losing the fight. Yagura the Yande Mizukage is a Sanbi no Onikam. She finished getting wide eyes from everyone except Naruto and Shinku since they knew already. The bloodline purge just happened out of nowhere. He believes that bloodlines are the reason why we always have war and wanted to purify not just water country, but the other elementals as well. He's even having the shinobi kill even children. She said as the images of dead children entered her mind. Everyone's eyes widened at what she said and couldn't believe the cage would do something like that. So the only thing I could think of is to ask the rakage for assistance, but I'm afraid that it would start another great shinobi war. We had another container for the Rakubi no Namakuji, but he disappeared after the civil war started. She finished. After being silent for a few seconds Kashina spoke up. I see. Well I would definitely help you, and so would my friends and children. My son is actually the holder of the Kaiubi no Kitsune, and we have Sharingan no Kakashi, two of my students who are very strong, and my late husband's other student whose medical skills are on par with Tsunade's. She said getting a wide-eyed look from Mai. That was when Yujito spoke up. I'm the container for the Nibi no Nekamata, and the Reikage's younger brother is the container for the Hachibi no Kaionyu. We are the guardians of Kaminari no Kuni. She said. You two along with the Reikage's brother are Jinkiriki. She asks and gets a nod from Naruto and Yujito. We can each control our power and Naruto-kun here is the youngest of us. Yujito said. I see. If you all could help me save our village and country I'd be forever in your debt. She said. No problem. Rin would you be so kind and show Mei to one of the guest rooms. I'm sure she would love to take a shower and change into some comfortable clothes. Kishina asked the med Kanoichi who nodded and got up. Follow me Mei-san. She says, and Mei gets up and follows her upstairs. After that Yujito appeared beside Naruto with her arms wrapped around him and grins. So are we gonna go out for sushi or do I need to tell your mom that you pinched my ass earlier? Whoops I just did. She says grinning while Naruto glares at her, but pales and slowly turns his head to see a dark aura surrounding his mother. He started to sweat bullets and before Kishina could do anything, Naruto grabbed Yujito's shoulder and sunshine out of the house. Shinku and Yuga laugh lightly while Anko grins. You're not gonna kill your only son are you sensei? Anko asks her teacher who lets out a frustrated sigh. No, but I can beat the crap out of him later. I never should have let Kakashi give Naruto the talk. She mutters and lays back on the couch. You really need to relax sensei and find yourself a boyfriend soon or you're gonna go nuts from the lack of sexual activity. Anko says, causing Kashina to fall onto the floor while Yuga sweat dropped. Shinku however fell to the floor laughing her ass off and Kashina shot up from the ground and glared at her student hard. For that comment Anko you can't have Dango for two weeks. She said and smirked when Anko paused and paled. No Anko's cry echoed throughout Kumo causing many people to stop and wonder who was suffering right now. Anko was currently in a corner curled up into a ball crying her eyes out while Shinku giggled. You should learn to keep your mouth shut Anko. Well I'm gonna go change Kasan. Shinku then heads upstairs while Yugao was patting a sobbing Anko on the back. Later on that night. 
Everyone in the compound was sound asleep in their rooms, but outside the compound, eight shadows were zipping through the roof of the building, and they wore blank masks with the kanjina on it. Danzo Sama's orders are to capture the girl and kill the Kaiubi boy. Stay quiet and alert because there are four A's and one S rank shinobi in the compound. One root Anbu ordered while the other three nodded. They opened a sunroof and quietly leaped into the hallway and separated into two groups. Meanwhile Naruto was in his room sound asleep until his eyes snapped open, revealing the Sharingan which glowed in the moonlight. Team 1 found a door on the right and slowly opened it, revealing a room and a person sleeping in the bed. The two root members slowly crept up and drew their tantos when they saw that it was one of their targets. The leader raised his tanto and instantly pulled the cover off, but the body faded away and in its place was a seal that glowed white. Before the root members could react, a surge of electricity coursed through their bodies, making them scream out in pain and collapse while their bodies twitched and jerked. Naruto appeared wearing only a pair of black cargo pants while his Sharingan glowing in the dark. He then summoned two clones and had them tie the two drones up. That was when an explosion occurred and the house rocked making his eyes widen. What the hell? Oh shit Shinku. Naruto said and suddenly warps away. Outside the building. An explosion occurred in the eastern side of the compound and smoke rose from it. A red blur leaped out of the smoke and into the forest with four black blurs coming after her. Shinku was leaping through the treetops clutching her bleeding arm. She suddenly stopped on a tree limb and flipped off of it when a barrage of kunai went right after her and she landed on the ground and sped away into the forest. Do more root and Bu leaped out of the trees and went after her. Who the heck are those guys and why did they attack me? She thought as she increased her speed. As she sped past a tree her eyes widened when she saw an exploding tag glow. Shit. She performed a few hand seals and slammed her hands on the ground and a wall of earth appeared in front of her. Another explosion occurred, but the power behind it was so powerful that it reduced the wall into rubble and sent Shinku flying backwards. She suddenly hit the ground and tumbled backwards a couple of times. She leapt back on her feet and made her way towards the lake. She leaped on top of it and performed a few hand seals. Sujin Heki. She cried out and a wall of water surrounded her, while drills made of water shot out around her wall of water. When the technique ended, the water wall dropped, but it revealed no one. Two root Anbu appeared on top of the lake and looked around. Where did she go? One root asks, as they look around. She couldn't have escaped. We would have sensed her chakra by now. The second one answered. At the edge of the lake a green frog pops out of the water and slowly swims to the shoreline. It crawls out of the lake and hops away into the forest while the root Anbu look for Shinku. After leaping away from the area for a while it stops and slowly opens its mouth. A hand shoots out and after that a whole arm, head full of red hair and a body comes out of the toad's mouth. Shinku was kneeling down panting and the toad disappeared in a puff of smoke. It's only a matter of time before they find me. I better head back to the... Shinku. A voice behind her said. By reflex she pulled out a kunai and swung it towards the shadowy figure but he stopped her wrist. She tried to kick him in the side only for him to grab her leg and pin her to the ground while she struggled. The Mato chill it's me. Naruto said, revealing his face to her. What the heck is going on and who are those? She started to say until he covered her mouth and did a shushing motion with his finger. Quiet. Those masked ninja are still searching for you. He said getting off her and motioning his hand to follow her. That was until a kunai passed by him and was embedded into a tree. Naruto and Shinku look up to see two root Anbu descend towards them from the trees with their blades drawn. Naruto curses due to the fact that he left his kunai at the compound, as does Shinku. They leapt backwards when the drones landed in their previous location and then charged towards the siblings. As they approached the Namika's twins, they swung their blades at their heads. Naruto ducks and grabs the root Anbu's wrist. He twists it hard, hearing a snapping sound come from the drone's wrist, and before the nin could scream, Naruto positioned the tanto and thrust it into his heart, killing him instantly. Naruto tosses the dead body to the side and sees Shinku unleash a barrage of punches on the other root ninja. She then kicks the ninja hard in his masked face, breaking it and sending the drone flying into a tree and knocking him out. Naruto's eyes widen and yell. Shinku duck. Said girl duck while a tanto hits nothing but air. Naruto appears in front of the shocked root ninja with a swirling blue ball of chakra in his hand. Rasengan. Naruto yelled as he slams his father's technique into the nin's gut and sends him flying through three trees and a boulder, killing the root ninja while Shinku gets back up on her feet. That was when they heard the sound of a thousand birds chirping and a blood-curdling scream. Kakashi appears with his right hand coated in blood. Kakashi Nai-san. Shinku says as she runs over to the man. Are you two okay? Kakashi asks while Naruto appears next to his sister. We're fine. 
What about Kasand and the others? They didn't get caught in the explosion did they? Naruto asks. No they didn't, but we dealt with the others. Kakashi says, as he walks over to the dead body of Arid Anbu and pulls the mask off. His normal eye narrows when he sees the kanji for one on it. So Danzo is behind this. I should have known. Kakashi mumbled as he tossed the mask away. Isn't he the cripple that mom wanted to have, and Naruto Nai turned into a breeding factory? Shinku asks, but doesn't see her brother Sharingan flash in the dark, but fades afterwards. Kakashi nods while flicking the blood off his arm. Sadly yes. He, the two elders, as well as the civilians, wanted to turn you both into their personal playthings, but our mother retaliated and killed several members, as well as sent Danzo to the hospital. The rest you already know. He said while well, Shinku treated her arm. The thing Kar 2 sent sacrificed his life for those ungrateful bastards. She said while well, Naruto nodded. Yeah, but at least we'll be able to carry on his legacy even if we aren't a part of that village. I'm sure he'd be proud of us Shinku-chan. Naruto said. Kakashi's eyes smiled and nodded in agreement. Well let's clean up this mess and head back to the compound. Kakashi said and they used water to get rid of the bodies and afterwards head back. Back at the compound Kashina, Rin, Anko, Yugao and Mei were outside the partly destroyed living quarters. Yugao and Mei were putting out the fire while Rin was treating a few burn injuries Anko had. Kashina on the other hand had a barely conscious Rutanin by the collar, and she was beyond pissed. She already killed two of the Rutanin that tried to escape, but she kept one alive in order to get some info from him. Listen here you bastard. You better tell why you attacked us and why my children are missing right now before I send you back to your master in pieces. She yelled, shaking the drone violently. He won't talk Kasan. Naruto said. Kashina dropped the man and saw her children along with Kakashi walking towards them. In a flash of red she had the two children she brought into the world in a hug. Naruto. Shinku. Oh thank Kami you two are okay. She said in relief while they returned the hug. We're fine Kasan. Naruto assured his mother who released them and noticed Shinku's arm was bandaged up a little. Your arm. Kashina said worriedly while the younger Ritid looked at it. I got hit by some of the debris Kasan, that's all. She replied while Naruto walked over to the root ninja's barely conscious form and slammed his foot into the man's face, knocking him out. He then drags the na operative towards his mother and sets him down, rips the mask off, and pries his mouth open. Kashina and Hikari are confused by this until Naruto pulls the tongue out slightly. Like I said earlier Kas and you won't get any info from these guys. These Juin marks keep them from talking about Danzo or his operations. If they do then the mark instantly activates and their body freezes up instantly. Naruto explained while their eyes widened. Sachi, how do you know so much about seals? I mean I know Jiraiya taught you and Shinku the aspects of Junjutsu and how to use them properly, but I honestly didn't think you'd get this far. She asked. Naruto, on the other hand, smiled. Dad's intellect rubbed off on me. He answered, but that was when he and a squad of his Anbu appeared. Kashina what the hell happened here? I could practically see the smoke coming from your home from the tower. He asked demanded while the Anbu and Kakashi went to help Yugao and Mei in putting out the fire. Kashina brushed her hair back and spoke up. We were attacked by some ninja from Kanoha. She answered, which made the man's eyes widen in shock, but they're not any of Saratobi's men. They belong to a man named Danzo. He had a confused look on his face until Naruto spoke up. He's the team I told you about that forced us to leave. Naruto answered. I see. Are any of his men alive? He asks. Naruto lifted an unconscious Rutanin in front of E. This one is Sensei, but he has a seal that keeps him from talking about his master, so you'll need to contact Hiro Kaiofu and have him take a look at it. Naruto stated while the man nodded and snapped his fingers, making two Anbu appear at attention. You two take this man to the Anbu holding cells until Jiraiya Sama returns and have him searched for any form of weapon, as well as suicidal pills. He ordered. The masked nin nodded, grabbed the root nin, and vanished. How are the others Kasan? Naruto asks his mother. Anko chan Yuga-chan, Mei-chan and Rin-chan are all fine Sachi, though we're gonna have to stay in an apartment complex until the compound is fixed. She said and looked at E. Breakage sama I'm sorry that this incident occurred. She said bowing, but he blinks in confusion and waves it off. There is no need for you to apologize to Kashina-chan. Kanoha in a sense is responsible for this incident and I assure you that I will be getting an explanation from the old monkey about this. He seriously needs to put his subordinates on a tighter leash. He growled out and afterwards sunshine away, as did the remaining Anbu. Kashina sighs and brushes her hair back. Why can't those bastards just leave us alone? She mumbled and Naruto frowned when he heard this and swore that he would kill Danzo and his lackeys. He was not gonna let that man destroy his family. 
just wait for Danzo theme. The next time we meet I will shove a Akiri into your chest and rip your vile heart out. He said clenching his fists in anger. Oh come on big bro. Why can't I help assist in the Wario? Karabi whined while Lee's brow twitched dangerously. For the last time you were already on a mission when I picked a ninja that'll help Mei send side in the bloodline purge, and Yujito's already going with them. Two Jinchuriki are more than enough to deal with the Mizukage, and the Sanbi since their other Jinchuriki has left Kiri's forces. He said in a calm but angry tone. But what about my students Amui, Kari, and Amoy? Karabi asked. They will be fine damn it. You must stay to guard the borders of our country, and that's final. He said with a tick mark on his face, and was five seconds away from sending Karabi into a mountain. That was when Naruto appeared in the tower, and sweat dropped when he saw he ready to beat the crap out of his younger brother. Um, do I need to come back later? The blonde asked Wily let out a sigh. No Naruto stay. So is the group prepared to head into water country territory? He asked, and got a nod from the blonde. Good, and so that you know you all will be posing as mercenaries that may hire to help assist in the war, since the last thing we need is another international incident in tampering with a neutral country's affairs. Do you all have a plan on how to deal with man's forces? He asked Naruto who nodded. Thanks to all the knowledge he gained from Madara after he absorbed him from his timeline, Naruto knew all of Kiri's strongholds, security shifts, locations of their backup supplies, and their weak spots. What about the daimyos? Naruto asked. They already know that we're making this attempt and are already planning to start a treaty with us once the rebellion side succeeds. Remember to stay alert out there Naruto because the ninja there are masters in stealth and assassination. He said, getting a nod from the blonde. And so am I. He thought. So right now our best bet would be to leave early tomorrow since their boat patrols are more alert at night than in the daytime. Naruto started getting a nod from me while Karabi sulked in a corner. So what about the issue we had with Konoha? Naruto asked, and the man sighs in frustration. I hate to tell you this Naruto, but unfortunately Danzo cannot be touched due to all the political influence he has on most of the governing system in Kanahagakur. And despite our attempts to get any info out the root Anbu even with the curse mark removed, he reluctantly died from the interrogation and torture he went through. He said. Those words caused Naruto's eyes to flash red for a few seconds, and he clenched his fists in anger. You mean to tell me that that fucking cripple is gonna get away with sending his drones after my family and live to see another day? He asked in a dangerous tone, getting a reluctant nod from the man. Yes, but I sent a message to the Sandame and gave him a warning that Kanohanin were not allowed to enter Kumo territory until further notice, and if any ninja from Kanoha were seen anywhere in our country, they'd be killed on the spot, and I also doubled our patrol squads around the borders. He stated. I see, but how does that keep Danzo theme in check? Naruto asked me who grinned. The simply put it Kanoha would end up going to war with us, and it would be a war they cannot win, because not only are they still recovering their forces from the Kaiubi's attack, but Kumo happens to have three on their side while they have none. All in all you, Yujito, and Karabi will have little to no problem raising that place to the ground. He answered. That may be true, but Danzo's not someone who should be taken lightly. He was one of the few who competed with Hirazan Suratobi for the Hokage title, and the man is an opportunist and manipulator. He'll do whatever it takes to get what he wants no matter what the consequences. Naruto explained. I'll take your word on that. Well good luck kid, and please make sure those four get back in one piece or Karabi will level half of Kumo to the ground. He stated since Yujito, Kari, Amoy, and Samui were like family to Karabi, and to harm them in any way, shape, or form, would spell death for the person responsible, and a pissed of Karabi was a dangerous Karabi, since the man was the strongest shinobi in the village next to E and Kishina. I will, and I'll make sure Kari Chan doesn't kill that laid-back Baka Amoy during the mission. He said jokingly while Lee chuckled, knowing good and well how those two are always at it, and Samui and Yujito would have to be the ones to break it up. Yes, please do. He said while Naruto gives him a mock salute and disappears in a swirl of wind. The next day. Kumo shipping ports. It was midnight near the shipping docks of one of Kumo's ports, and standing near a large cargo ship were Kishina, Naruto, Shinku, Kakashi, Rin, Mei, Anko, and Yugao, along with the Kumo ninja that were gonna aid them who happened to be Yujito, Kari, Samui, Amoy, and a squad of Anbu that were picked personally by E. Naruto was currently inspecting his gear, as were the others. Amoy was currently sighing while sucking on a lollipop and pondering on what would happen if this S-ranked mission would fail. Naruto saw the faraway look on mom's face and chuckled while making his way towards him. Amoy just kept pondering on the consequences if they were to fail to aid the rebel faction and get caught until he felt a hand on his shoulder. He turned his head to see a smirking Naruto. You know Amoy pondering on the negative outcomes isn't healthy. 
he stated, and the young sword user shrugged. I know, but hey this is my first time going into the unknown territory of a neutral nation, and you never know what could happen there. He stated. Kerui sighed in frustration and bopped Amoy on the head. Listen to what Naruto-kun is saying, Amoy. You take things way too seriously. Lighten up for a change. Besides, I can't wait to start kicking ass and taking names. She said as she flexed her arm and grinned. Said sword user looks at her with a bored expression and shrugs once again. Whatever. He said nonchalantly which made her stumble over, but she caught her footing and growled at her teammate. She slowly raised her fist and swung it at an unaware Amoy until Naruto appeared in between them and caught her fist in his palm. You can pummel the laid-back idiot after our mission carry chan Naruto said, eyes smiling at the girl who was now blushing, and pulled her hand away from him and folded her arms across her chest. Fine. She muttered while he chuckled. Hey, Naruto-kun. Hitomi spoke up. Yeah Hitomi-chan. He asked. How are you gonna handle the Yande Mizukage and the Sambi? I'm pretty sure you and Yujito alone would be capable of handling them both, but do you have a way to beat him without killing him and releasing the overgrown turtle? She asked while Naruto pondered on this and spoke up. Actually I do. From the knowledge I gained from Madara, he placed a powerful Onyagura and controlled his actions throughout Kiri and having him start the bloodline genocide war. He said with a frown on his face. To be able to control a Jinchuriki who has full control over their Bijuu under a Sharingan influenced Jinjutsu is amazing yet terrifying. Madara indeed was a man to be feared. Now I can see why my dad had a tough time facing him in my timeline. Indeed, since you not only absorbed and gained Madara's and Sasuke's as well as the Juubi's knowledge, powers, eyes and Jutsu's, facing the one in this dimension should be a cinch for you since you know what he's planning to do. She stated. Maybe, but it's possible that Madara would be different from the one I fought and will more than likely try to use this to gain his original strength back, but I can't worry about the Akatsuki yet. My primary concern is this war, as well as Arachimaru and Danzo. He said to the vixen who nodded in his mindscape. That was when he felt a hand on his shoulder and looked up to see Kakashi. Are you nervous about Naruto? This is your and Shinku's first time entering unknown territory and fighting in a war, and this is different from doing a mission since anything could happen. He asked the blonde with a concerned look on his masked face. The little Aniki, but I'll manage. He assured the copy nin who nodded his head. Okay, but stay focused because in a few hours we'll be entering a war zone. He started and left to get all of his gear ready, but a thought ran in his mind. That's really weird. Naruto doesn't seem so worried like Shinku was and the look in his eyes. Those were the eyes of a shinobi who has fought in countless battles and has taken many lives, but that can't be right. I mean sure Naruto has been on missions when he's had to kill, but maybe I'm just seeing things. A while later they all boarded the cargo ship and it set sail towards Kiri. Inside the cargo hold. Naruto was currently sitting on a crate, sharpening his ninjato with a smooth stone, and that was when Yujito walked around the corner and sat next to him. They remained silent for a few minutes until the blonde spoke up. You know Karabi raised a huge stink over not being able to join in the war right? He asked while she chuckled and shook her head. Yeah that sounds like something our overgrown bull-headed sensei would do especially with Amoy, Kerry, and Samui with us. He's very overprotective of them. So are you ready to participate in your first war? She asked a blonde who nodded and sheathed his blade and that was when she wrapped her arms around him and held him close to her body. Just promise me you and Shinku-chan would be careful out there so that we can come back home in one piece. Naruto signs and wraps an arm around her waist. I will Yujito chan plus if I end up dying you can just have Nibi bring me back to life and beat the stupidity out of me. He said jokingly which made her chuckle at the thought. All kidding aside, I will be careful, I promise. He said and kissed her on the cheek. Yeah just like the one where you promised me you wouldn't try to cut through that minefield when that dog got away from you. She replied. Hey, that was the lightning lady's purebred poodle and if I remember it was your fault I had to go into that minefield since she bit you on the ass because you smelled like cats he said which made her fume. Whatever you blonde jerk. She said and got off the crate and grabbed Naruto's hand. Come on, we're an hour away from the hidden dock Mei was talking about. She said as she led them out of the cargo hold. Secret docking port. As the ship entered and docked next to the port the group made their way out of the cargo ship and Mei led them to the secret route that would take them to the rebel camp. As they walked through the path a small group of Kiri ninja appeared and blocked their path. That was when one of them walked forward. Hold it. Are you allies or enemies? The Mei last. He was 6'1 and was wearing the Kiri Jounin outfit. He had black spiky hair, reddish brown eyes, and the lower part of his face was covered in black bandages. Strapped to his back was a large broadsword. 
From tip to handle, it is approximately 5 to 6 feet long, with a single-edged enormous blade approximately 1 foot wide. It sported a bolted steel base and blade, and there are two holes on the blade near the hilt. The base is reckoned to having a swirling or winged motif at its base, tinted gold, and the blade is now black, with engraved marks at its base. All in all, the blade was wicked looking. Naruto on the other hand raised an eyebrow when he saw the man. Whoa this guy looks just like Zabuza. Wonder if they're related in any way? He thought. Mei made her way through the group and stepped forward. Hello Shinjin Mamachi. Mei said with a smile on her face while Shinjin's eyes widened in shock. Mei? You're alive. But how? I heard from the group that retreated that you were claimed by the sea after the failed attempt to attack the Mizukage and his naval force. He asked the lava user whose smile grew. I would have had it not been for the children of the late Yandame Hokage. She stated and motioned for the two siblings to step forward, and Shinjin's eyes widened when he saw two teenage versions of the Yellow Flash and Red Death. They found me barely alive near the shores of Kumo and have helped me fully recover. She explained, and that was when Kashina stepped forward which made Shinji's eyes bug out, as did the other Kiri Ninja. It's Kashina Uzumaki the Red Death. One of the Kiri Nin stated as he pointed at her. Kashina on the other hand rubbed the back of her head in embarrassment. Yes I am the Red Death, and these two are my children, and we, along with my students, my late husband's students, and the group of Kumo Nin, are here to assist you and the rebels in ending this war. Kashina started making the Kirin and gawk and started to whisper to each other. Can you believe it? We've got the Red Death on our side and get to see her in action. One male Nin said. I know. She was the only ninja who could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the yellow flash and wait, she had kids with the man who wiped out I was Shinobi army in the blink of an eye. A female Kiri Nin said. Yeah the blonde looks just like the Yandame Hokage. I wonder if he knows the Horatian and Rasengan his father created. Another nin asked. Kashina sweat dropped when she heard all of this and sighs. Great, I've got a fan club here just like in Kumo. She muttered while the Kumo nin sweat dropped and the former leaf nin snicker. Naruto on the other hand was focusing on Shinjin who raised an eyebrow. What? He asked the blonde who blinked a few times. By any chance are you related to Zabuza Mamachi? Naruto asked, and the man's eyes widened, but then returned to normal. Yeah, I'm related to that idiot. He's my younger brother, why? He asked the blonde. Well you both look the same in a sense. He answered while the man chuckled. Yeah we get that a lot since I'm known as the devil of the mist, well he's known as the demon of the mist. The only difference is that I'm stronger than him. The Baka should have listened to me when I told him not to make an attempt to kill the Yande Mizuka yet, but the damn brat was stubborn, as hell. If I ever find him I'm gonna break every damn bone in his body. Shinjin started with an evil gleam in his eye which made Naruto sweat drop. Yeah you're related to him alright. Well it's an honor to be fighting alongside you. He said as he offered his hand which the man looked at for a while and at Naruto but then nodded and shook the blonde's hand. Likewise, I look forward to seeing the son of the yellow flash fight as well. Shinjin stated. After being introduced to the other Kirinin and the Kumonin that were assisting them, Shinjin and the Kirinin led them to the rebel camp. Rebel camp. As the group approached the camp, they noticed that in the camp were a lot of Kirinin that were ranked as Chunin, Jonin, Anbu, and some were wearing hunter masks, meaning they were Oinin. There were plenty of tents that range from small to large, and the large ones apparently were meant for holding supplies, as well as the refugees that were against the war. There also appeared to be those with bloodlines in the group and some that Naruto recognized like a few members of the Kagaya clan, Hayo clan, Kitsuiki, Blood clan, this is Ranmaru's clan, and a few others. Most of the clan members consisted of young adults who were tending to the children. That was when Shinjin stopped and looked at the group. Well May, since you're back, let's head to the main tent and inform the temporary leader that you're back. The rest of you can join up or if you want, look around, but don't wander too far. The Zanbado user said, and left with Mei following, and that was when Kashina spoke up. Kakashi, Anko, Yugao, Rin, and Yukumo Anbu are coming with me to meet the leaders of this rebellion. Naruto, Shinku, Yujido, Kari, Samui, and Amoi can look around. She said getting a nod from the group while the adults left. So what should we do now that we're here? Shinku asked the group, and that was when Amoi spoke up. I don't know about you, but I'm just gonna sit under a tree and take a nap. Amoy said, as he left with his hands in his pockets getting a sweat drop from them all. Lazy Baka. Kari mumbled, but then appeared beside Naruto and wrapped her arms around his arm. Come on Naruto kun you, and I can look around and spend some time alone. She emphasized alone and had a grin on her face and dragged him off to God knows where well said blonde blinked a few times and shrugs and walks alongside her leaving Yujido and Samui glaring hard at Kari's back. 
Said dark-skinned female turned her head around and did a victory sign with her hand and grinned cheekily at the two blondes had tick marks on their heads. That bitch. Where does she get off stealing your future mate? Nibi hissed in her mindscape. Yeah where does she get stealing my weight what? Nibi he's not my mate. She yelled at the cat demon with a red face. Oh please kitten don't even try to pull that. You two are practically inseparable. You better claim his manhood first before those other girls do. She stated which made Yujito blush and sputter. But she stammered until Shinku slung her arms around Yujito and Samui's shoulders. Come on now you two, let's check out the place. She said while the two sigh and follow her. Main tent. Inside the tent were the leaders of the different divisions of the rebellion and were currently discussing a plan in invading Karigakur and that was when one of the leaders of the Hunter Nin division heard his name being called. Aosan. Aosan cried a frantic voice. Aus eyes and sees Shijuro run into the room panting. CHMJKRM has short tufty blue hair and dark eyes. He also has pointed shark-like teeth, traits that all known members of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist as well as apprentices shared. He wears square black rimmed glasses connected to what appear to be headphones, a blue striped shirt and camouflage pattern pants that resemble the clothing Zabuza Mamachi wore during his first appearance. Also, he wears his forehead protector on the front of his holster like a badge on his chest. He carries Hiramekure on his back, wrapped with large bandages. He also has a shuriken holder strapped onto each leg. What is Shijuro now? We were in the middle of an important meeting. He said while the blue-haired swordsman managed to regain his breathing and spoke up. She's back. Mei Sen is back. He said which made the man's eyes widen. What do you mean she's back? She drowned during the failed raid on Yugura's personal ship said a man named Anishi Yukimura, the White Tiger of the Mist. He was 6'1", and had short spiky snow-white hair, and wore a long-sleeved white Chinese shirt with matching pants and black boots with an okatana strapped to his waist. That was when the russet-haired woman walked into the tent with a grin on her face. Oh Anishi that hurts. She said, and everyone inside the tent's eyes bugged out. And to think I thought we were best friends. She finished with a mock pout on her face. Am May? But how? We were told you drowned. He asked. She would have been had it not been for my children. Said a feminine voice behind Mei, and Kashina walked in behind her which caused everyone's eyes to bug out and silence filled the room. Oh my god it's the Red Death. Shouted Koga, the leader of the tracking and scouting squad, he looks like the Koga from Inayasha, only he wears the Kiri Shinobi outfit, while the others just gawked. Um Mei what is the wife of Yandane doing here? Isn't she a part of Konoha? Inishi asked the female Tarumi who shook her head. Now she and her family reside in Kumo and are working as ninja for hire and they are going to assist us in ending this war. Her children, Naruto Namikas and Shinku Namikas, saved me when I washed upon the shores of Kaminari no Kuni and I stayed with them until I fully recovered. I also asked Arakage for some assistance and he allowed several of his Anbu and some to assist us. May explained. I see. So who are the other ninjas that are with you aside from your children Kishina-sama? asked a rugged man who was in his forties and went by the name Benkei. Please there is no need for formalities, and, as for others they are Kakashi Haddock, Rinin Yazuka, Anko Midarashi, and Yugo Yazuki, and the last two are my students, as the other two were former students of my husband. She answered, and the group looked like they were gonna have heart attacks. Those ninja were practically A-ranked in the bingo book, with Kishina being a SS-class ranked Kinoichi, whose rep surpassed even Sanadi's. This is too good to be true. Somebody pinch me. Inishi said to himself, but then he yelped and rubbed his arm due to the fact that Kagura Kagaya pinched his arm and had a grin on her face. She was wearing a battle black kimono with a pair of biker shorts and had an adachi strapped to her back. What he said pinched him so I did. She said with a grin on her face while the other sweat dropped. Meanwhile. Naruto was walking around the village with a dark-skinned Kinoichi holding onto his arm and looking at the sight before them. There appeared to be a lot of medical tents since outside the tents were medical nin treating those who got injured and saw plenty of body bags where family members were crying over the loss of their loved ones. Perry couldn't help but be saddened by this. She knew war wasn't pretty since she and Amoy were war orphans due to the fact that their parents were killed in the last one. As they walked around they heard the sound of someone calling for help and saw two Kirin in. One was female and had raven-colored hair and violet eyes, and she was having trouble holding him up due to the fact that he had a couple of kunai and tanto sticking out of his back and his right arm seemed to have second-degree burns. Akira hung in there almost at the medical ward, she said, as she tried to hoist him up on her shoulders. You should have left me there Kuroko-chan. Akira started and grunted in pain. Shut up. I don't want to hear you talking like that now stay awake you baka. 
she said, and then turned her head to see a male blonde teenager run up to them, and a dark-skinned female teenager walk up to them, as well as a small group of medical nin. Oh thank Kami. She said. Here let us help you get him to a tent. Naruto offered, and he and Kari carefully placed Akira's arms over his shoulders, and Kuroko smiled tiredly, as she let Kari take over. Thank you she said, as she held her bleeding arm while one of the medic nin walked over and helped heal her arm, while the others led Naruto and Kari to one of the medical tents. A few hours later Naruto, Kari, and Kuroko were sitting outside the medical ward while said Kiri Kinoichi had a bandaged arm and a few patches on her face. A medical nin walked out of the tent and wiped a bead of sweat off his forehead. How is he? Kuroko asked the man who sighs, but a small smile forms on his face. He'll be fine. He just needs to stay off his feet for a few weeks. Luckily none of those weapons hit his vital organs. The med nin said while Kakura let out a sigh of relief. Oh thank Kami. She said to herself. Naruto then sat up which made Kari raise an eyebrow in confusion. Come on Kari-chan. We need to head back. He said, which made her nod and get up. Night. The six leaders of the rebel forces along with their platoons of ninja were standing on a hilltop. Naruto was standing beside Kakashi and Anko who were in their war gear and standing in the middle of the leaders was mate Rumi who was in her war gear. And had her blade Keenheim, Blaze Princess, strapped to her back, Nero's blade Red Queen from DMC4. Listen up everyone. She called out, getting the attention of the other ninja. I am gonna be honest with you all. Tomorrow is not promised to us, and we'll more than likely die in this final attempt to free our home and country from the darkness that has plagued it since the Yande Mizukid started the bloodline purge. All I ask from you is to look out for one another, and should you fall, take as many of our enemies as you can with you until you breathe your last breath. Tonight will be the fall of the bloody mist and the rise of a new era for us and the next generation. She said and raised her fist in the air for Kiri. She cried out. Anishi raised his fist in the air. For Kiri. Enkei did the same, as did his fellow comrades. For Kiri. As did Kagura Kagaya. For Kiri. And Koga Kurakami, Black Wolf, did the same, as well. For Kiri. And finally Ao. For Kiri. Shin Mamachi stood forwards and drew his Zabatu and raised it in the air. For Kiri. He shouted, which was responded by the other Kiri Nin, letting out a battle cry that echoed throughout the forest. Izukage Tower. Iguru was currently wearing his cage robes with a hat overshadowing his eyes with his anbu flanking him. Cry out all you want you fools. You are merely delaying the inevitable. He said in a deep tone. A few hours later. The sound of metal clashing against metal, battle cries, and flames burning, echoed throughout Kurigakur no Sado, and apparently the rebel side was advancing due to them attacking the less guarded areas instead of the main gate. They also managed to cut off their backup supplies and some of the communication towers. Right now Naruto and Kasashi were taking down ranked Kirin in left and right. Said blonde ducked when a broadsword whizzed past his head, taking off a few strands, and delivered a chakra-enhanced punch to the man's gut and sent him flying into a concrete wall. That was when a chain ensnared his arm and saw five Kiri ascend towards him with their kunai and blades drawn ready to skewer him. Naruto closes his eyes for a few seconds and they snap open revealing his Sharingan. Chidori Nagashi, Thousand Bird Current. He said quietly, and a powerful electronic discharge erupts from every part of his body which electrocutes the Kirin in and makes them cry out in sheer agony due to having volts of electricity course through their body. They collapse onto the ground twitching in pain while the current continues to surge around the blonde. The Kashi just knocked out a Jonin rank nin with a chop to the back of the neck and turned his head sideways to see Naruto, and his eyes widened at what he saw, especially when he saw the Sharingan in the blonde eyes. The copy nin shook his head and turned his attention toward a small group of charging Kiri ninja heading right from him. I must be dreaming because I just saw Naruto have the Sharingan, but that's insane. The battle must be getting to me. He then pulls out his ninjato and sprints towards the other group. Naruto turned his head to see a group of bloodline users being quartered by a squad of Anbu who were performing hand seals, and several water dragons descended towards them. Naruto did a few hand seals and slammed his hands on the ground. Oten. Katotoride, Earth Release. Earth Fortress, he called out. Before the dragons had a chance to engulf the bloodline users, three large walls of earth rose up in front of them and protected them from the water much to the Anbu's shock. What did he do? The first Anbu asked while Naruto phased behind them by rising from the ground, like Madara did when he fought Fu and Torn. One Anbu snaps out of his stupor and swings his ninjato at Naruto's head, only for it to phase through, and the blonde smirks as he grabs them both, creates a vortex that sucks in four of the Anbu, and the rest charge at Naruto, and said blonde does the same. But pulls out a long chain that is connected to two bracelets that are attached to his wrists. 
The Anbu make an attempt to run their blades through him, but like last time, they along with the blades phased through the blonde, and afterwards, twisted his body in order to ensnare them in the chain. And sent surges of electricity through the chains which electrocute the Anbu who also collapsed on the ground twitching. Naruto removes the braces and smirks at the bloodline holders who nod back and Shunshin to join their comrades. He then leaps on top of a building, only to see a large blue two-tailed feline roaring, slamming her paw onto the ground and sending the Kirin in that were fighting the rebels flying. Well it looks like Kitty Cat has that section under control. He says and then performs a series of hand seals and places his hand on the ground. A puff of smoke appeared beside him and standing before him was none other than Hitomi. Well it's about time you summon me. She said while folding her arms under her bosoms while Naruto smirks. I hope you have a way of making this up to me. Naruto points to the battle going on, and a toothy grin forms on her face. That'll work. She said while rubbing her hands together. Try to keep the casualties to a minimum Hitomi-chan, since my family and friends are down there also. He instructed. She nodded back, gave him a mock salute, and vanished in a flash of red. That was when an explosion occurred at the Mizukage Tower which got the blonde's attention. Better go help out whoever caused that against the overgrown came, turtle. He thought and once again used Madara's Jikikin ninjutsu to warp away. But the others. Anko had just dropped in the back of his head and afterwards raised her fist back. Sinate to Jashu, many hidden shadow snake hands. She cried out and a swarm of big snakes shot out of the sleeve of her trench coat in an instant, constricting and biting any Anbunin that were in her path. After she called them back, she saw Shinjin slam two Kirinin into the concrete and then pull out his buster blade and swat three away like flies with the blunt end of his blade. Anko appeared beside him and deflected a volley of shuriken. You know since this battle started I haven't seen you actually use that blade. She stated while the man smirks under his mask. That's because use brings about wear, tear and rust, and this beauty's repairs are expensive. Besides, only those who are strong in my eyes are worthy enough to fall to my blade. He said, as he performed a series of hand seals. Tsukundan no jutsu, water release. Water shark missile technique. Water rose from a large water fountain and formed into a shark with a head nearly at the same height as a man, and it moves to attack a squad of enemy men at high speed. And hits them with a powerful impact that sends water everywhere. Nice. My turn. She said, and did a quick series of hand seals. Doton. Dehebidon, earth release. Earth snake bullet. The earth in front of her softened and the mud formed into a serpent made of mud that rose from the ground and hissed as it ascended towards a group of. Shinjin whistled as he had a headlock. Not bad. He said and snapped the jonin's neck, killing him instantly. Yugao and Kashina were synchronized in their swordplay and were simultaneously switching from offense to defense whenever they faced a Kirinin. Shinku was evading some kunai swipes from two chunin who had their broadswords out and then she leaned backwards as their broadsword swung over her head. They attempted to make another attempt only for Kagura to appear and block them with two single-edge ivory katanas, surprising them. Amoy appeared above them and brought his eight katanas out in a reversed position. Kumorik. Mikazuki Kiri, cloud style. Crescent moon beheading. Amoy swings his blade in a clockwise arc and strikes them in the back, which causes them to cry out in pain and fall to the ground. Amoy stops the technique and then reverses the blade sides when he senses three nin behind them. Kumorik. Yurijiri, cloud style reverse beheading. He does a reversal swinging arc and slits their throats instantly. Not a bad kid. Those were some sweet moves. Kagura said with a smirk on her face while Amoy shrugs. Thanks, but it's no big deal really. He started while Kagaya chuckled. Skilled and humble, you're alright in my book. She said while Shinku got up and vanished in a blur, striking down several ninja using the Shukichiki, Sajiro said his technique with her katana and reappearing with it drawn out, but sheathed it once again. I hope Nai-san is doing okay. She says to herself and goes to help Rin who was treating the injured while a group of Cloud Anbu were protecting the injured. Izukage Tower. Mei was the first to leap out of the smoke and land on the rooftop skidding backwards with Kenham drawn. Inishi was the next one to land next to her but with the left sleeve of his jacket torn off. The snow-haired swordsman growled in frustration and ripped the jacket off, wearing a sleeveless black muscle shirt underneath it. Inishi, are you okay? Mei asked her childhood friend who nodded. Yeah I'm good. Damn team tried to blow my arm off. He said with a scowl on his face. That was when Yagura and his cage robes appeared with a blank expression on his face. Don't assume that just because you planned a surprise attack on me doesn't mean you'll win or have you forgotten about our encounter a while back mate to Rumi. The man asked which made the girl scowl. Yagura, do you realize what your actions have done to our village? Our country? How many lives were destroyed? Why are you doing this? 
What happened to make you change and become a tyrant? She asked the Jinchuriki who remained unemotional. What I have done is purge your land of these accursed bloodlines, and I intend to carry on my ideals in purging this world of the very thing that starts wars and causes destruction, and anyone who disagrees with my ideals are traitors and deserve to die. He replied which made the two clench their fists in anger. Is that so? Said a voice behind Mei and Inishi, and the two turned their heads and saw Naruto walking towards them, with the difference being that he had the Sharingan activated and had what appeared to be a guardless katana that had a black hilt with white diamond patterns on it drawn. Inishi's and Mei's eyes widened when they saw this. Sharingan? Inishi asks himself. Igura on the other hand narrows his eyes. Great, another ninja has violated the soil of my country with his vile blood. He said darkly while Naruto kept his expression calm and sharp. This coming from a cage who's the vessel for an overgrown turtle. He said, which made the man's eyes widen a little. I believe you contain the Sanbi no Kaidai game, three-tailed giant turtle, correct? How did you know? Unless you're a vessel too. Yugura asked, and his answer was Naruto with a smile on his face. You can say that, but sadly I don't have the time to explain it to you. After all, there is no match for Tim. He replied which made the other's eyes widened, especially Mei because she believed that he was the vessel for the Kaiubi no Yoko, and wondered why he said ten tails, because she thought that there were only nine. Don't patronize me fool. There is no ten-tailed biju. The Mizukid said, and then threw off his hat and robes. Yugura has unkempt grey hair, pink eyes, and what seems to be a stitch-like scar running from under his left eye all the way down his cheek. He has a dull expression and wears a grey undershirt with short mesh sleeves, which has a metal plate of a Karigakur forehead protector sewn onto it. He also wears a long green scarf around his neck, a turquoise sash around his waist, paired with a green ingimenta that hangs on his legs, and black pants. He's one of the few ninjas to not wear sandals, instead relying on a pair of brown boots open on the back. On his back he carries a staff-like pole weapon with uneven hooks with a green flower on the end of the larger hook. Naruto on the other hand chuckles and releases a burst of Kai that surprises Yugura who felt the murderous intent and for some reason, he saw what looked like the image of a beast with ten tails and had an eye with nine times around four concentric rings. Dark blue chakra slowly forms around Naruto and flows off of him like fire and the tiles underneath him cracked and started to spread out. Anishi and Mei were amazed when they felt the chakra emitting from Naruto's body. Incredible. The chakra emitting from his body is so powerful and this isn't even the Biju's chakra. It's all him. The white tiger of the mist thought. Don't think so highly of yourself boy. You are strong, but you are no match for a cage. He stated. Mei San Anishi San. Naruto said quietly, getting their attention. Yugura is being controlled by a powerful person. He said, which made their eyes widen. Are you sure? Mei asked, and Naruto nodded. Yes. My eyes can see it, and whoever is doing it can use it even when he's not in the area. To pull a stunt like that requires someone who is beyond the level of a cage. He answered. So what should we do? Inishi asked. Our only option is to weaken him enough to sever the connection between him and him, and then break them. Naruto finishes while Inishi scoffs and draws his Watatachi, the blade Inishi used in Rurouni Kenshin, Hoeda Tora, White Tiger. Easier said than done kid. Yugura has full control over his and its power. He stated while Naruto grinned. And so do I. In a sense because I am in a way the new Juubi. He said and thought to himself. Yugura pulls his staff off his back, twirls it a few times, and goes into a bajutsu stance. Naruto twirls his blade a few times and places it in a reversal grip while Inishi goes into a stance and Mei twists the hilt of her blade, making it ignite into a flaming blade. Listen, should he morph into his chakra cloak or biju form, I want you to let me handle it. He said getting side glances from them. Are you sure? Inishi asked the blonde who nodded. Well his sharingan started to spin rapidly. Okay then just be careful. Yugura is highly skilled in using water, and I'm talking about nidame level. He answered. That was when Naruto pulled a kunai out and chucked it at high speed. Kunai cage bushin no jutsu, shadow kunai clone technique. Naruto said, as he performed a series of hand seals. There were now around over a hundred kunai ascending towards Yugura, who started to twirl his hook staff around clockwise in front of himself and deflect the kunais. Inishi took this opportunity to sprint around Yugura and, when he got close enough, aimed for his side and swung his blade. Yugura manages to deflect all the blades and then blacks an upward slash delivered by Inishi who smirks. Poor form of defense Mizukage. He taunted. Shujeki Kusei, kicking sword rush. Inishi kicks the back edge of his blade to increase the speed and force of the strike when he swings his watt upward. The force from the kick was so powerful that it forced Yugura's staff back and in the air, leaving him open for an attack. 
Mei appears with her blade blazing and swings it at his torso. Hamuradama, burning soul. She cried out and swung at him diagonally, leaving a blazing trail of fire, while the hit slashed a Shakti Gura across the chest and torso only to burst into water. Shit a Mizubunshin. She cursed and then had to duck to avoid being impaled by the small hook on the end of the cage's staff and leapt away. Inishi leaps into the air with his blade in a reversal position and seems to be channeling wind chakra into the blade. Shirai too, white sickle. He swings his blade twice, releasing two white crescent blades made of wind. Yagura leaps away and senses Naruto behind him and blocks a downward slash with his staff and the blonde smirks. Hidori Nagashi, Thousand Bird Current. Electricity erupts from the blonde's body and zaps Yagura who grunts in pain and is slightly paralyzed from the attack. Inishi took this opportunity to strike the man in the chest with a powerful palm strike that makes Yagura cough up saliva and Mei appears and kicks him in the chin, sending him flying high into the air. Naruto appears behind him while in the air. Cage bio, leaf shadow dance. He said quietly while Yagura's eyes widened as black bandages instantly wrapped around his body and ensnared him in a cocoon-like state. Naruto grabs the man and starts to slowly rotate until they start to spin rapidly at incredible speed and descend towards the ground. Amit Renj, initial lotus. The blonde called out and the pile drove the Mizukage into the rooftop head first, making the place shake slightly and causing dust to rise up into the air. Naruto leaps out of the dust and in between the two leaders of the rebel faction and frowns. Stay on your toes because this is far from over. Naruto said as the dust cleared and revealed the broken body of Yagura and it melted into water. They heard a boot slam on a roof tile and turned their heads to see Yagura glaring at them. I have to say you three are impressive, especially you boys, but even though you outnumber me you don't outmatch me. He said as he performed a series of hand seals. Sushma, water release. Water shockwave. The guru creates a spiraling vortex of water from the moisture in the air, and the vortex then proceeds to explode from the top in the form of a wave that descends to the three. Naruto does a small series of hand seals and slams his palms onto the wall. Doton. Doryu Heki. A large wide wall of earth appeared in front of the trio and stopped the impact of the wave which shook the tower and the remaining water dripped down the roof. Inishi took this opportunity to scale the wall until he reached the top while Mayor ran around the earth wall, doing a series of hand seals. Yoten. Yagan Nami. Her cheeks bulged and she spat out torrents of hot magma that covered up the entire roof and kept Yugura in his place, but Mizukid scoffs and fires a torrent of water from his mouth which hits the magma and cools it off as steam rises into the air. You little lave trick won't save you Mei Teru. He didn't get to finish due to the fact that he hissed out in pain when he saw the skin on his arm peel away as the steam hit his skin. Have you forgotten about my second keke you fool? Mei taunted as she did a horse seal and sucked air into her mouth. Futen. Kamu no Jutsu, oil release. Skilled mist technique. Released a corrosive acid-like mist from her mouth which ascends and engulfs Yugura. Did she get him? Inishi asked himself and his answer was a bluish-gray ethereal chakra hand launching itself at the earth wall and strikes it, demolishing said wall which caused Inishi to fall of the crumbling wall and descend towards the jagged rocks or would have. That is falling body not have been stopped by a human-sized cushion of sand. What the? He asked himself. Another one shot out of the mist and ascended towards a shocked Mei, who had little time to escape it until a wall of what appeared to be sand rose in front of her and it deflected the chakra hand. Mei blinks in shock when she sees this. Sand. But how? Mei asked herself and saw Anishi ascend towards the ground on a sand cushion that landed him down safely. Said sand dissipated and they watched as it ascended towards Naruto who had a large gourd that swallowed up the sand. Stay focused. That acid mist Mei sand conjured up only pissed him off. Naruto said while a tick mark appeared on Inishi's head. No really? Inishi asked as a vein throbbed on his head. Inishi calmed down. Mei replied while the man snorted but tilted his round shades up. The gourd Naruto had was sealed up in one of the small scrolls he had and the Yagura walked out of the mist with a dangerous look in his eye. I guess playtime's over huh? Good. Naruto unsheathes his blade and has it in a reverse grip. Cause I'm about to show you what this kid can do. He charges at Yugura who gets into a bajutsu stance and says the blonde vanishes and appears behind Yugura, swinging his blade diagonally at the man's back. Yugura spins his body and his staff clashes against Naruto's katana and the two are in a power struggle. Naruto smirks while Yugura's eyes widen when a cage bunshin appears behind him, ready to run him through with its katana, but he presses a switch and the hook on the end of his staff fires and strikes the clone, making it dispel. Naruto took this opportunity to grab his shoulder, plant his foot on the staff and use it as a spring and struck Yugura in the chin with his knee. Said blonde twists his body around lands back on the ground. 
Yagura spins his body around and swings the end that had the hook connected to a chain, and it wraps around Naruto's arm. Said blonde channels the Chidori through his blade and cuts it down. Yagura scowls when this happens while Inishi appears over him with his blade raised in the air. Shimatmse, destructive palm sword rush. Inishi uses his palm to push the Wado and performs a downward strike, which Yagura manages to block, but the speed and force from the attack causes a crater to form underneath the May on the other hand took this opportunity to slide under the man and break his balance with a slight kick, making the man stumble over, while Inishi performs a roundhouse kick and strikes Yugura in the jaw with the heel of his boot and sent the man flying, and Yugura crashes to the ground. He shakes the cobwebs out of his head, only to hear the sound of birds chirping, and he looks up to see Naruto descending towards him with his left arm reared back and covered in white electricity. Chidori, Thousand Birds. He called out and swung his arm at Yugura's chest, but the cage vanishes while Naruto slams his lightning-covered hand into the spot that the man was currently at and curses when he appears again with his staff raised and ready to drive the large hook into his skull only for Inishi to appear. Then stopped the hook with the sharp edge of his blade but used one hand and had his right hand reared back into a palm strike. He swings it forward and strikes the man in the torso, making Yugura grit his teeth in pain. I'm not done yet. Futon. Case Shushu, wind release. Wind palm. Yugura is sent flying backwards and is sent flying off the roof and into a building, causing an explosion to occur. Naruto manages to free his arm and stands back up. Thanks. He said getting a smirk from th white haired man. Don't mention it. So how is it that you have the Sharingan and were able to manipulate sand like that? Last I heard, the Achiha clan was nearly wiped out by one that went rogue. He asked. That will be explained in due time, but for now. Naruto closed his eyes, and his eyes morphed into the eternal Manjiku Sharingan. We have an extremely pissed off cage to deal with. He said while well, an explosion erupted from the building Yugura crashed into, and standing in the rubble was Yugura in a three-tailed clock form, similar to Naruto four-tailed states. And was snarling at the trio for a few seconds. But then released a bestial roar that echoed throughout the village. Yugura then opened his mouth and gathered both positive black chakra no chakura and negative white chakra, Minasu no shiro chakura, shaped it into a sphere, swallowed it, and then compressed it inside his mouth. Naruto's eyes widened when he saw this. Shit. Inishi. Mei. Grab my arms. Naruto screamed which surprised them. But why? Inishi asked only for Naruto to grab his and Mei's arm as Yugura fired the menacing ball at the three that ascended towards them at high speeds. A large explosion rocks the village, and mushroom-shaped smoke appears in the sky. When it cleared the tower was reduced to rubble, and the three could be seen nowhere in sight. The trio crashed into the ground away from Yugura, and the blonde let out a sigh of relief. That was too close. He said to himself while the two got up, and the blonde stood up. That was a jikikin ninjutsu he used. Does he know how to use his father's technique? But I didn't see him throw a kunai or use a formula. Inishi thought. Looks like I've got no other choice. He said, and looked at Mei and Inishi. I have to take on Yugura personally. He started and looked at them. Are you capable of using your Bijuu's power to its fullest, Naruto? Mei asked and got a nod from the blonde. The Mi sensei Kurabi took me to a temple where I could learn how to use my Bijuu's chakra and powers at its fullest, but I can't use it fully if you're around cause I don't want you to get caught in the crossfire. He said, as the two looked conflicted, but hesitantly nodded. Pine will keep our distance, but be careful Naruto-kun. Mei said, getting a smile from the blonde. I will. I'm gonna lead him away from the village and near the shores, since no civilians will be around the area. He said, and warped away again. Said blonde once again appears at the wreck site with Yugura, who was in his beast form looking around for them and growling slowly. Hey Yugura. Naruto called out getting the man's attention and saw the blonde flipped him off while giving him a raspberry. I've seen academy students with better aim. Are you positive you're a cage? He taunted out and knew that since the Sanbi was more animal-like and lacked intelligence, he knew the man would get irritated in an instant. Said Vessel snarls out in anger and lunges at the blonde who warped away while said crashed to the ground, leaving a large crater. Naruto appeared standing on a destroyed rooftop crouching down. Wow now that was scary. I thought you said you had control over the shell head's power Yagwa-chan. He drawled out and leapt away when an extended chakra tendril tried to grab him. Yugura leapt out of the crater and saw the blonde running towards the outskirts of the village, with Yugura going after him. That's the right shell for brains to follow the leader. Naruto thought as he increased the pace. Open field. Naruto landed on an open field that was surrounded by a few mountains and was near the shoreline waiting for Yugura to arrive, and then he smirks when the man in his form landed in the clearing, loudly making the ground shake. Foolish boy. Did you honestly think you could get away from me? 
The guru snarled out while Naruto's smirk turned into a feral grin. Where did you get the idea that I was running from your team? Now that we're away from the battleground I can deal with you and not have to hold back. He said, as his canines turned into fangs, and while a yellow golden chakra cloak with ten tails surrounded his body, and the pupil in his EMS turned into a slit, and his skin started to slowly peel off. The guru's wide eyes widened in disbelief, as he saw this. Surprised. I told you that I wasn't kidding when I said I possessed a ten-tailed beast in my body, and now you're gonna see firsthand what I'm capable of. He said, as an animalistic snarl escaped from his lips while his eyes glowed red while a yellow dome formed around his body. Said blonde dropped on all fours while his fingernails and toenails extended and formed into claws. He then bowed his head for a few seconds and let out a bestial roar which caused a powerful shockwave to be released and the dome shot up and formed into a pillar of yellow light. Back in Kiri. Ujido released a tailed beast sonic roar that sent a squad of Jonin flying into some rubble and was about to move forward but then stopped and looked up to see a pillar of yellow light. Samui has cut down and saw Ujido looking at the pillar of light. Ujido what is it? She asked. That's Naruto-kun. Whoever he's fighting is making him use his powers, but the odd thing is it isn't Kai Ubi's from what Nico's telling me and says that it's something more powerful than the fox. She stated which made her eyes widened. She's right, you know. Said another feminine voice. They turned their heads to see a red head with red slit eyes. Hitomi looked up at Yujito's form and grinned. Hey kitty cat, how's life treating you? Nekamata's eyes widened and Nibi switched with Yujito for a second. Hitomi. How did you get out of your vessel? She asked which came close to shouting while the vixen just chuckled. Oh that is a story. She stated while Samui's eyes bugged out. Kashina was helping an injured Koga to one of the infirmaries, but then she paused and looked at a pillar of chakra. Sachi I hope you're not doing anything reckless. She said to herself. Back with Naruto and Yugura. As the light pillar ended, Naruto was in the version 2 form, Karabi's and Naruto's form, with a mixture of solid yellow and black chakra covering his body. His appearance was in the form of a humanoid wolf with ten tails flailing behind it. That black surrounded his face and his eyes glowed red and it snarled lowly at a shocked and stunned Yugura. Naruto took a step forward and his footsteps sounded like thunderclaps and flexed his clawed hands. He suddenly vanished in a flash of yellow and the next thing Yugura knew a hand wrapped around his face and was slammed into the ground, creating a large and wide crater. Naruto let out a roar and flung Yugura into the side of a mountain and a portion of it collapsed on top of him. That was when a fast and powerful stream of water shot towards Naruto. Said Blonde snarled and stopped the attack with just one hand and it only made him skid back a few inches. When it stopped, ethereal chakra arms shot out and grabbed Naruto's arms and the young Namekas growled and used two of his tails to sever them and make the stumps retract and flung them off and fired a series of menacing balls at Yugura's current location. Which resulted in multiple explosions occurring. Nagura managed to leap out of the explosion only for Naruto to appear with his fist cocked back. He let out a primal roar and slugged the miniature Sanbi in the face full force and sent him descending towards the ground at high speed which resulted in the ground exploding. And Yugura went skidding through the forest, across the sand, and finally entering the ocean shores and crashing in the water, creating a powerful tidal wave. Naruto landed back onto the ground and let out a victory roar. Before he glowed and morphed back into his normal state, panting a little. I guess my current body isn't capable of handling that much of the Jubi's power yet. He said to himself as he saw an enormous crater connected to a deep ditch-like trail that left a path of destruction through the forest. Yes I went a little overboard. Oh well. He said and once again warped away and appeared on a rock near the ocean shores. Come out, come out wherever you are. He said quietly and he saw bubbles near the open ocean and then he grinned. Looks like a shell for brains isn't done yet. The blonde thought as the bubbles grew and grew until the water started to slowly rise and Start reveal the, the true form of the Naruto sand. stood quietly on a rock as he stared at the Sambi no Kaidai game, three-tailed giant turtle, while water dripped down the beast's body. The three tails primarily resembles a turtle, but with a crab-like shell and three shrimp-like tails. It has a pair of human arms and hands, but no hind legs. Its right eye is constantly closed, indicating some sort of injury, and because of this, it is particularly vulnerable to attacks directed at its right eye. I can't say that this form is an improvement, since you look like something Yujito-chan threw up from eating bad shellfish. The blonde taunted and snarled angrily at being insulted. You puny insects. Even now that I reveal my true form to you, you still mock me. I'll make sure that you suffer for this and will be the prime example that those who go against me will die. The guru growled out and unleashed a roar so powerful that the shockwave split the water and sent sand flying in different directions. 
Naruto's hair swayed back from the roar, but remained on the rock he was standing on until it died down. Phew dude you need to lay off the fish. There's a new invention that was made, and I believe it is called a mint. Naruto replied, and for emphasis waved his hand in front of his face in a disgusted manner. Yugura growled and raised his large hand into the air and over Naruto's form and brought it down fast and hard and when it landed, it caused the earth to shake violently. Yugura raised his enlarged hand in order to see the smear that he made, but only saw his imprint. The Sanbi growled and looked around for its prey. Naruto was sitting on the beast's head with his right hand covered in lightning chakra and it was light blue. Rain. Chikito Ikazuchi, lightning releases. Raging thunder. Powerful vaults of electricity shot around Yugura's Sanbi body, causing them to howl out in agony, as countless volts of electricity hit every single part of its body simultaneously. After the technique ended, Naruto leapt off the beast's head and landed in front of the beast who snarls and sweeps at Naruto who simply phases through the arm, and then the water hybrid attempts to backhand him, only for Naruto to simply stop the beast's arm with one hand. Such a mindless beast you are Yugura-chan. Naruto chastises and grabs a hold of one of its large fingers and slowly lifts it out of the water. Someone should teach you some manners. He then tosses him over his shoulder and slams him into the sandy rocky shores, sending waves of sand and pieces of rocks everywhere. Let's take this fight somewhere less wet. Naruto suggested as she activated his eternal Manjiku Sharingan. Kamui, Might of the Gods. The area around them ripples and Yugura is sucked into a void instantly and the ripples end. Naruto warps away afterwards. A few seconds later a ripple appears around some village ruins that were caused by the civil war, and a vortex appears. Coming down from it was none other than Yugura and Sambi form, and came crashing down into the village hard. Naruto appeared on top of a destroyed building with his eternal Manjiku Sharingan. There this will do. He's out of his element, and there are no people around. The Sambi gets back on its feet and snarls as it looks around for Naruto. Said lets out a loud whistle. Yugura turns his head to see Naruto grinning and flipping him off, and the transformed Mizukage growls and picks up a large boulder. Naruto ends his charade and starts to get serious. His chakra flares and morphs into a yellow layer of what appeared to be cloaked armor with lightning static coursing around it. I gotta remind myself to thank E-sensei for teaching me this technique. He said to himself, as the Raiden no Yoroi, lightning release armor, flared up causing his hair to spike up, as well, similar to how E spiked up when he fought Sasuke. The Sanbi roars and chucks the boulder at Naruto. Said Blonde reared his fist back and let out a battle cry as he swung his fist forward and smashed the boulder to pieces. The Sanbi then grabbed a large building and chucked it at Naruto who vanished while the building smashed the location Naruto was at and appeared over Yugura's form with his right leg raised. Jirichin Darapu, guillotine drop. Naruto cries out and performs a downward kick on his opponent. The heel of his foot slams down onto the water hybrid skull and sends him crashing into the ground, creating a 20-foot wide crater that causes dust and debris to fly in different directions. Naruto lands in front of the down with his armor still active until a large gray hand shoots out and attempts to grab Naruto, but the blonde cuts off three of its fingers, causing the beast to howl in pain. And he leaps into the air. Pain. Kiryu Enden, fire release. Dragon flame missile. He unleashes a stream of white hot fire that hits the Sanbi hard, making the beast roar in anger, as his skin was scorched by the hot flames. After it ended Naruto landed behind one of the tails and dodged the one that tried to squash him, and then the other attempted to, but he leapt into the air doing an aerial somersault and then slammed his chakra-enhanced fist into the beast's shell, causing it to crack. Igura was getting frustrated and unleashed a roar so powerful that it sent a shock wave around the entire area and destroyed everything around it. Naruto was sent flying off its back and crashing through three wrecked buildings, but he flips backwards and lands back on his feet, skidding backwards and shaking the cobwebs out of his head. Okay now he's pissed. He stated and leapt on top of a destroyed rooftop and saw Yugura's form with its head raised and was gathering positive black chakra no chakura and negative white chakra, Minasu no shiro chakura, shape it into a sphere and then compress it inside its mouth. Naruto's eyes widened when he saw the compressed chakra get bigger and bigger. Is he nuts? That Amari, menacing ball, has enough power behind it to level a quarter of water country. He said, as the ball became larger. But the rebel faction. The Gura Kugaya had just run Kiri Anbu through with her bone blade and kicked him off the building and sensed something powerful. She turned her head and her eyes widened in disbelief when she saw a large sphere made of energy. Oh Kami no he went. She said in horror while Benke landed beside her. The Gura we managed to gain control of the eastern sector of. He saw the horrified look on her face and wondered what she was looking at until his expression became similar to her. No, that attack it's. 
Mei, Inishi, and the others also saw the menacing ball and couldn't believe what Yagura was about to do. No, Yagura doesn't do it. Mei begged. Yujito too was shocked by the size of the ball. That menacing ball is too unstable if he completes it, half of water country will become a charred barren wasteland. The vessel for Nibi stated while the other ninja, both rebel and enemy, each had horrified looks on their faces. No the Mizukage wouldn't, one Kiri Jonin stated. Hitomi cursed and sped off, heading to where Naruto and Yugura were, as did the other leaders and Naruto's family. The ground around Yugura's beast form started to tremble, and debris started to slowly rise from the power emitting from the ball of compressed energy. Naruto's train of thought was running a mile a minute. Damn it, how do I stop that? If I hit him and he drops that attack this place will become a giant crater, but if his fires it, half of water country will be destroyed and there's no way I'm using the Kuchius. Yatai Kuzushi no Jutsu, summoning. Food cart destroyer technique. Come on, Naruto, think damn it. He said to himself until the idea flashed in his head. Got it. He then pulls out a tri-pronged kunai that had a black seal tag with white seal formulas on it. I just hope I got this down all the way. He prayed. The leaders, as well as their allies made it to the ruins, and they saw Sanbi roar, as the energy ball was now twice as big as it was. Hey, is that Naruto? Anko asked, as she saw the blonde. Kishina's eyes widened in fear, as she saw her son not moving away from the attack. What is he doing? Aniki got out of there. Shinku said to herself. Dynamic is. Sanbi Amari, three-tailed menacing ball. Yugura roared and fired the chakra blast. Everyone hit the ground. Mei screamed, and they each got down. The menacing ball made its way towards Naruto making debris scattered due to its speed and velocity. Not gonna happen. Naruto said, as he went through a series of fast-paced hand seals with a tri-pronged kunai in his hand. As it got closer and was about to hit the blonde, it appeared to get absorbed into what appeared to be a barrier with kanji seals stretching outwards and sucking the attack in. What? Impossible. That was my strongest attack. Yugura roared in disbelief and anger as his menacing ball was now completely gone and saw that Naruto held a Horatian kunai in both hands. Mei was the first to look up and saw nothing happened aside from the large trenches in the ground and saw Naruto was completely unharmed. The other ninja looked up and their eyes bugged when they saw nothing. What the? How did he do it? Inishi asked only to hear an explosion occur and they looked back to see a light blue dome form on top of the ocean and saw large waves crashing into the rocky cliffs and the ground trembling. How did he do that? Yugao wondered while Kakashi remained silent. That was a Jikikin Kekai Ninjutsu, space-time barrier technique, and it was similar to Minato Sensei's. When did Naruto learn how to do Jikikin Jutsu? And that time I saw his eyes change. He thought as he narrowed his eyes, and then they widened in disbelief at what he saw. Both of Naruto's eyes were similar to the Manjikyu Sharingan. So he did have the Sharingan and the Manjikyu form no less. How did he gain them? Igura's bestial form let out a roar of frustration and lunged at Naruto who remained in his position and calm. What's he doing? He'll get crushed. Kagura stated. Naruto got out of there. Kari cried as the Sanbi cocked its fist back and roared while swinging it forward only for a golden ethereal skeletal hand to stop the fist. What the? Yugura said in disbelief. This has gone on for too long. Naruto said in a calm yet cold tone. A flaming chakra with a red outline flared around his body and grew until a skeletal figure manifested around Naruto. I never thought I'd have to use this against a beast like you, especially since this is my first time using it. The skeletal figure's eyes glowed red and muscle and tissue fabricated and coiled around the figure. Giving it a humanoid form until armor that represented the one samurai wore in the feudal era formed around the body until the armored helmet took on the form of a fox head with jagged teeth that appeared to be snarling. Strapped to its ash was a katana. The armored hand suddenly swatted the hand away and struck the straight in the face and sent the beast crashing through several buildings. Unfortunately I don't have time to play around so I'm gonna end this quickly or else this entire country will be reduced to a barren wasteland. Yugura says hello to Susanoo, god of the raging storm. The ethereal spirit reaches for its katana and draws the sword and it ignites onto an ethereal flaming blade. Yugura shoots out of the rubble roaring in pure rage and charges blindly at Naruto. Just like a mindless beast to charge into a fight blindly. Naruto stated while an ethereal shield formed around Susanoo's left arm. The Sanbi crashed right into the shield which barely blew Susanoo back and they got into a battle of strength. Susano uses the shield to knock Sanbi away and swings the blade downwards, penetrating the shell and cutting through skin. What is that blade and how can it hurt me in my biju state? Yugura wailed out as he backed off and swiped at the ethereal spirit that blocked the attack with the shield and then hacked off the beast's arm. 
another agonizing wail escaped from its lips and attempted to regrow the arm only for Naruto to hack off a piece of its shell and perform a series of slashes across its body. Yugura staggered around trying to stand firm with its one arm. He tried to regrow the arm, but nothing happened. WH what in the? I can't recover my arm. What did you do to me, you damn brat? He roared out only for the ethereal blade to be plunged into its skull and freeze up. It's done. Naruto said calmly while the ethereal spirit started to pull the blade backwards and started to slowly absorb the sambi. WH what are you doing? Yugura asked as it struggled to get away only for it to get sucked in a lot faster. I'm draining you of your beast chakra. Naruto said as more of Yugura's beast form started to get sucked in. No. Stop this at once. Stop. He cried out as more of it got sucked into the blade until Yugura could be seen on one knee. After sucking away the beast chakra, Susanoo sheathed its blade. This war is over Yugura and your reign is history. Naruto said as he took a step forwards only for his eyes to widen as he felt an untold amount of pain rack his entire body. He suddenly gripped his shirt and he vomited out a glob full of blood. Everyone's eyes widened when they saw this and Hitomi cursed under her breath. Damn it. I warned him that it was too soon to use that technique even if he is the new Juubi. She said to herself. What's going on? He was fine not too long ago and now he's on the ground coughing up blood. Mei started and looked at Kishina who was shocked beyond belief. Kishina, did Naruto gain any type of disease by any chance? She asked the Redeed who shook her head. No, he and Shinku have been healthy since the day they were born and haven't gotten any form of disease at all. She answered. Naruto collapsed on one knee and started to cough up blood for a few seconds while Susanoo receded into its skeletal form. He looked at the ground and saw his vision was getting blurry. Damn it. I should have taken Hitomi Chan's advice and not use Susanoo until my body could adjust to my powers. He slowly got back on his feet, attempting to brush off the pain while Susanoo got back into its humanoid form. The guru got back on his feet with bloody murder in his eyes. Damn you boy. Do you realize what you've done? You ruined everything. He screamed and pulled out a series of kunai with tags connected to them and threw them. They made contact and exploded, but when the smoke cleared a shield was protecting Naruto, who was talking towards Ugura's shocked form until he snapped out of it and fired a series of large water bullets that hit the shield, but they were shrugged off. He staggered back and his knees became wobbly. Your chakra is almost gone, Ugura. Give up. Naruto said calmly as his body tensed up in pain, but he attempted to shake it off. Ugura snarled and pulled his hook staff. Never. He cried and leapt into the air with the staff raised over his head. He attempted to drive the blade into the shield only for it to be deflected and sent him crashing into the ground while he lost his weapon. Susanoo receded and the aura around Naruto faded and he deactivated his eyes. When Yugura got up again, a fingerless gloved hand wrapped around his throat and slammed him into a concrete wall. Naruto cocked his fist back and slammed it into Yugura's gut, making him cough out blood. Naruto then did a ram seal and activated his Sharingan, making Yugura's eyes widened as he gazed into them and saw the spin rapidly. Kai. Naruto called out, causing Yugura's eyes to snap out of their glazed form. The blonde then raised his hand back and purple flames engulfed the tips which hid the kanji for metal, wood, fire, earth, and wind. Bajo Fuin, five elemental seal. Naruto called out and slammed his fingertips around the cage's stomach, making him gasp out in pain and then slump over into unconsciousness. But Madara. The man was in an underground bay sitting cross-legged in the shadows until his Sharingan eyes snapped open. What is this? Someone has removed the Jinjutsu I placed on Yugura, but that's impossible. He then made an attempt to perform a ram seal only for a pair of Sharingan eyes to appear before him glowing, and he let out a gasp. No way there is someone out there who wields a Sharingan that matches mine in terms of power, but that can't be right. He said to himself and narrowed his eyes in the shadows. It matters not for whomever did this will pay dearly. Back with Naruto. Naruto dropped the man onto the ground until he coughed out more blood and fell to his knees, clutching onto the area where his heart is and started to cough violently. Naruto. Ashina cried out and about to leap off the cliff only to see another red blur appear beside the blonde kneeling down while he gritted his teeth in pain. Her and everyone's eyes widened when they saw nine fox tails and fox ears on her person and knelt down beside Naruto. Ashina snapped out of her stupor and headed towards their location, as did the others said blonde was coughing out blood violently while holding his chest in pain. I warned you not to use that technique so soon, Naruto. Your body is not yet ready to fully use it yet, even if you are the new Juubi. Luckily you don't have to worry about shortening your lifespan. She stated while he spat some blood out of his mouth and looked at her weakly. The next time I make a stupid mistake like this, beat some sense into me. 
he stated, and the last thing he saw before he met Darkness was his family heading towards them. Two weeks later. The first thing Naruto saw as he opened his eyes was the inside of a white tent. He let out a groan and slowly sat up shaking the drowsiness out of his head and blinked a few times, realizing he was in a recovery room. He looked down to see his shirt was gone, but he still had on his pants. Beside his bed was Hitomi in her kit form curled up. The blonde smiled and reached out and gently pats her on the top of her head. She stirs in her sleep and opens her eyes to see a smiling Naruto. Hey. Was all he said before she morphed into her hybrid form and pulled him into a hug while he let out a grunt but patted her on the back. It's about time you woke up. Your family and friends were getting worried sick. She stated while he brushed his hair back and placed his feet on the floor. How long was I out? Naruto asked Hitomi who sat down on a chair. Two weeks. The ones who were on Yugura's side surrendered after Susanoo absorbed Yugura's beast form and sealed off the rest of his chakra, with that dot I also explained to your mother and the others how I am free but still bonded to you. She explained. I've got a lot of explaining to do huh? He asked and got a nod from her. Oh well it was bound to happen sooner or later. Where's my gear? He asked Hitomi who pointed to a large scroll and duffel bag that was beside another chair. After he got dressed, he exited out of the tent, and before he knew it, he was tackled and glumped by two blurs, Akakari and Yujito Nai. Naruto grunted once again and patted them on the back. Hey ladies. He strained out while they released him, but then got a brain duster to the skull by Yujito. Ow. What was that for? He cried out, clutching his head and glaring at Yujito who glared back. For being a baka. You were out for two whole weeks and had us worried you were a jerk. She replied in an angry yet worried tone. Your mom and sister have been restless while you were out, so if I were you I'd get to them first. Naruto's eyes widened and looked ashamed for worrying about them like that. Sorry. That was my first time using that when I fought Igura and I wanted to end the fight as soon as possible. I didn't want to use my transformation because I'd only be causing needless damage and harm to anyone who got caught in the crossfire. He apologized while she huffs up and still glares at him. You may be a Baka, but at least you're a caring Baka. Carrie said with a smile on her face. Now go see your family before I kick your ass. Naruto smirks and gives her a salute and warps away. Kakashi was currently leaning against a tree reading his Icha Icha book and Naruto appeared. Kakashi looked up and saw Naruto. Good to see you awake Naruto. Kishina and Shinku are worried sick over you. He started and Naruto rubbed the back of his head. Yeah I know. Yujito informed me and I already got a brain duster to the head by Yugi-chan. He states while Kakashi chuckles, but afterwards, a serious expression forms on his face. Also Naruto I think you'll need to explain about how you possessed the Sharingan when you fought Igura and why Kaiubi is out of the seal roaming around. He replied, and a serious expression formed on Naruto's face as well. I will in due time Nai-san, but for now I just want to see my family. He replied. Kakashi's eyes smiled and nodded at Naruto. And so that you know Naruto, I'm proud of you. Kakashi said while Naruto smiled and nodded a thanks before walking towards one of the tents. As he opened the flaps, he saw Shinku sleeping in one of the hammocks peacefully and walked over to her and knelt down. He pushed a strand of hair aside and gave her a kiss on the forehead just like he did when they were younger. She stirred in her sleep and slowly opened her eyes to see her twin eyes smiling. She rubbed her eyes in order to get a better view of her brother and her eyes widened. Hey Nikki. She asked and Naruto nodded in return. Tears formed around her eyes and the next thing he knew she leapt off the hammock and tackled him, but he managed to keep his footing while she sobbed into his chest, muffling how happy she was to see him up and okay. Naruto smiled and returned the hug. Sorry I worried you like that Shinku-chan. Naruto apologized. Where's Kasan and the others? He asked as he released her while she wiped the tears from her eyes. That was when he was pulled into a bone-crushing hug by his sobbing mother, and both Anko and Rin joined in, crushing the life out of Naruto who was turning blue. Rin can't breathe. He stained out to the three sobbing women. Kakashi on the other hand was chuckling while Yuga sweat dropped and looked at her leader. Ano senpai shouldn't we help Naruto kun out before he dies from their hugs? She asked the son of the white fang who shook his head. No, that would be bad for me, Yuga-chan. Kishina, Anko, and Rin-chan are dangerous when angry. Can you imagine how they'll react if I tried to separate them from Naruto? He asked his former subordinate who pondered on this, but paled and shuddered. Good point. She replied. After that little scene, Naruto led them into a secluded sector of the forest. Hey, why did you lead us in the middle of nowhere? Anko asked, and that was when Hitomi appeared before them. Took you long enough Hitomi-chan. Were you trying to hunt for rabbits again? He asked in an annoyed tone which made her rub the back of her head and smile sheepishly. 
When the others saw Hitomi they got into a fighting stance ready for a fight. Whoa, everyone chills out. No need to make this place into a war zone. Naruto said getting in front of Hitomi. This is the thanks I get for helping out in the war. I'm hurt. She said with a pout on her face while her ears dropped. But Naruto-kun, how do you know she won't turn on us? Rin asked the blonde who sighs. Simple Ni-chan. 1. She can't and won't attack unless I say she can. 2. We are bonded by the seal so I can put her back in the seal if I want to, and 3. His eyes closed confusing them for a few seconds, and then here he opened them, revealing the eternal Manjikyu Sharingan, and causing everyone to gasp when they saw his eyes. I can use the power of my eyes to stop her from going berserk. Asachi your eyes w what happened to your eyes. Kishina asked Naruto whose expression went from serious to sorrowful. He then went through a few hand signs, and a purple dome surrounded them. There, that way now one can listen into what I'm about to explain or enter this barrier without getting scorched. He stated. What do you mean Aniki? Shinku asked Naruto. Trust me it's for everyone's safety, especially with all the powerful enemies that hate Konoha, as well as our family Amado. Naruto answered. Now I want each and every one of you to look directly into my eyes. He instructed, and they did. The next thing they knew, they were in a world where the sky was blood red, as was the moon that had a black outline around it. The ground was black and gray with white outlines, and when the others looked at themselves, they too were black with white outlines. What in the world? Anko asked while looking at her hands, and the others. Relaxing Anko-chan Naruto-kun just brought us into his realm. Hitomi stated while Naruto appears in a swirl of fire, but he was in the form he had in his timeline. He wore a pair of Anbu cargo pants with Anbu-styled sandals, a dark green jonin flak jacket, and a version of his father's cape that had the kanji for Rakudame Hokage, Six Fire Shadow, Nidane Kairoi Senkou Second Yellow Flash, and Kami no Sharingan, God of the Copy We Lies, on the back. He looked like an older version of his father, but the difference was the cerulean eyes had slit pupils, and canines jutted from his upper lip, which gave him a handsome yet feral appearance. The Kashis and Rin's eyes bug out when they see this version of Naruto, while Anko, Yugoa, and without realizing it, Kishina and Shinku were blushing. She's right. The one that I used is an illusion called Tsukiyomi. In this realm I control time, space, as well as the physical mass. I have absolute control over this realm. Naruto stated, and with a snap of his fingers, the world changes. The sky was midnight blue with shining stars and a glowing white moon, and they were now in an open field, and they were in their normal color. This is a secondary version of the Tsukiyomi I discovered while training how to use my eternal Manjiku Sharingan. Interesting, but it doesn't explain how you gained those eyes in the first place, Naruto. Was what you used against Yugura an effect of those eyes? Kakashi asked Naruto who nodded. Yes, that I used was called Susano, the strongest offensive and defensive force that belonged to the Uchiha clan. As for how I gained them, I am not from this timeline. He answered, making their eyes widen. Instead of explaining it, I'll show you. So for the next couple of hours Kishina, Shinku, Rin, Kakashi, Anko, Yugoa, and Hitomi watched the events that occurred in Naruto's life. How Minato and Kishina died sealing Hitomi into him, how the villagers wanted him killed and was treated like dirt since the day he could speak and walk while trying to gain their acknowledgement. They also saw his first mission to wave country, the exams, invasion planned by Rajimaru, retrieving Tsunade and Sasuke when he deserted the village, etc. Afterwards they saw him when he was 16 and returned back to Konoha after training with Jureya and his family's techniques and learning fighting the Akatsuki until they started the fourth shinobi war where the five elementals united to fight the organization with Naruto. As the Rakudame Hokage and leader of the allied forces and the battle where the ninja from each nation fought and died to their last breath. The last thing they saw was Naruto fighting Madara and Sasuke with him gaining the upper hand until the ancient Uchiha pulled a sneak attack. Afterwards, they all saw where they attempted to remove the last Biju from his body with a demonic-looking statue in order to resurrect the Jubi, only for Naruto to create a powerful seal that reversed the technique and absorbed the other eight Biju, as well as Madara and Sasuke. Gaining their knowledge, eyes, and powers, as well absorbing the Jubi's powers and soul, becoming the new Jubi in the process. After watching this they found themselves back in the real world and remained silent for a while. My Kami all of that actually happened to you. Anko asked and got a nod from Naruto. So Madara Chiha was the one responsible for everything that happened. Kishina said in a tone full of hatred and anger while clenching her fists. Yes he was pulling everything from the shadows and the reason why the world is in its current state. He believes it is his right to be the ruler of the world and a god amongst men. That cynical arrogant bastard actually thought he had the right to play with others lives but paid the ultimate price and now his power is my power. Naruto answered. 
So does that mean he's alive in this timeline? Rin asked Naruto, and Hitomi growled. Yes he is. Even in his weakened state that accursed used those damn eyes of his to make me go berserk and attack your village. He even managed to cast a Yande Mizukage in a powerful Jinjutsu and control his actions which resulted in the bloodline genocide to happen. That man is an evil incarnate and I swear the next time I meet him I'll make his death slow and extremely painful. The nine-tailed vixen snarled out. Naruto placed a comforting hand on her shoulder. All in due time Hitomi-chan. There are others aside from Madara that we have to worry about like Orochimaru and Danzo for example. He started getting grim expressions from the others. The Akatsuki won't be active for a while, which means the Snake and the Warhawk will be making attempts to destroy Konoha in their own way. They must be taken out of the picture as soon as possible, and then there's the other Jinchuriki that need to be warned. The blonde explained to them. Easier said than done. Anko said. Danzo can easily eliminate any traces that are connected to him or his organization, and Orochimaru hasn't been spotted for a long time. Naruto on the other hand smirks. Oh I already know where Orochimaru is hiding, and Danzo he'll be dealt with soon. That man has been a thorn in my family's side for too long, and I plan on ripping his vile heart out with my bare hands. Naruto said darkly. But what about the other Jinchuriki and Nikki? We already know Yujito and Karabi hold the Nibi and Hachibi and that Yugura is the holder of the Sanbi, but we don't know where the others are. Shiku asked Naruto who once again grinned. That is why having the knowledge of the eye-stealing team has its strong points. I already know who the vessel of the Achibi is since he is Aidzen's son Agakur and is the Yandane Kazakija's younger son. The vessel for the Rakubi is traveling around the neutral countries, the Nanabi is residing in Takigakur, and the vessels for the Yanbi and Gobi are in self-exile in Awagakur. He explained getting gobsmacked looks from them all. So what do you intend to do? Yugao asked Naruto who brushed his hair back. Hopefully I can get into contact with them before the Akatsuki can get their locations and capture them, and afterwards I need to deal with Orochimaru since he and his sound village won't be operational for about a year and at the very least destroy some of his bases. All in all, I have my hands full. He said and deactivated the barrier and stood up. But for now let's go enjoy the celebration with the rebels and ending this war. He said smiling while they all did the same. And this time I will make sure history doesn't repeat itself. Iguru was in a recovery room groaning from the slight exhaustion he was feeling. He slowly opened his eyes and saw the white ceiling and slowly sat up wearing a hospital robe and rubbing his head in slight pain and then looked around. What in the world? Where am I? He asked himself. So you're finally up Hayagura san He looked in the corner and stepping out of the shadows was Naruto. If I may ask, who are you? He asked a blonde Jubi who smiled back. I'm a friend as well as the one who freed you from what you were put in. Naruto stated. Yugura frowned and blinked in confusion. Ninjutsu? I don't remember. He paused for a moment and his eyes widened. Wait, I do remember seeing a pair of crimson red eyes with three Tomba-like markings surrounding the pupil, and after that nothing. Were they similar to these? Naruto asked as he activated his Sharingan and Yugura's eyes widened. Yes exactly like those eyes, but the man who wielded them wore an amber-like mask. The only thing I can remember is saying that my actions will bring his goals into fruition and everything after that is a blank. The vessel for the three tails replied. What has happened since then? Bigura asked Naruto who now had a grim expression on his face. Naruto started to explain to Yugura what has happened since he was placed under the and how he was forced to start the bloodline genocide war which took a lot of lives. After explaining everything that happened, Yugura was appalled and disgusted with himself. I can't believe all of this has happened to my village and my people. What have I done? He said quietly and placed a hand over his face. Bigura san, you were not the one to blame for the events that have happened. The man who controlled you is responsible for this. He did this to weaken your village, and wherever he is hiding he will be dealt with. Naruto said to the Mizukage who removed his hand from his face and let out an agonizing sigh. I may not have been responsible for this, but still the villagers and the shinobi who were under my rule won't accept me as their leader anymore. I have no other choice but to step down and pass my title on to another. One who can restore our village back into its prime, but the question is who? Igura wondered. I have a suggestion for who can become the next Mizukage. Naruto replied, and Yugura looked at the blonde. Why not have Meitarumi become the Gade Mizukage? She has the qualities to be a great leader, and she was the one who led the rebellion forces for so many years. That, and she possesses two powers that would make her a foe not to trifle with. Yugura looked at the wall for a moment and rubbed his chin in thought. Meitarumi? Yes I remember meeting her when we were kids. She was compassionate and friendly to others, but she also had a fiery temper and emitted an aura that screamed I'll kill you if you cross me. 
He replied, which made Naruto chuckle. Ain't that the truth since females especially those who are kanoichi can be more dangerous than even I should know, because I'm living with six of them. Naruto started with humor in his voice, while in parts of the reconstructed village Kashina, Hitomi, Shinku, Anko, Yugao, and Rinich sneezed. Anyhow would you like me to get her for you? Naruto asked the vessel for the Sanbi, and he nodded. Naruto warped out of the room, and a few minutes later, he appeared with a sheepish mei, and Naruto who was sporting a black eye which made Yugura blink in confusion. What happened? Was all he asked while Naruto's eye healed. She sucker punched me thinking I was one of her fans. Naruto muttered. Remember to not get on your bad side because I don't want to be on the receiving end of your right hook again. Mei blushed in embarrassment and rubbed her arm. I said I was sorry about Naruto-kun. She apologized. Sorry doesn't stop the throbbing. He said with a pout, and that was when she leaned over and kissed the side of his face. Does that help? She asked cheekily while his face heated up, and he responded by warping away, making her chuckle. Still the flirt I see. Yugura commented, and she shrugged. He is cute for his age, and in a few years he's gonna be a heartthrob for women everywhere. So what is it you wanted to talk to me about? She asked Yugura. Garigakur, Market District. Samui and Yujito had just assisted some of the construction workers in moving some debris in order to clear the streets and were now sitting down and hydrating themselves by drinking out of water bottles. We've made quite a mess ha Yujito. Samui asked her fellow blonde who nodded and wiped a bead of sweat off her head. I can't believe I had to use Nibi's chakra so much. I need to up my training some more when we get back to Kumo. She said to herself while Samui nodded in agreement. Naruto appeared behind them via time warp and then he draped his arm over their shoulders. Hey ladies. Naruto said with a grin on his face. The female blonde saw the new Jubi grinning at them and they smiled back. Hey Foxy, shouldn't you be helping with the reconstruction? Samui asked Naruto. I just helped clear the southern section of the market district not too long ago. What can't I check up on my tenches? He asked cheekily which made Samui blush a little and looked away while Yujita rolled her eyes but smiled. You're such a baka I swear. Always worried about others, but yourself. She stated, but grinned. And that's what I like about you. She said, and bumped her hips against his. I know. So Samui-chan has your back been suffering going through all this labor? Naruto asked, and she nodded. Care for a massage. His offer got him an instant nod from her, so he moved behind her and started to work on her shoulders. They know fair why does she get one? Yujito asked with a pout on her face and was inwardly fuming at her fellow blondes. Because Yugi-chan your shoulders and back can easily heal from any strain or aches, thanks to a certain cat sealed inside of you. Naruto answered back while Samui moaned in relief, as Naruto worked the kinks and aches out of her shoulders, and back Yujito huffed at that statement, while Nibi snickered at how her vessel was acting like a little kid. That, and if you haven't noticed her you know what's are a lot heavier than yours. He stated which made Samui's blush increase, while Yujito's brows twitched dangerously. Just what are you insinuating? She asked in a strained tone that promised pain beyond belief. Naruto blinked a couple of times in confusion. Me? Nothing, I'm just stating that her body hasn't fully adjusted to her developing yet. He answered, which made Yujito look stumped. So you weren't making fun of the size of my chest? She asked Naruto who raised a brow and blushed a little. No, why would I? Your chest is fine. He answered back. He stopped messaging Samui's shoulders and back, making her wonder why he stopped, but then a giggle escaped her lips due to the fact that Naruto was tickling her sides. And to be honest, it really doesn't matter to me what your cup size is I mean Carrie chan is an example of that, and if you tell her I said that then I'll tell Karabi that he needs to up your training via two. And if I recall the last time you guys barred you had to spend a whole month in the hospital. He threatened, which made her pale, and the pout with her arms crossed under her chest. He stops tickling Samui who turned her head and gave him a playful glare as he released her. Thanks. Naruto, I have a question for you. She asked. What? You're gonna ask me out? He asked humorously only to be slapped lightly on the shoulder. I'm serious, you baka. By any chance you're the last of your clan right? She asked Naruto who nodded. So that places you under the craw where you can have multiple wives right? Again the blonde wielder of the ultimate Sharingan pondered on this and again nodded. Yes, but I'm not just the last male Namikas. He stated which confused Samui. I'm actually the last of four other clans. This right there made her, and Yujito's eyes widened. You see, back then there existed a clan known as the Uzumaki. Like the Namikas as they were respected and feared for their skills in, and also possessed a bloodline that gave them a strong life force. They also had the ability to suppress a Bijuu's chakra like Hashirama could, but they used chakra chains. 
Not only that, but they were also distant relatives of the Senju clan, meaning that I'm also related to the Senju clan through my mother, who is the great-granddaughter of Mito Uzumaki and Hashirama Senju. He explained which made their eyes bug out thinking he was screwing with them, but by the serious look on his face they knew he wasn't kidding. Aikami then that means you're related to three of the four of Konoha. Yujito states, but then smirks. Man oh man those bakas from that village would without a doubt raise a huge stink over this if they found out about this. Naruto shrugs at her statement while Samui ponders something. You said there was a fourth clan that was related to Naruto-kun. What other clan aside from those three are you related to? She asked her fellow blonde. Naruto closed his eyes, and when he opened them back up, revealing the fully mature Sharingan. I was bound to reveal this sooner or later. These are the eyes that made the clan respected and feared. But how? How do you possess the Sharingan? A stumped Yujito asked Naruto who sighs and brushes his hair back. I'll explain that when we get back to Kumo, and so that you know these eyes weren't transplanted. I've had them since I was six, but kept them hidden for a good reason. He answered. Samui remained quiet for a while, but then smiled. Kerry was right. You are without a doubt one of the most surprising ninja in the world. Naruto deactivated his eyes and smiled. What can I say? Unpredictability is my forte. He stated until a swirl of fire appeared beside him, and when it died out, it revealed none other than Hitomi in her hybrid form. Speaking of which, Hitomi, where were you at? Naruto asked the vixen. Oh I was out patrolling the forest and I found something that might interest you. She said with a toothy grin on her face. Naruto on the other hand raised an eyebrow. Oh? And what would that be? He asked while she turned to the other two. Sorry, but I'm gonna borrow Naruto-kun from you for a while. Ja. They disappeared via flame shunshin, leaving a confused Yujito and Samui. They suddenly appeared in the middle of the forest, and Naruto was confused with why she brought him here. Okay is there any reason why we're in the middle of the forest? The ask Hitomi she walked over to a large tree, and she simply slammed her fist into the tree, making it shake, and falling from it was a man who seemed to be wearing a black cloak with red clouds on it. He has short green hair, yellow eyes, and that his body has two different colored halves. His left side is completely white, and the right side black. Unlike the white side, which shows a normal mouth, nose, and eye, the black side shows no visible orifices at all, and only shows the iris of the eye. The black half also has white dots along the edges of his body where the two halves meet, these are not flat markings, but rather protrude from his body, like little white bumps, and also have unusually rounded teeth. His fingernails are painted pink, and his toenails are blue. He also wears his Akatsuki ring on the right little finger. It was Zetsu, a spy for the Akatsuki, and from the looks of it, he was a torn and bloody mess and was being restrained by what looked like razor-sharp chains that were impaled into him and in different areas of his body. The groan escaped from his lips while Naruto's eyes widened for a few seconds and then narrowed. Where did you find him exactly? He asked in an edge tone and her grin grew even more. I found this little flytrap snooping around the outskirts of the construction. He tried to get away, but I ripped him out of the ground before he had the chance to escape, and well, I wanted to see if I could make him beg for mercy, as I used my claws on him. After doing that for a while I got bored and restrained him with some chains I created out of my metal elements and left him out to hang for a while. She explained while flexing her claws. She cupped his face in her hand and lightly shook it. If only you were here to hear him whimper like the dog he is and call out for Madara-sama. She spat the name out like it was vile and then slapped him hard. Wake the hell up you eggplant before I decide to turn you into a human salad. Zetsu looked up and saw a pissed off Itomi and was attempting to get out of the chains. Why hello Zetsu. Did you enjoy your little game of hide and seek with Natsumi? Naruto asked the plant man who turned his head to Naruto. Beyond aim? Zetsu asked in a strained voice only for Naruto to chuckle. Sorry, but that's my old man. So I'm guessing Madara sent you here to find out about his disconnection to Yagura, huh? This question caused Zetsu to remain shocked that this kid knew about a man who was said to be dead. Don't look so surprised. I know all about Madara and his little group of S-class ninja who want to collect the Biju. Now then I don't have any time to interrogate you right now, but trust me when I say that coward will regret what he has done to me, this country, and my family. Naruto said in a cold tone and activated his eternal Manjikyu Sharingan so that you all know it's a combination of Madara's and Sasuke's EMS. Now then I'll take your ring. Naruto grabbed the man's wrist while he channeled some lightning chakra into his hand and placed it over Zetsu's forearm. Afterwards, he did a slashing motion and severed Zetsu's right hand. The next thing the spy knew was that he was sucked into a swirling vortex and was gone. Naruto then sealed the arm away into a small scroll while he deactivated his eyes. That's one annoyance out of the way for now. 
He then turned to Hitomi who apparently had a hint of lust in her eyes and shivered slightly. Do you have any idea how hot you are when you're pissed? She said as she walked over to him and wrapped her arms around his neck. Naruto tilted her chin up and their eyes met. That is my vixen. You'll get the chance to get with me soon. He said and kissed her lightly on the lips. Fine, but know this Naruto-kun if anyone is gonna be the alpha female of your future family or bear your kids first it's gonna be me. She said and poked him on the chest with her index finger. So what about your mother and sister? You do realize that, as the new Jubi your DNA won't match theirs right. I mean if they actually want to be with you in terms as mates then it wouldn't be considered incest. You can still use the abilities of the four clans you're aligned with though. Naruto pondered on this and sighs. My life just keeps getting more and more complicated. I'm pretty sure I can convince Shinku to go with it, but Kishina on the other hand will be a little difficult since the only person she's ever been with is Tusan. He stated while Hitomi shrugged. Oh I think she'll change her mind, especially how she saw what you look like when you were 18 years old in your timeline. She said with a grin on her face. Naruto on the other hand snorted. I don't think she would be that simple-minded Hitomi. He said while she blinked and tilted her head sideways. It has nothing to do with being a simple-minded Naruto-kun. Believe it or not females, both human, goddess, and even demon, are attracted to males with strength. You're an alpha above alphas, and being of such status will mean they'll gain strong airs in order for the clan to grow once more, so don't be so surprised if you catch them both gaining feelings for you. She explained while the blonde took this info in. Wow. I guess I still have a lot to learn when it comes to being a true alpha huh? He asked the vixen who nodded. To be perfectly honest, despite my past life I never had the chance to actually find a female who'd want to be with me aside from you. Though your past self died during the process, the Jubi soul was reformed into me and merged with my soul, as well as its abilities. It was mostly because we were at war with that prick and the traitor. Atomi blinked a few times and tilted her head to the side a little. She was about to speak up until she and Naruto sensed someone watching them. Shinji-san, it's rude to be spying on a fellow ally. He called and said Devil of the Mist appeared rubbing the back of his head sheepishly. Sorry. An old habit I picked up when me and Zabuza were members of the Anbu Assassin's Division. He apologized and glanced at Hitomi. I never thought I'd meet the most powerful up close without fearing for my life. Last I heard his old man sealed you inside of him. Said Vixen shrugs and brushes a bang back. What? Did you expect some bloodthirsty monster who is hell-bent on raising villages to the ground and devouring for the fun of it? She asked in a bored tone. Shinji snorted at the statement and shook his head. I may be human, but I'm not short-minded when it comes to her in the blonde Gaki's case. I've seen my fair share of what humans are capable of doing to each other. He answered. Ain't that the truth? The clan are one example, especially since they do anything to gain power, even if it means killing family in order to do so. A cursed clan with a cursed bloodline. I can see the perks of having such powerful eyes on your side, but the cost in my opinion is too great. Anyways, is there something you need? Naruto asked the Zanbato wielding shinobi. Yeah. It involves my brother currently being a missing nin. Even though he is in the bingo book for the failed assassination attempt with the state our village is in, we'll need him back on our side as soon as possible. Hell, I heard from your mother that the current Rakage would like to ally with Kiri once this war is over. Shinji answered. I see. So you want me to try to find your brother once we leave, correct? Naruto asked the man who nodded. I'll see what I can do. Knowing my luck I'll run into him soon, and I can at the very least try to get him to come back to Kiri, though that'll more than likely have to involve a fight between us. Now it was time for Shinji to snort. You think? Zabuza only acknowledges the strong since in our country we respect strength. How do you think Mei became the leader of the rebellion? Though if you do fight him keep all of his limbs intact because I plan on beating the crap out of him once he sets foot into Kiri. Shinji started with an evil gleam in his eyes. Naruto on the other hand sweat drops. Wow. With a brother like him I can see how Zabuza turned out. Then again Karabi and E-sensei are the same since the youngest one likes to rap bad lyrics, while the eldest has the tendency to smash a mountain with his bare hands. He thought. Anyhow we've got the villagers heading back and we're gonna celebrate the end of the war. Shinji said, and he, Hitomi and Naruto headed back to the village. For the next couple of days, the rebels and civilians celebrated the end of the bloodline war. During the event the ninja from Kumo, as well as Kashina and her family were hailed as heroes for assisting in the war, and Mei Terumi was given the position of the Gade Mizukage. And Kiri now had the new seven shinobi swordsmen of the mist back. After the celebration, the water daimyo visited Kiri and made Kashina and her family honorary members of water country and was working on an alliance with the lightning daimyo. 
Before they left, the famous members of the group were thanked by the nin who knew of their reputation, and may personally thank Naruto with a passionate kiss, which left said blonde stumped and redder than Hitomi's hair color, and during the voyage got teased a lot by Kakashi. And Rin due to the fact that their little brother had won the heart of Kiri's new cage. Gamagakur no Sado, a few days later. After they made it back to Kumo, Karabi greeted his four students by giving all four of them a group bear hug, squeezing the life out them, and after that event, Kishina informed him of the rebels succeeding in the war and their leader Mei becoming the god in Mizukage. And the water daimyo thanking them and Kumo for assisting. Yagura was gonna do what Karabi did and become a guardian for water country in an act of redemption, as even though he wasn't responsible for the events that occurred. He wanted to make amends for not being strong enough to fight the influence Madara placed on him. So the daimyos along with the cages were gonna work on an alliance treaty in order for Kiri to come back into power once again. Right now Naruto was in an interrogation room that he asked to borrow with the permission of E and was gonna deal with whom he trapped in his dimension. As he walked into the room his Sharingan formed and created a swirl-like ripple that brought Zetsu, who was bound by chains and seals that kept his chakra fully sealed and was on his knees. Hello Zetsu. I hope you like the accommodations in my dimension for the last few days. He said in a fake tone of kindness, well said plant man looked up at Naruto with a glare. Oh calm now don't be like that. I've allowed you to recuperate during those days when I really didn't have to and would have outright killed you. Anyways seeing as you're a member of Akatsuki I'm guessing you were ordered to get the locations of all the current right. Naruto asked Zetsu who remained quiet. Not gonna talk. That's fine with me since it means I'm right about your activities. He said and walked towards a silent Zetsu and crouched down to meet his eye level. I already know about Akatsuki and your real leader. The one responsible for what has happened to Kiri. I believe he was the Sande Mizukage Madara Chiha. He said coldly, and Zetsu's eyes widened in shock. How do you know about him? He's been off the radar since his loss at the hands of Hashirama. Zetsu asked. A feral grin formed on Naruto's face, and he grabbed the man by his hair and pulled him to his eye level. Wouldn't you like to know? I know everything about Akatsuki, and I know you have members like Kisum Hashigaki, Sasori of the Red Sands, Kakuzu the Heart Stealer, Dadara the Mad Bomber, and several others including the name and abilities of the figurehead, I believe his name is Painter Nagato. Naruto answered, and now Zetsu looked horrified. If you know about us then why capture me? Zetsu asked Naruto. Simple. Your abilities allow you to become one with the land and form anywhere, making you the perfect spy. Until now that is since you're nothing more than an experiment created from the stolen DNA of Hashirama Senju that was taken by Madara after he got his ass kicked big time. That and you LL become a nuisance to me if I allow you to continue with your mission and trying to hunt down my kin. And since I already have your ring I have no use for you so bye bye. Naruto finished with a wave and opened both eyes again, revealing his EMS and the last thing Zetsu saw was black flames clouding his vision. The next day. Ureya had just came to the compound Naruto and the others were staying at in Kumo, and when he heard how Naruto defeated the Yande Mizukage, even when the man used the full power of his, he was beyond stumped but was extremely proud with how far his sensei's kids have progressed. While he was staying at the place, Naruto explained everything to his godfather and how he was from a realm that had fallen to Madara's plan and how he used a powerful to absorb Madara, Sasuke, and reform the Jubi's soul and power and become the new Jubi, as well as gain their knowledge abilities, and their eyes. He nearly had a heart attack when he saw Hitomi, but Naruto assured the man that she wasn't a threat to anyone. Naruto also informed Jiraiya that in his timeline, he managed to master the sage arts when he trained with the toads and proved it by showing him the true sage mode, but informed the man to keep it a secret since the blonde only used it as a final resort. But used some of its latent abilities in making his body stronger than it naturally is. Another thing Naruto informed the spymaster of was that he intended to find the other and warn them and their villages about the Akatsuki so that history doesn't repeat itself. Hirei offered to assist Naruto in finding the other containers, such as the Ichibi, Yanbi, Gobi, Rikubi, and the Nabi, and Naruto accepted his help. After that, Jirei left to get his network to operate in locating the Rikubi first. Right now it was dark and Naruto was sitting on the rooftop with Hitomi in her kit form curled up in his lap. Said blonde used his hands to gently stroke her back while she purred in content while staring at the glowing full moon. Should I feel offended by the fact that you're spying on me you gachan? Naruto called out and said female swordsman appeared next to him rubbing the back of her head in embarrassment. Sorry, Naruto-kun. I was just trying to respect your privacy. Oh who am I kidding I was spying on you because I was worried about you. She answered with a blush on her face. She then sat down next to him and hugged her legs to her body. You seem to have a lot on your mind. Is it that obvious? 
he asked, and she nodded at his question. Figures. Anko Chan always did say I was too much of a worrywart and needed to chill out. A small smile formed on Yuga's lips and brushed a strand of hair back. I just want you to know Naruto come that you don't have to do this by yourself. Carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders isn't a healthy thing to do. You should let those who care about you help. She insisted and watched him look down at his hands and sign. You make it sound so easy. Back in my past, I couldn't do anything to save those I cared about. I let them all down during the last war. I was the last member of the Shinobi Alliance alive. He clenches his hands and they start to tremble a little. I failed my senseis, my parents, and even the only person who ever showed me what it was like to be in love. That was when Yuga wrapped an arm around him and gently pulled him close to her. Hey now don't you go pulling a Kakashi on me. What has happened then has happened, and no matter how much we don't want to realize it your past is then. Instead of looking back you should look forward since you've been given a second chance to make things right. She explained. Plus Kashina sensei will more than likely beat the crap out of you for acting broody for the last couple of days. Naruto twitched at both statements. There were a few things that he feared more than anything minus losing those close to him, and they were an angry Kashina and a sadistic Anko when she had him trapped in a corner. But point. So aside from wanting to check up on me, is there any other reason why you wanted to see me, Yuga-chan? He asked with a grin on her face. Said former Anbu blinked in confusion for a while, but then a tint of pink formed on her face. From the way you're blushing you wanted to have some alone time with me right? He teased me. Hitomi was snickering in her mindscape, and Yuga's blush increased. No I was just concerned about you, that's all. She stated. Sure you did. Anko did mention something about you wanting to touch my sword. I never knew you were a closet pervert Yuga-chan. He said, and she attempted to give him a brain disaster to the head, only for her fist to phase through him, and she got up cherry-faced, stomping off cursing Anko for that statement and muttering about blondes while Naruto snickers. She makes it too easy hahitomi chan Naruto asked a vixen who nodded. You keep this up, and she'll probably go after you with a sword you pervert. She answered. I resent that. I mainly tease and flirt. Kakashi Nai-san and Jiraiya Kaiofu are the biggest perverts to ever live. He replied while striking her back could be and heard from behind the Namika's family's compound, and it was caused by none other than Naruto. He was currently crouching down a little with his legs spread slightly apart and was clutching his right arm that had the Rikiri fading and leaving electric residue. Naruto currently was wearing his black sleeveless shirt and pants and had his ninjado strapped to his belt, similar to how Sasuke had his Kusanagi Chikudo sheathed in Naruto Shippuden and had beads of sweat dropping from his face. Boy how many times was that? Naruto asked Kakashi with his Sharingan activated. Said Copy Ninja was watching from a distance and watched his surrogate little brother. That was around four times Naruto. Same amount as me though by the amount of chakra you have, you can possibly use it two more times than I can. He answered. Earlier you were capable of using the Chidori at least nine times which is very impressive since they are both A and S ranked and take a lot of chakra. No kidding. Not even the Rasengan took up that much chakra considering the chakra in it is more compressed. The only suggestion I can come up with when using them is to lessen the amount of chakra I use and switch to using them for stunning instead of killing, but it would lessen their power in terms of force and penetration. Naruto explained as Kakashi nodded in agreement. Very true. That's why I only use them if the situation is dire, and the same with the Sharingan in my left eye. You on the other hand don't have to worry about that effect like I do. He replied while putting a hand in his pocket. Also those variations of the Chidori that you showed me were very impressive. I haven't considered making variations of my own original, especially that full body Chidori that can defend and attack simultaneously or create a spear version using nature transformation and shape manipulation. That is beyond incredible. Naruto nodded in agreement. Yes, making variations based off of your techniques is very tough to pull off. I remembered when I was completing my old man's technique. Talking about exhaustion, it took me almost a month to complete it, and I almost lost full use of my right arm when I first used it. The blonde replied while Kakashi blinked in astonishment. It's called the Rasen Shuriken, Spiraling Shuriken, and it's a Rasengan with a curved four-pronged shuriken forming around the center of the technique, along with it being combined with my wind element. The Rasen Shuriken creates countless microscopic wind blades that damage the body on a cellular level. It produces so many individual strikes that not even the Sharingan can see all of them. The wind blades sever nerve channels in the body, leaving the target unable to move after being struck. They also attack the chakra circulatory system, which cannot be repaired by any form of medical ninjutsu, and depending on how severe the damage is, the target may not be able to perform ever again. If Kakashi didn't have his mask on then his jaw would have dropped onto the ground. 
of that magnitude shouldn't even be possible for anyone, no matter how skilled they were, to create and master, but then again Naruto was well known for his unpredictability. Now can you even imagine being hit by that attack and having countless invisible microscopic blades made of wind cut through your body at the cellular level simultaneously? Naruto asked with a grin on his face, and Kakashi paled at the thought. Remind me to never piss you off. Kakashi said nervously while rubbing the back of his head. Oh don't fret I only use it on my enemies, though I happen to have created a Rasengan version of the Senen Garashi that I'll more than likely use on chronically late perverts who read smut. He said with a straight face, but was laughing his ass off on the inside when he saw Kakashi place a hand over his rear and sweat bullets. Well that reminds me I promised Rinchan that I'd take her out on a lunch date today Jana. He said sunshine out of the area while Naruto blinked a few times. Lunch date. It's 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and Rin Ni Chan is at the hospital assisting with the physicals. He said to himself, and then wiped a bead of sweat from his forehead. He looks at a target that was a long distance from his person, and once electricity roars to life around his right hand. Chidori Iso, 1000 bird sharp spear. He thrusts his hand forward, and the technique extends into a long spear of energy that ascends towards the target and pierces it. Naruto then brings his hand back, and the technique retracts into its normal form, and the attack dissipates. Okay the extension was around 15 meters long. 5 meters longer than when the team could use it, but still it doesn't hold a candle to my K's no ISO, wind sharp spear, since I can practically use the wind around me to increase its extension without using too much chakra. He said to himself, and that was when Derry and C appeared and were stumped at the demolition site. Aikami must you always turn your backyard into a war zone? The dark-skinned man asked the blonde who turned around and simply shrugged. No, but it regenerates thanks to the seals placed in the area, so I can rough it up all I want. He answered while sea sweat dropped. He's worse than Karabi Sama when he goes to train in the valley. The censor muttered as his fellow blonde grabbed his jacket and slung it over his shoulder. So what's up? I know you two didn't come all this way just to say hi. Naruto asked the two who nodded. Got that right. Boss has got us, along with Kakashi Haddock, Amoy, and Shinku doing a mission that involves a sighting of the vessel for the Rikubi no Namakuji. His name is Yudakata, and he was last seen hanging around Nami no Kuni. He stated. I see. Does Kiri know? He asked and got a nod from the man. Yeah. The new Mizukage is currently sending some ninjas out to search for those that went rogue during the purge and have them reinstated. She already sent out a squad of hunter nin to track the other vessel, but were informed not to approach him thinking that he'll still be hostile, so she sent a scroll asking us to assist them in approaching Yudakata, since he appears to have someone accompanying him in his travels. We have to convince him to go back to his village. Derry explained. Sounds like a plan. Give me a sec and let me get my gear ready. He said sunshine to the compound. Nami no Kuni shores. The squad that consisted of four Kiri hunter nin were at an empty dock, waiting for the support of their allies from Kiri. That was when Kakashi, Derry, C, Shinku, and Naruto appeared before them. The squad captain was the first to approach them. So you're the backup breakage Dono sent us correct? He asked and got a nod from them. What's the current situation involving the target? Kakashi asked. He's still in Nami no Kuni and has what appears to be a female with blonde hair and seems to be around the same age as them. The leader answered and pointed to Naruto and Shinku. From the looks of it she seems to be his student, so we don't know how well trained she is in the ninja arts. Though from what we have witnessed he seems to be intent on protecting her. From whom we don't know. He explained. Naruto on the other hand rubbed his chin in thought. So he's intent on protecting her huh? She must come from either a family of royal status or possess something extremely dangerous, since those two would be the only reason. He stated while Derry and C nodded in agreement. That could be it. Since Nami is a neutral country with no ninja in it, it is a better place to stay secluded in and away from other ninjas. Shinku replied and looked at the hunters. Can you tell us about Yudakata's abilities when he was a ninja of Kiri? The nin looked at each other and nodded. Of course. Yudakata has a water affinity being a resident of Kurigakur and all. He also possesses a unique form of ninjutsu based on bubbles. This style of ninjutsu is shown to be very versatile. Capable of tactics beyond simply harming opponents, the bubble grants Yudakata a wide array of offensive and defensive options in combat. They can also be used transparently and can be used as defensive barriers or to blend in with his surroundings. The leader explained. Bubble line based ninjutsu huh? That's the first time I've heard of it. Derry said in a lazy tone. This coming from someone who can use the Sandame Rakage's black lightning techniques. Naruto mutters and cracks his neck. Anyways, where was the last place you saw them at? He asked Kirinin. 
The last time we visited him, a family near the shores invited him and the girl to stay at their place for a few days. Hunter Nin 3 answered. The only issue is trying to approach him without having a fight to endure. The Kashi on the other hand was pondering on the info they were given and rubbed his chin in thought. So our best bet would be to have someone they would least expect to be a ninja after him. He stared and looked at the Hunter Nin. You four would be out of the question and so would I do to my reputation as a former ninja of Konoha. Barry and C would not be a good bet either since he would suspect that Kumo is either after him or were hired to capture his student. That was when Shinku spoke up. So me and Naruto-kun would be the only options. He wouldn't suspect two teenagers being hired to search for him and no one knows about Naruto defeating the Yande Mizukage yet, nor is he in the bingo book. The only issue is our last names so we should settle for just using our first names. Naruto nodded in agreement but he did catch on when she said Kun in his name. Barry and C also nodded, as did the Kiri Ninja. Then it settled. We'll have Naruto and Shinku approach them first before doing anything else, but if it gets out of hand we'll have to intervene and use force to talk to Yudakata. The leader finalized and looked at Naruto and Shinku. We'll keep our distance by remaining in the secluded areas around the house unless something serious happens. Also be careful of Yudakata's Jinchuriki forms. Even though he doesn't like to rely on them, he is capable of using its full power like Yagura was. He warned the two who nodded and Shunshin out of the shore. With Naruto and Shinku. The twins were leaping from tree to tree in the forest while keeping a lookout for Yudakata or his female student. As they continued to hop through the forest. Naruto sensed something, as did Shinku, and they both stopped, looking at each other and nodding. They slowly made their way down the tree branches until they were on the ground. You sensed it too. Naruto asked Aridid who nodded. Okay now let's take this slowly. He said, and they started to zigzag by the trees, while keeping their chakra suppressed. They found themselves heading to a clearing and stopped behind a large tree. They poked their heads out on each side and saw two figures. The first was a tall thin young man with pale golden eyes and dark brown hair that reached the base of his neck. The side partition lets a large portion of his bangs cover the left side of his face. He wears a long, light blue kimono adorned with a small emblem of three bubbles on the back below the collar and an orange sash. He carries a bamboo jug, filled with a soap solution, and a pipe. The other is a full-figured girl with dark green eyes, a widow's peak, and mid-back length dark blonde hair. She wears a light violet and white top, black shorts, a black skirt, black high boots, and light violet wristbands. They are Yudakata and Hader. Is that them? Shinku asked Naruto who nodded as they watched Hader perform in the water while the vessel for the six tails watched. With Yudakata. The former Kirinin was watching his student perform a Tepidama water bullet at the targets he set up and was highly impressed with how far she has gone in improving her water affinity since they first met and was very pleased at how hardworking she was. As he was watching, a frown formed on his lips. Hado. That's enough practice for today. Take a break. He called out. She stopped her technique and looked over to see a small smile plastered on his face and nodded happily. Hi Shisho. She responded back which irked him a little since he really didn't like the title. Said bubble user pulled out a pouch full of water and tossed it to her, getting a thanks from the female blonde. I have something to take care of. Stay here for a while until I get back. He instructed. She looked up at him and nodded knowing that he was probably gonna deal with some ninja that were spying on them and watched him leave the clearing and head into the forest. As he made his way into the forest he looked around the area and analyzed his surroundings and afterwards stopped in place. You can come out now. He said in a deadly tone and placed his hands on his pipe. Naruto and Shinku walked out from behind a tree and approached Yukitaka who slowly narrowed his eyes. They seemed to be the same age as Hot Air yet despite their appearance, they appeared to be very strong and not wise since they were compressing their chakra. If it wasn't for my enhanced senses I wouldn't have even noticed they were in the area. No need to fight us, Yudakata-san, we're not your enemies. Shinku said and could tell by the look on Yudakata's face, he was very wary of them. Is that right? Why should I believe you two aren't really hunter nin or bounty hunters? He asked in a calm tone while Naruto stepped forward. Because if we were hunting for you we wouldn't be talking now would we? Plus we wouldn't have waited for you to leave your student behind and if we wanted to could have attacked and captured her. Naruto answered in a matter of fact tone. Yudakata had to admit Naruto was right and he could tell that out of the two of them, Naruto was the strongest despite his age. We just want to talk for now about Yudakata, nothing more. Really? talk about what exactly? He asked. Naruto was about to speak up but then turned his head towards the bush of a tree. He pulled out a kunai and flung it at the tree, causing a blur to leap out and land on the ground. On face and body, a receded hairline preceding dark, unkempt near shoulder-length hair and a distinctive cleft in his chin. 
He has a large shuriken on his back. Utakata's eyes widened when he saw this person. It was Chushin, a member of the Magaki group who was a group of four bandit ninjas. Yu Utakata snarled out and pulled out his pipe while Chushin smirked. Yes, me. So where's your little student Utakata? You ditch her like you did your former master. He jeered while the man's eyes shifted from brown to gold. Naruto appeared behind Chushin whose eyes widened and saw a pair of cold blue eyes staring back at him with a kunai drawn in reverse. Naruto swung it at the man's head, only for Chushin to back paddle away from them and pull out his shuriken. Who the hell are you Chushin spat out only to send something under him and leap away as Shinku's arms appeared from the ground and attempted to drag him down. Don't you know you're not supposed to keep your eyes on the enemy? A voice said behind him. Chushin's eyes widened due to the fact that Naruto was behind him once again. Impossible. How can someone move that fast? He thought as he turned his head and attempted to backhand Naruto across the head with his fist, but the blonde ninja stopped it with his palm. He then twists his body and places his foot on the arm he had restrained, using it as a foothold, and launches himself over Chushin and strikes the man with an aerial axe kick, sending him falling and crashing into the ground. The ninja bandit grits his teeth in pain, holding the side of his head. Fucking Brad Isle. He didn't get to finish because he was ensnared by a bunch of red tendrils. He coughed out and turned his head slightly to see Shinku who was using her lengthened hair to restrain Chushin. The smirk forms on her face which confused him until he started to cry out in pain due to the fact that he was getting zapped with lightning that was running through her hair. As this was occurring, she was unaware of the fact that a large shadow was looming over her. She turned her head to see a large hulking man with his fist raised back and swung it down on her. Naruto appears via Shunshin and stops the attack with both hands and is pushed back a little. Shinku releases her and Chushin falls on his knees panting heavily from the damage while Shinku retracts her hair back to normal. Damn that bitch. He snarled out and struggled to get up. Meanwhile Naruto narrows his eyes dangerously and uses Hidori Nagashi to zap the man violently and said person grunts in pain until Naruto releases him and kicks him in the torso, sending him skidding back a couple of feet. Shinku on the other hand heard the bitch comment which made her brow twitch dangerously and a tick mark formed on her head. POW. The fist smashed into the man's jaw and he was sent flying back head first into a tree and darkness entered his vision. Naruto on the other hand sweat drops when that happens. Oi Shinku-chan you really need to control your temper. He chastised only for her to give him a look that would make Tsunade proud. Never mind. He muttered. The man he was fighting earlier suddenly formed into mud and sank into the ground. Tunshin's unconscious form also sank into the ground, surprising Shinku, and the two looked around for their attackers. Naruto frowned and holsters his kunai. I don't sense them in the area. He stated. Same here. So what now? She asked while Yutakata walked towards them. We go back to where my student is, and I also want an explanation from you too. He answered. Sure thing, but like we said earlier we aren't your enemy. Naruto said back. Adur was resting against a tree until she saw her master, and the two others walked out of the forest. Shishu. She got up and ran up to the man who smiled. Ano who are they? Not to worry they're not enemies though I didn't get your names. Yutakata said. Sorry I'm Naruto. Naruto introduced. And I'm Shinku. She replied back while the other two raised an eyebrow. Sorry, but we can't reveal our last names due to the enemies our parents made during the last war. The blonde Jubi lied. Yutakata looked at them for a while and then nodded. I understand. So what do you two want? He asked. You know about the bloodline war that occurred in Kiri right? Shinku asked Yutakata who nodded. Well about a few months ago it ended and Yande Mizukij lost. She finished, causing the bubble user's eyes to widen in disbelief. You mean the rebel faction won? Yutakata asked, getting nods from the siblings. Yes, and Kiri now has a Gade Mizukage who goes by Mei Turumi. Apparently Yagura was put under power by the instigator of the war and since then has been under his control until now. Yagura was freed from the illusion and has stepped down from his place to work as a guardian for not just Kiri, but all of Mizu no Kuni. Naruto explained to his fellow students. Yutakata remained silent for a while as he took the info in and sighs. So the rebel faction won the war and Yugura is taking the position of guardian for our homeland. So what does the new want with me then? To return to Kiri. Yutakata asked Naruto who nodded and asked him a question. The man sighs and brushes his hair back a couple of times. I'd be more than happy to return, but I can't right now. Naruto frowned and raised his eyebrow, and why is that? He asked. I'm currently protecting this place from a man named Gato. He owns a major shipping company and has been trying to take over Nami no Kuni with his wealth, as well as hiring bandits and missing ninja. I heard that one of the missing nin was once a member of the last generation of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist. 
Beto has hired him to take out anyone that opposes him, and it happens to be a bridge builder named Tezuna and his son-in-law Kaiza, who was proclaimed as a hero of this country due to the fact that he saved a small town from being flooded over a few years back. I see. Any idea on who the swordsman is? Naruto asks only to get a negative shake. Not yet. Once I have dealt with Gato and his forces I'll be returning back to Kiri. He answered and walked over to Hadaru, and they both disappeared in a swirl of bubbles. Well it looks like we'll be staying here longer than we thought Shinku-chan. Let's go inform Aniki of what we found out. He said getting a nod from her, and they shunshin out of the clearing. The Kashi was leaning against a tree as he listened to Naruto's explanation about Yudakata and his apprentice acting as protectors for a man named Tezuna who was a bridge builder and his family from Gato who was attempting to take over Wave by force and using his army of thugs. And low ranked missing men to cause trouble in the towns. So until Gato is dealt with, Yudakata won't be returning to Kiri, correct? Kakashi asked the blonde who nodded and got a sigh from his surrogate older brother. Well this just complicates things the Kiri and Bu are getting restless about getting him back to Kiri to be reinstated, I guess our best option would be to track down and take care of the camps these bandits are residing in while you and Shinku assist Yudakata and his apprentice. He theorized. Yeah it does sound like the best plan of action for now, and also from what he told me, Gato apparently hired a former member of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist, and that right there is a slight problem. Naruto replied, and there are only a few I could think of that he would have hired. It would either be Raiga Kuritsuchi, Kisum Hashigaki, or Zabuza Mamichi. Raiga and Kisum are out because they've disappeared off the map for a while, so my hunch is that Zabuza is the hired help. The Kashi nodded in agreement since there hasn't been a word concerning Raiga or Kisum, and there was a rumor of a man wielding his Ambitu roaming around the smaller islands and countries not tied to ninja villages. Naruto knew how strong Zabuza was from his time since he was pretty much on equal grounds with Kakashi, even when he used the Sharingan. Yes it would okay then I'll go and inform the others about our new objective, and, as for you and Shinku your objective is to find Gato's hideout and end him. The copy nin instructed, getting a nod from the two siblings. Later on that day. Beto was pissed. No he was beyond pissed, and the reason for that is because he just found out that several of the bandit camps that resided around parts of Nami no Kuni were taken out by a group of ninja, and what made the matter worse. The so-called Magaki group he hired to scout the area were just as useless due to some of their members being injured and needed to be treated afterwards. Damn it, why is good help so hard to find these days? He snarled out before glaring at the figure who was reclining back in a chair in the shadows. I expect you and your partner to do better, or you can forget about getting he didn't get to finish due to a large blade appearing in front of his face, and he shuts his mouth as a pair of murderous eyes glare at him. First of all, don't put me in the same category as those weaklings you hire, and secondly, shut up and let me do my job. Said the gruff voice. Just be sure to have my money ready or else, get it? Gato nodded in agreement before the blade was pulled back into the shadows. Meanwhile, Naruto and Shinku were on a boat surrounded by the bodies of bandits they killed, except for one who was pressed against the wall whimpering in fear. Please don't kill me, I'm just a hired grunt. He begged as he looked into the icy gaze of Naruto. Tell us where Gato's located and I'll consider you as a loose end. He demanded, and if you lie then consider yourself shark bait. Shinku responds by swinging her blade sideways and cuts down a barrel without even looking, causing the man to pale and tremble in fear. Okay I'll tell you just don't kill me. The location of Gato's base is he didn't get to finish due to his body jerking left and right before collapsing onto the ground, surprising the two. Naruto kneels down to the dead body and notices two protrusions crisscrossed in the neck. Huh? So they're finally here. Naruto mumbled confusing Shinku for a few seconds until the white fog formed around them and the ship. Shinku tightened her grip on the hilt of her blade and narrowed her eyes. There's a powerful chakra source nearby and from the look of it, it's on par with Kakashi's. There's another one that's powerful, but not as strong as the other one. She informed her brother. I was wondering when you were going to show up as Ibuza Mamachi, Demon of the Mist. Naruto called out and heard a deep chuckle echo through the mist. Well well, it would appear that my reputation is even known amongst the children of this world. On the far end of the ship, the mist revealed Zabuza who was standing on the starboard. Zabuza was a tall and noticeably muscular man with pale skin, short spiky black hair, brown eyes and small eyebrows, wearing bandages like a mask over the bottom half of his face and wore his forehead protector sideways on his head. His outfit consisted of a sleeveless black shirt and matching pants complete with a waist guard and yet again, Kurigaku's striped wrist and leg warmers. Strapped to his back was a massive single-edged Zanbato-class broadsword that was basically the same size as his body. 
The blade itself has two cutouts, a circle close to the top, and a semicircular one nearer the handle that aptly fit the sword's purpose of decapitation. So this is Ibuza Mamachi. He looks just like his brother. Shinku commented to Naruto who nodded in agreement. Indeed he is. I must say I didn't expect a ninja of your caliber to work for scum like Gato's Ibuza san Naruto said to the demon of the mist. Ninjas gotta eat, but I didn't expect a bunch of kids to cause this much trouble. Either you two are very strong for your age or you're extremely lucky. He commented, getting a smirk from the blonde. I'll take that as a compliment, but let me ask you this then. Did you know that the vessel for the Rikubi was protecting Tazuna and his family from Gato? I believe his name is Yudakata, does the name ring a bell? He asked a former Miss Ninja whose eyes widened and then narrowed. You're serious? He questioned. Like a shark attack so even if you manage to beat us, and that's a big if, you still have him and several Kiri-Anbu to deal with. Edo only has a small army of bandits which isn't very impressive for a ninja or samurai, and the only ninja he has on his back and call were those second-rate losers, you, and the chick who smells a little like ice and medical herbs. Naruto answered. Tabuza's eyes widened in surprise not because of the ninja on the blonde side, but the fact that he knew his assailant was there with them. What are you talking about? I have no accomplice. The man tried to bluff only for Naruto to chuckle and shake his head in amusement. The nose knows Abusa. She is close by, and we can sense her chakra signature, and from its nature is ice-based, so she has to be a bloodline holder. Shinku suddenly vanished, and the sounds of blades clashing were heard. Tabuza cursed, as Haku, the fake hunter nin leapt onto the clearing with a needle in her hand in a struggle with Shinku, who had a kunai drawn in a reverse grip in between Naruto and Zabuza. Said swordsman was stumped, as they were able to catch his accomplice, and then narrowed his eyes at the blonde. These kids are more than they appear to be. No one has ever been able to catch Haku, let alone detect her unless the person was a sensor type or an Inuzuka. In the struggle, Haku was having some trouble keeping Shinku at bay with her. I must say you surprised me earlier, but unfortunately you're at a disadvantage. She informed the redeed who raised an eyebrow. Is that so? Shinku questioned the masked girl who nodded. Yes because for one thing you can't perform seals for your ninjutsu, and two we are surrounded by water. Haku brought her hand up and proceeded to do a series of one-handed seals. Shinku's eyes widened as she witnessed Haku do one-handed seals. From the bay, water rose out and formed around Haku and Shinku, shifting and shaping into floating water needles. Sensatsu Sushim, thousand flying water needles of death. She stomps her foot onto the ground before leaping backwards while her water needles descend upon Shinku and erupt into an explosion of water. It's over. Haku stated. No, it's not. A voice whispered into the masked Kinoichi ears, causing Haku's eyes to widen under her mask. She spun around and attempted to backhand the redeed, but Shinku caught it in her hand and gripped it tightly. Haku then doubled over in pain due to Shinku driving her knee into the girl's stomach, making her cough out in her mask. Shinku then pulls back and grabs Haku by the collar of her shirt, spins around, and Judo flips her over her shoulder, resulting in Haku flying and crashing hard onto the wooden floor of the ship. Zabuza was surprised at what he witnessed right now. Unbelievable, Haku not only lost in speed with that girl, but her strength is even greater than hers. I'll admit Haku said you're fast, but I'm faster. Shinku stated while the girl struggled to get up on her feet. How? I didn't even see you move, and you were surrounded with no form of escape. She wondered as she held her side and winced from the knee strike Shinku delivered and knew a few of her ribs were bruised from the blow. Shinku on the other hand smiled. It was during the time you were talking about how you had me at a disadvantage. During the time you were creating your I was creating mine as well. After I created the water clone, I instantly substituted myself with it. She explained. Naruto on the other hand smirked. Her speeds improved a lot, but then again we come from a family of speed demons right dad. Zabuza wasn't pleased with the turn of events. He knew Haku was strong, but the redeed was on a whole different level. He eyed the blonde for a few seconds and frowned. This is not good unless she uses her bloodline, Haku won't stand a chance against that girl, he then slowly reaches for his weapon pouch, only to feel the sharp edge of a kunai pressed against his throat. Don't even think about it, let the girls dish it out while we find out who the true demon is. Naruto challenged, and Zabuza smirked under his mask. Gladly. He said before dispersing into water. Naruto suddenly ducks, as Kubakirabacho bypasses his head and draws a kunai from his sleeve. He spins around and thrusts his weapon into the area where the man's kidney would be, and the two remain still. Naruto glances down and notices water flowing out of the injury and frowns. Another clone? I'm starting to feel offended. He muttered as the clone dispersed into water like the last one before the mist thickened some more. 
You've piqued my interest boy, you and the girl are on a whole different level ninja wise, so let's see just how good you are. Zabuza echoes throughout the fogged area. Naruto remained calm and kept eyeing the area. So you're going to use the Muin Satsujin, silent killing technique, huh? I figured, as much since it is your specialty, killing your target who is unaware of what will happen until it's too late, especially since you know that striking any of the eight vital areas of the human body will mean instant death. Tabuza once again chuckles in the white fog while Naruto slowly slid into a stance. So you know of my methods. I'm honored. Normally children your age don't know the true aspects of being a ninja, but you're different, you're not like that judging from the look in your eyes earlier. Naruto frowned a little as she heard this. You don't have the eyes of a rookie, you have the eyes of a war veteran, someone who has witnessed death firsthand and has spilled untold amounts of blood on the battlefield. The true soldier of the shadows who has stared death in the face countless times and has fought enemies even stronger than himself. Your eyes tell your whole history to me. And what do they tell you? Naruto asked calmly. Pain, suffering, anger, rage, regret, sorrow, and resolve. You grew up having to fight for what you had and had to gain power through blood, sweat, tears, and pain. You've had to kill your heart and emotions in situations that would destroy the sanest of men in order to keep yourself from losing whatever last bit of innocence you had left. You boys are the true epitome of a ninja. Zabuza finished. Naruto couldn't help but smirk and close his eyes for a second. That makes two of us Zabuza Mamachi. Tell me how much that girl means to you? He asked in the mist only to hear silence. You know what? Don't answer that because I already know the answer to the question. His eyes opened back up and were now as cold as ice void of compassion. The time for talking is over. Let's go. With that he instantly vanished into the mist and... Clang. Tabuza grunted as Naruto's kunai slammed into the flat side of his blade and started to push the blonde back only to see Naruto hold his ground. He grinned as he saw the intent the boy's eyes had and from the looks of it, he was out for blood. Zabuza's blood. Haku on the other hand was hopping backwards as a volley of kunai hit the area she was formerly at, deflecting several more with a before throwing several at her. Said Redeed was dashing at the girl and instantly moved to the left and kept sprinting at Haku. Damn it, she's too fast and too strong for me. I have to find a way to cut her speed in half in order to level the playing field and my only option is to use that. She thought as she evaded several slashes from Shinku and ducks from the 8th one. Haku attempts to sweep and kick Shinku off her feet, only for the redeed to flip backwards and land a few feet away from her. What's the matter? Having second thoughts in facing me? Shinku questioned. Not in the least I was trying to figure out a way to reduce your speed, and now I have. Haku informed the redeed who raised an eyebrow. Is that so? If that's the case then I can't allow you to gain an advantage over me then. She was about to dash forward but nearly fell over. What the? She wondered before looking down and saw sheets of ice creeping up her ankles. You were so busy trying to outmatch me that you never noticed the trail of water we were making. The one I used is Kumurai no Enman, Creeping Ice, which ensnares my opponent's feet into a casing of ice, reducing their speed level. She informed her opponent who frowned. You know this won't keep me at bay for long right? Shinku asked the fake hunter Nin who nodded. I am aware of that because I made it to only slow down my opponent, but it'll buy me enough time to put the battle in my favor. Haku replied and proceeded to perform a series of one-handed seals. Shinku grunted as she tugged on the ice and scowled. She then claps her hands together and forms a tiger seal. Katen. Kinetsu Suru, fire release. Heat up. Her skin complexion starts to turn red and glows a little while and steam rises from her body. The ice around her feet starts to slowly melt back down into water. This allows me to convert my chakra into heat and allow my body temperature to rise in order to maintain myself in a harsh environment and depending on how much chakra I put into it, I can even melt ice. Once the ice is fully removed from her feet, she shakes the remaining water off and taps her foot onto the ground. The Jutsu. Maku Hayashu, Secret Technique. Demonic Ice Mirrors. Haku chanted as she performed an odd hand seal, which resembles tiger with the middle fingers crossed over the index fingers. Shinku felt a vast chakra spike in the area and watched as a total of 21 ice mirrors formed and took the shape of a dome around her, reflecting Haku's image off of them. This is my ultimate technique Kinoichi-san, and as you can see there is no means of escaping or countering it and thus your speed will do little to help you now. She informed her quarry. Shinku took in her surroundings and frowned a little. She's right, in this dome of mirrors my speed has been cut down, and the worst part is that she is reflecting off these mirrors, and I have no idea which position she'll attack from. As she pondered on this, her senses went on full alert, and she instantly leapt to the left, but hisses when a blur nicks her cheek. 
Even though my reflections hinder your ability to find the real me, I still have my natural reflexes and sixth sense to help me. She declared while some blood dripped down the cut she had on her cheek. That may be, but how long can you keep avoiding my attack? Sooner or later you'll have to attack. Haku states. Longer than you can maintain this since a move of this magnitude will take a toll on your chakra reserves. Shinku remarked. Haku remained silent since she knew the retreat was correct. That is why I'll have to finish this quickly. Haku says back, getting a scoff from Shinku. In your dreams. She said, performing a series of hand seals and stopping at snakes. The ponytail in her hair snaps, freeing her hair from its restraint, and spreads out before wrapping around her body and hardens with a sheen to it while the barrage hits her in all directions. When the attack ends her hair spikes up and sharpens into needle points. Ninpu. Hari Renden, Ninja Art. Needle Barrage. Shinku fires a barrage of red hair needles at the ice mirrors, but they bounce off the mirrors, not even penetrating a single one of them. It's impossible for you to pierce my ice mirrors, as they are stronger than steel, and most fire won't even melt them. Haku informed the Ritid who cancelled outer. I see that the only option is to find the real you then. Shinku then pulls off her headband and ties it around her eyes. She then draws her katana from her sheath and gets into a stance with her blade poised into a thrusting position and her left foot spread apart from her right slightly. My eyesight won't help me in this situation, so I'll have to rely on my eyes, ears, and chakra sonar. Haku on the other hand was wondering what she was doing, cutting off her eyesight, but shook the thought out and dashed at her from behind. Shinku's ears perked up as she heard the sound of clothes fluttering. As Haku comes close, Shinku spins to the left and swings out, nicking Haku in the leg, while the girl lands into one of the mirrors in the upper left corner. Meanwhile. In the fog the sounds of blades clashing and metal bouncing of metal echoed through the mist. Naruto appears and skids backwards a little before stopping in his tracks with a katana drawn. Zabuza appears on the left with his blade raised over his head and swings it horizontally at Naruto's side. Said blonde blocks it with the flat end of his blade, but due to size and weight of the zapatu, he is pushed back by the impact. Naruto then pivots his foot and uses his weight to leap over the blade and into the air. Fool. Zabuza then spins around and swings his blade as Naruto descends. Said blonde spun rapidly as he descended to his foe. He instantly brings his blade down in the stabbing position and plants the blade into the ground. When Zabuza was about to cut Naruto in two, he felt himself stop and his arm jerked back. He looks to see that Naruto's katana has stopped his blade by sending it through the circular opening. Naruto once again spun on the cap of the sword and delivered a vicious kick to the man's sternum. Zabuza stumbles backwards from the impact, clutching his chest and losing his weapon. Naruto lands back on the ground and flings the blade far away from the man's reach with his katana. After sheathing his blade he claps his hands together and releases a gust of wind around the area, clearing out the mist completely. Your little dog won't help you anymore Zabuza, now you must face me directly. Naruto says, as he sheathed his blade. Said demon of the mist stared at Naruto for a while before chuckling. So you want to face me up close and personal huh? Alright then you'll get your wish. He announced, cracking his knuckles for emphasis. It's been a while since I've had to beat someone down with my own fists, hopefully my tajutsu hasn't gotten rusty from slaying weaklings. Naruto however smirks at the man and gets into the Gokin, strong fist, stance. Don't let my size fool you Zabuza, you may be bigger than me, but I've taken down guys twice your size, and a little warning, don't blink. He warned. Too bad Zabuza didn't because once he blinked, Naruto was gone from his location, and pain erupted from the man's jaw and skidded back a few feet. He cried out as his head snapped back and blood escaped through his bandage mask, until he stopped in place he turned again, only to see Naruto gone again. I told you not to blink. The blonde said behind the man with his back turned. Zabuza was wide-eyed at the display of speed his foe was showing. So fast. He thought and attempted to deliver a reversal backhand at Naruto, but he ducks under the passing appendage, rears his fist back, and slams it into Zabuza's torso. The runaway Kiri ninja exploded into the water and said a man appeared behind the blonde with his fist raised back. You should take your own advice, Brad. He struck Naruto across the jaw and sent him flying. Zabuza had a gleeful smile on his face as he saw Naruto crash, but it then turned into shock as Naruto dispersed into smoke. But the his eyes bug out and almost keel over from the bone-crushing punch Naruto delivered to the man's gut. I always take my own advice to heart Mamachi and I told you to take me seriously or you will regret it. He said before leaping back in his battle stance. Said man coughed and shook the dizziness away from his head before giving Naruto a heated glare. You're a good kid, I'll give you that much, but I wonder if your partner will be able to take on Haku and her ice-based if anything, she'll have difficulty beating her in her element. 
he boasted, resulting in Naruto chuckling in amusement. Then you don't know Shinku that well. Keke Genkai or not, she is no pushover and will kick your accomplices ass six ways to Sunday. But Haku and Shinku. Haku was panting heavily too, and not just from chakra exhaustion, but also her mask was cracked and had rips and tears all over her body. Shinku on the other hand was still in her stance with a blindfold over her eyes in her stance. She had a few tears in her jacket and pants, but she wasn't worse for wear like her opponent was. You should give up Haku-san, I can tell your chakra levels are depleting greatly from keeping this technique active, and the injuries I've given you don't help either. Shinku insisted. I cannot, not until I have helped Zabuza fulfill his desire to free Kurigakur and end the bloodline genocide that has taken place. Haku answered. Shinku's brows rose up since she had her vision blocked by her headband. What are you talking about? The bloodline war is over. The redeed said before she vanished in a blur of pure speed. Before Haku could snap out of her stupor, she felt a hand grab her around the collar of her shirt, pull her out of the mirror, and slam her back onto the ground, causing her to cough in pain and freeze when she felt the tip of Shinku's katana near her throat. Don't. She warned in a deadly tone. The ice user signs in defeat and holds her hands up, cancelling her and surrendering. Zabuza on the other hand was not happy mainly due to the bruises and cuts going across his body and from the looks of it, the man looked like he had gone through a blender. Damn that brat. He snarled, pulling a kunai out of his shoulder and grunted in pain before tossing it aside. Naruto starts to go through a series of hand seals and forms the tiger seal. Katen. Fushich no Han, fire release. Phoenix flames. He unleashes a flame that takes on the shape of a phoenix that screeches out and descends upon the demon of the mist. Suja no Hiki, water release. Water wall. Zabuza claps his hands together, resulting in water rising from the ocean and in between the sides of the bridge and forming into a wall of water. When the techniques collide, steam spreads out around the bridge. Zabuza looks around for any sign of his foe making an attack until he hears shuriken whizzing into the steamy mist he hops back a few times as they embed the previous spots he was at. That was when four clones appeared on all four sides of Zabuza with their hands in the hair seal. Raiden. Inazuma Cage Eye, Lightning Release. Lightning Cage. Arches of lightning chakra shoot around the clones in a square fashion, taking the shape of a prison cage made of lightning around the man. Shit. Zabuza cursed while Naruto walked up to the cage with his hands in his pockets. I would advise you not to try to escape Zabuza-san. The cage is being fortified by my Raiden Cage Bunshin, Lightning Release Shadow Clones, from the outside, and the lightning is responding to your chakra signature, and you'll get zapped pretty badly. He warned the man who growled at him. Give up, your accomplice has fallen, and you have no way of getting away. Zabuza's eyes widened as he was informed of this and closed his eyes in frustration. Not only did he lose his sword, but Haku was out of action since he felt her chakra deplete greatly and let out a sigh of defeat. Fine, you win. It's not like I could continue with my injuries. He muttered. Naruto studies him for a few seconds before nodding. The cage made of lightning dissipates and the clones disperse as well. Zabuza fell on one knee and pants in order to regain his strength. Shinku was walking to where her brother and Zabuza were with Haku bound in chakra compressing cuffs with her mask off, looking depressed that she failed her master. You alright? Naruto asked his sibling and got a nod from her. Yeah a few scratches here and there, but nothing too serious. She answered before he turned his attention back to Zabuza. So what now? Are you gonna kill us and collect my bounty? The demon asked his captives. Zabuza, if I really wanted to kill you, we wouldn't be talking right now, and taking your life is not a part of my mission. Naruto answered. Zabuza gave the blonde a questioning look, wondering what his true objective was. Our real target is Gato since he is controlling the trade routes around Wave and parts of Water Country. We were hired to kill him and are on a joint mission with some Kiri Anbu and also to search for you as well. Zabuza growled in anger as he heard this. So that Team Yagura finally sent his dogs to me huh? Naruto responded with a negative headshake. Igura is not the Mizukage. Naruto answered as Ibuza gave him a look that said explain. I guess you never got the news, the rebel faction in Kiri won the civil war and Meiturumi is the god in Mizukage. Zabuza's eyes bugged out in disbelief as he heard this. What? Mei's the new Mizukage. His expression returned to normal and chuckled to himself. Why am I not surprised? She was after all the leader of the faction and was the strongest member we had without using her bloodline, but from what I last heard I thought she died from that failed naval assault. He pondered. That is the reason why she has Anbu searching for you, as well as you to Kata-san, because she's sending a recall notice to all Kiri missing ninjas to return back in order to rebuild their forces. Igura was freed from some type of Jinjutsu that was cast on him by an unknown factor, and now he is the guardian of Water Country. 
Again Zabuza was stumped. And how would you know about this Gaki? He questioned. Naruto simply smiled and pulled his hand out of his pocket, brushing his hair back. I was their assistant in the Civil War and I fought and beat him. Now Zabuza and Haku were bug-eyed. What? No way. He shouted, unable to believe that a kid no older and his accomplice was powerful enough to beat Igura. Is it that surprising? Naruto asked with a trace of humor in his voice. Hell yes it is. How did a snot-nosed brat like you beat a Cajun Chiriki of the Sambi? The sound of his voice caused the birds in the area to flock off and then Zabuza was on the receiving end of a brain duster to the skull by a ticked-off Shinku. Baka. Are you trying to attract every bandit around the country? Keep your voice down databane. She yelled at the man, but then clamped her hands over her mouth from the verbal tick she got from her mother. Naruto looked at her blankly for a few minutes before he laughed at her, causing Zabuza and Haku to sweat. Shinku on the other hand glared at him with a tick mark on her forehead. Kami Shinku-chan I thought you got over that verbal ticks when we were kids. He chastised and caught her fist in his palm, eye smiling. Shut up. It's Ka-sen's fault I got that stupid verbal tick. She growled out. Not to mention her temper and violent reactions. He finished and caught her other fist in his other hand. I hate you. Shinku grumbled as she pulled her hands away from him and turned away. I'm not that I enjoy sibling bouts, but would it be possible for me to get treated for my injuries? Zabuza asked the two. Sure, but in return you have to tell us where that little weasel is hiding. Naruto offers it to the man and Zabuza nods in agreement. Gladly I didn't like that damn midget anyway. Not too far from here, Gato's mansion resides on an island full of ruins. From what I saw there was a building with a spiral on it that matches the ones on your headbands. He said, causing their eyes to widen. That time built his mansion on the grounds of my ancestors. I'm gonna destroy him. Naruto growled in his mindscape, unaware that he was releasing a large amount of murderous intent around the area, causing Haku to tremble from the feeling while Zabuza sweated. Dear Kami, what murderous intent? Whatever Gato did to piss off the kid must not be good. Now I can see why Yagura lost to him, his chakra signature is practically cage level. Zabuza thought as he felt the power roll of the blonde before he calmed down. So after that little scene, Shinku went on ahead and healed Zabuza and Haku, but mainly Zabuza since Naruto literally kicked the man's ass to kingdom come. Afterwards, Zabuza escorted them to the island where Gato's lair was located. During their travel there Naruto notices some ruins with a spiral symbol carved onto them and were covered in moss or degraded. Shinku noticed it too and wondered if this island was once her mother's home before being destroyed during the war. Zabuza stopped on a large tree branch, as did Haku. So this is the mansion huh? Naruto asked as he gazed at the mansion and got a nod from the man. Yep this is it. Can't believe that the midget wastes money on something so big. He wondered. Maybe he's compensating for something he lacks downstairs. Shinku commented with a grin, causing Haku to giggle silently at the jab while Zabuza snorted. Nice one Shinku-chan, those insult lessons with Anko-chan are paying off. Naruto gave her a thumbs up which she returned before getting serious. Joking aside, how is the security here? Shitty, aside from that ninja gang who aren't even a threat, the worst he has are a bunch of bandits and low-class bounty hunters. Breaking in will be easy. He answered as he knew Gato wouldn't hire any high-ranking ninja since they would get the idea of simply killing him and rob him of his money. When that came to his head, he mentally slapped himself. Why didn't I think of doing that damn it? It would have saved me a lot of time and gotten my ass handed to me. I wonder just who trained these gakis. So we just have to deal with a couple of second-rate bandits. This'll be like stealing a Nikki's smutty books when he's not looking. She declared, earning a sweat drop from her brother. She's been stealing Kakashi's Icha Icha books from under his nose. I was wondering why she always stayed in the restroom so long I thought it was her time of month. He thought, but shook the thought aside. Alright then time to exterminate the rats. Video. The Let's others start not the story. What do you mean my mansion is being attacked by Zabuza? Gato roared from his desk, snarling at the cowering form of one of his bodyguards. It's not just him sir there's also his partner and two kids who from appearance look like ninja have not only decimated the security outside the mansion but also the ones inside as well. We're all being slaughtered. He answered before an explosion went off causing the room to rumble and the sounds of men screaming in agony. Beto was gritting his teeth in anger and fear and slams his fists onto the ground. Damn him damn that bastard. He roared. Get out and stall those fools or there will be hell to pay. The man stumbled back a little and then headed for the door. I told you that this would happen. A voice said from the shadows. Edo seethed and aimed his glare at the figure in the shadows. Shut up Howie. Get down there and take care of those intruders. If you succeed I'll triple your pay. Said ninja chuckles and vanishes into the shadows. Meanwhile. 
The bandit lets out a bloody cry as Abusa bifurcates him with his cleaver blade, spilling his blood and entrails onto the ground. Haku on the other hand throws several dozen of the mercs into ice, leaving them encased in ice with horrified looks on their faces. Wow's Abusa when the security here sucked you weren't kidding. Shinku stated as she stood on the groaning forms of two bandits, digging her heels into their spines. What kind of dumbass hires an army of bandits to guard his mansion? The cheap kind, and despite his empire Gato doesn't like to pay a lot of money to his protection, so the best way to hire more guards and pay less would be to hire bandits, since they're dumber than doorknobs. Naruto answers and backhands a charging bandit into a wall without looking. Aku was about to say something, but then jumped to the side, avoiding a volley from the shadows, and threw her own. A blur leapt forward to avoid the ones Haku threw and landed before them smirking. Aoi Rakusho, what is the thief of the rage and no ken, sword of the thunder god, doing here? Zabuza wondered. There to kill you all. Zabuza stared at him for a few minutes and looked back at Naruto, Shinku, and Haku. He's kidding right? He questioned and got a shrug from Naruto. Doesn't look like it. He answered in a nonchalant fashion. A tick mark appeared on Aoi's head and he glared at the group. You dare look down on me? I can kill you all without even batting an eyelash. He proclaimed, only for Zabuza to chuckle at him. Oh please, the only reason you're in the bingo book in the first place is because you stole the weapon of a nidame Hokage. The demon of the mist answered in an uncaring manner, infuriating the former Kanohanin. So we're basically facing a no-name loser who joined a backwater village. I'm not impressed. Naruto said in a bored tone. Aoi gritted his teeth and aimed killer intent at the blonde who didn't look the least impressed. I'll show you who the no-name loser is, you little punk. Aoi drew the hilt of the legendary blade, and the blade hummed to life with lightning cackling around it. With the blade of the nidame Hokage I am unstoppable. He declared with a maniacal grin on his face. Naruto simply stared at him in an uncaring manner and yawned. Shinku-chan you want this loser? Naruto asked and got a negative shake of the head from her. Now you can take him, I would even waste staining his blood on my kunai or shuriken. Her reply caused Aoi to see red and rush at them. I'll kill you damn brats. Aoi roared, swinging his blade downwards and grinning evilly as he thought he cut Naruto in half, only for Naruto to fade away. Your eyes are rather slow. A voice said above him. Naruto was crouching down on the man's shoulders with his ninjato pointed in the stabbing position over his skull. Aoi froze in disbelief, wondering how the blonde demon was able to move at such a speed. Oh well. With that, Naruto brought his ninjato downward and the blade ran through Aoi's skull and jaw, causing blood to squirt out and drip on the marble floor. Naruto pulled his blade out and hopped off while the frozen body hit the ground like a rock and formed a pool of blood. He whips the blood off with a flick of his wrists and sheathes it before pulling out a storage scroll, severs Aoi's head and seals it as well as the lightning blade. Let's move on shall we? Both Zabuza and Haku had sweat drops on the back of their heads as they saw Naruto head to the larger doors that lead to Gato's office. Zabuza Sama, were you able to read his movements? Haku asked her master adopted father figure. Nope, and if he were fighting me with that level of speed I'd be dead right now. Damn speed demon. He muttered before joining up with him and Shinku with Haku following. Beto was scrambling to get everything that he could carry him in order to escape. Damn it I've got to get the hell out of here. He said as he made sure he had all of the documents to his accounts, both legal and illegal. Boom. Beto cried out in shock as his door sailed past him and into the walls, leaving large imprints on it. His blood grew cold and an expression of horror formed on his face as he slowly turned around to see Naruto walk in the room with his hand in his pockets, but that's not what frightened him. It was his eyes. Eyes that were as ice cold and held them to his death. It was enough to make him break out in a sweat and shiver in fear of his life. What do you want? He asked, whimpering in fear, as Naruto slowly walked towards him with his eyes locked on his target. Your life. Was Naruto's answer, causing some of the color in Gato's face to fade away. My life. What for I haven't done you any wrong. The midget replied back only to get blasted by a burst of murderous intent that made him piss himself. Behind them Haku, Zabuza, and Shinku watched the scene, wondering why Naruto was so pissed off at the man. You dare claim that you have done no wrong yet you attempt to take over a country just to satisfy your own pathetic ambitions. Naruto brought his foot down on Gato's knee, hearing the bone make a sickening crack while the man screamed out in agony as his knee bone snapped, but that is not the only reason why I'm pissed off at you. The reason why I despise you now is because you had the nerve to build your mansion and let your low-life trash defile the lands of my ancestors. He added more pressure on the man's leg and Gato whimpered out in pain before howling again as Naruto broke his other knee with his foot, shattering the bone and possibly ruining his chances at walking again. 
Shinku on the other hand realized what he meant and gasped since she recognized the symbols on some of the ruins, which look similar to the headband she and Naruto wore. This island is the home of our clan. She says to herself. Zabuza widened when he heard this and looked back at her. You're both Uzumakis. He questioned, getting a nod from her. He palms his face in stupidity for not realizing this sooner. Haku however was confused, wondering what he was talking about. Zabuza sama, who are the Uzumaki? She asked the man who sighs, rubbing the back of his head. The Uzumaki clan was a clan that existed long before you and I were even born. From what I've learned, they were experts in the field of and were so good that it made them both respected and feared amongst their allies and enemies, combined with their unnatural longevity and levels of chakra. And stamina made them warriors on the battlefield, it didn't matter how many hits they took, as they would just keep going until their foe was dead, and from what I've heard they were also distant relatives to the legendary Senju clan. He explained to his adopted daughter. Beto was trembling like a whipped dog as he looked into the eyes of his soon-to-be executioner. PP please don't kill me I'll give you whatever you want be it money, land, women anything. He begged the blonde. Naruto says nothing and instead reaches out and picks him up by the collar. He activates the Sharingan and Gato's eyes glaze over. You're going to give me every single account number to your bank accounts, your vault, the deed to your fortune, and sign your shipping company over to Nami no Kuni. He instructed the man to get a nod. After Gato did, as instructed, Naruto took everything out of the vault that consisted of gold, gems, and even scrolls that had a spiral symbol which Naruto believed Gato was gonna sell to the highest bidder. He sealed away the scrolls and money into separate storage scrolls and afterwards knocked Gato out with a vicious punch to the jaw, breaking it. He then tosses one scroll to Zabuza who caught it but wondered what it was for. The money the team was supposed to give you for completing your mission. Naruto replied as he strapped a large scroll behind him and left along with them. Once they got far enough from the mansion, Naruto turned around, performed a few hand seals, and fired a large fireball the size of an elephant at Gato's mansion, as well as the camps around it, and it erupted into a fiery explosion. They returned to the boat they borrowed and were getting ready to sail back to Nami no Kuni. Naruto stares at the islands where his clan resides and sighs. One day I would return and bring the Uzumaki clan back to greatness. He said to himself until Shinku called out to him and he headed back to the boat. After they made it back to the country and to Tazuna's house, they saw Kakashi sitting on top of a tied-up group of ninja who were glaring or attempting to glare at the man due to their positions on the ground, and another appeared to have been beaten to death while Yudakata was standing over him. Blowing bubbles out of his pipe with hot air behind him. Shinku recognized a couple of them and raised an eyebrow. Hey Naruto, those are the times that tried to ambush us a few days ago when we first met Yukataka-san and Hot Air-chan. She narrowed her eyes at the lanky-looking one who was sweating bullets, and if I recall, the skinny bastard under the transvestite called me a bitch. A dark aura that signified death lined around her form as she cracked her knuckles. The transvestite on the other hand took the name as an insult. Who are you calling a transvestite you ugly slut? He growled only to freeze up and shiver in fear as he saw Shinku's hair rise up slowly and her eyes glowed red. Tushin's facial color drained from his face as she slowly approached them and slowly drew her blade. You idiot she's gonna kill us. He said with fear in his voice, causing the other two to tremble, as she advanced on them only for Kakashi to appear behind her and place a hand on her shoulder and the hilt of her katana. Now, Shinku-chan, you can't kill the prisoners. He reasoned with a teenage redeed who huffs and still glares at them. He's right sis, first we have to pry whatever info they have in those brains of theirs, they sigh in relief, believing that their lives would be spared after that is done, then feel free to carve them up, burn them alive, drown them, or beat them to the brink of death and leave them in the forest. And let the predators decide. Naruto finished with a feral grin on his face, causing Shinku's eye to light up with joy, the ninja group to look horrified, and Kakashi to nearly face fault, but regains his composure and sweat drops as he looks back at his surrogate little brother. He's even more sadistic than his mother, Anko. He thought while well, rubbing the back of his head in a sheepish manner and then noticed Zabuza and Haku. Greetings Demon of the Mist. Zabuza turned his attention to Kakashi and raised his brow. Happy Ninja Kakashi didn't think I'd meet you in a place like this and with Kumo Ninja no less. I thought you were Konoha Shinobi. He questioned. Kakashi chuckles and shrugs his shoulders. Well I was, but certain circumstances lead me to leave the village in order to protect those two, so now I along with a few others work as mercenary nin for hire. He answered. That was when the four Kiri Hunter nin appeared before the group. So I take it you four are the ones May sent to search for me correct? The leader stepped forward and nodded. Correct abuse san and not only is she gonna give a full pardon, but also fully reinstate your name amongst the ranks. The captain answered. And my accomplice. 
Will she be able to join Kiri as well? Zabuza questioned the masked shinobi. The captain pondered on it for a few minutes before turning his attention back to Zabuza. Honestly it's not my call, but since we need all the strength we could get, then it's possible for your partner to join within the ranks, as well, the captain glances over to Yutakata, the same offer is for you, as well Yutakata-san, and your apprentice, should she like asylum in Kiri. The vessel for the six-tailed slug looks at his apprentice, and the hunter Nin, and nods. It would be for the best, as I do not wish to remain on the run, and leave my student in harm's way from all the constant traveling we've been doing so yes I will rejoin Kiri. Yutakata said. Hadari's eyes lit up in glee, as she heard the man she admired call her his student. So what are we gonna do about them? Amoy asked, pointing to the bound ninja gang. Give them to me, Shinku answered with a dark smile on her face. They'll make good practice dummies for the ones I've personally created. The four ninja were, as white as ghosts, as the teenage Riti cracked her knuckles with a gleeful smile that spelled death for them. Amoy, Dari, and Sea Sweat drop at this, as do Zabuza, Haku, Yudakata, and Hadaru. And people say I'm a demon, Zabuza muttered. The Kiri and Bu looked indifferent due to the masks on their faces, but they each were inwardly grimacing over this and felt sorry for the group. Note to self, keep Anko from creating a miniature Uzumaki version of herself. Kakashi thought since one Anko was bad enough, but then again so was Kashina, who was able to instill fear into his sensei when they were dating and got married later after the last war. A week later. Azuna managed to fully complete the bridge that would connect their country to the mainland after Naruto and the others raided Gato's mansion and destroyed everything he created. Naruto gave the old bridge builder the contents that consisted of Gato's finances and deed to the company, as well as the list of ports the man owned, and with the help of the wave daimyo and his contractors, they started to slowly but surely take full control of the dead man's shipping company. During the end of the week, Shinku got to know Haku and Hadaru, and they each chatted about their travels around the elemental continent. Tabuza on the other hand challenged Kakashi to a friendly spar, since he wanted to personally see just how powerful the son of the White Fang was which Kakashi accepted, and the match ended on a draw due to Kakashi using the Sharingan during most of the fight. And also mimicking the man's hand seals, and which were chakra taxing, but despite that the two ninja did respect each other's skills in the ninja arts. Right now Naruto was standing at the edge of the bridge, staring at the vast ocean with his arms folded, pondering on his next course of action. So far, he has encountered B, Yujito, Yugura and Yutakata, and that left hand and Rashi who were in a Wagaker, while Fu was residing in Taki. He knew Iwa would be out of the question for now due to their grudge against his father's actions in the last war, and since Takigakur was more of a neutral country, he'd have no problems getting in a meeting with the vessel of Jamei, the seven-tailed beetle. Aside from them, he also had to deal with Danzo and Arachimaru soon, since they would become a major problem for him in the future, if left to their own activities. The major problem would be Danzo since the man is residing in Kanoha, planning whatever went through his dark and twisted thoughts, he wouldn't be able to get close to him. Next was Arachimaru who he knew was in the process of creating a village of his own in order to annihilate Kanoha with the assistance of Suna, who will join in the invasion due to the snake disguising himself as the Yandane Kazakiyaj since he killed the man during the month-long training period. Next was Gara. Naruto knew that his once enemy turned ally had a screwed up seal that put him through insomnia, preventing him from sleeping peacefully and becoming mentally unstable at that. The blonde figured that if he could approach Gara and find a way to alter the faulty seal that was placed on him, he'd have better control over his power and mental state, as well as remove the insane monk's influence from Shukaku's. And putting the sand demon in its right state of mind if it had one. Lastly there was Akatsuki who wouldn't be active for a while, since they're acquiring new recruits for their cause and finding the whereabouts of the Jinchuriki, but due to Naruto disposing of Zetsu earlier, their plans would be drawn back for a while, since he was their spy in the organization. His primary concern was Conan and Nagato Uzumaki who goes by the alias Pain, since they along with the late Yuhiko were Jurea's students and was trying to find a way to convince them to switch sides, knowing that Danzo was responsible for what they became when he sided with Hanzo. And betrayed them, costing Yuhiko his life. If he could accomplish this then Madara would have a major setback in his plans and weaken the man further. As he pondered on this, Kakashi appeared beside his surrogate brother with his book in his hand. You do realize that if Rin sees you with that book, you're gonna be in big trouble right? Naruto reminds the man and smirks when the silver-haired Jonin shrugs. Don't worry about me Naruto, I only read them when she along with your mother, Anko, and Yugao are not around, but I've been missing a few of them lately. Have you been reading them? He asked in an amused tone, only for Naruto to snort an annoyance. Please I don't read that smut my godfather creates. Besides I can at least think of several females out there who would love to do half of the things that old pervert writes in his books. 
He commented with a sly grin on his face, well said girls each sneezed several times. Bakashi on the other hand glanced at his book, and then a picture of Rin in a sexy, revealing nurse's outfit poofs in his mindscape winking, and he grins in a perverse manner, unaware that Naruto was sweat dropping at the sight. Said Jonin gets out of his stupor, and pockets his book. Time to go to Itado, I'll have plenty of time to read this after my happy time with Rin-chan, so let's go. He said in a giddy tone, and skips to the boat, leaving the blonde looking disturbed before shaking it off, and warps away. After saying their farewell to the others, the team from Kumo and the mercenary ninja went their separate ways, but not before Haku gave Naruto wink with Hadari doing the same for Amoi, causing the Kumo Chunin to blush and avert his gaze from her, while Naruto chuckled in amusement. Knowing that Kari would never let Amoi hear the end of him finally meeting a girl once he told the energetic Reed. In Kumo. Namaka's estate. The say Kishina was shocked would be an understatement. She was speechless when Naruto presented to her the scrolls that contained a vast amount of the Furinjutsu, Kinjutsu, and other high-level ninja techniques her clan created. And what freaked her out was that most of these were either A or S rank jutsu that she thought were lost when her home was invaded. Hitomi was amused by the expressions her former vessel showed as she examined the scrolls and stared at her son in shock. I can't believe you found all of these. Most of these are techniques my grandparents and parents created. She said. Honestly I'm surprised that Ratgato found these on our ancestors' lands. I'm pretty sure that money-hungry team was gonna sell them in the black market, thank Kami he didn't, especially if guys like Orochimaru or even Donzo got their greedy hands on them. Naruto replied. Ishina inwardly shuddered at the snake or warhawk gaining any form of knowledge on her clan's dot. I'm just glad you found these since most of these are extremely powerful and in the wrong hands can become dangerous. That is why only an Uzumaki is able to understand the true complexity of seals, better than most seal masters, even Jiraiya would have to thoroughly study a high-class seal for months, before being capable of understanding how they operate correctly. Ishina states, but then sends a thankful smile to her son. So the only vessels left are the ones for the Ichibi, Yanbi, Gobi, and Nanabi who are each remaining in their villages, correct? That, and Akatsuki though the organization is still searching for recruits to their cause by their leader, he quoted, as the image of Nagato and Conan appeared in his train of thought, I know their true base is located in Omegakur, where Nagato is the current ruler since he killed Hanzo. And anyone he was associated with. He explained. Kishina on the other hand was grim. She knew that even if Hanzo was past his prime, he was still a very dangerous individual, especially with his summons the legendary salamanders, and let me say this Nagato was indeed a powerful ninja. As he managed to turn Kanoha into a crater with a gravity base that is powerful enough to crush and deflect anything, and even Jiraiya was no match for him, even when he used his sage mode, he was only able to take out one of his paths. But that was mainly due to the powers from the Rinnegan. Even if he possessed my creator's eyes, his power pales in comparison, since the Rakuto Senen mastered the power of his eyes, and from what you showed us from your time, his actual body was beyond crippled due to summoning that demon statue. And had to rely on his bodies in order to move around. Hitomi stated. So he would be vulnerable to attack then. Shinku wondered only to receive a negative shake from Naruto. No, he'd be protected by a woman named Konan, who has the ability to use origami as a weapon and make them sharper than steel, and trust me when I say you'll receive more than just a simple paper cut from them. She is also the closest to him, as well as his eyes and ears in aim, with the people dubbing her as an angel with pain being hailed as a god. Hitomi snorted at the thought of a simple mortal being called Kami. It was an insult to the actual deity and any man or woman who had the audacity to declare themselves as such has truly lost their mind. Unknown location. So Zetsu is dead. A figure in the shadows asked the other figure present and got a nod from him. That is most troubling as he was the only one with the ability to gather information faster. Yes he is and that is not all. My connection with Yagura has been severed and is no longer under my control. The second figure replied. But that's impossible unless there's someone out there whose eyes are as powerful as yours. That's the only theory I can come up with. The second figure replied. Should we send one of our recruits to hunt down this anomaly? No, we'll continue as planned, as we do have a few spies in the villages who can tell us who the vessels are exactly. We'll deal with this person when the time comes. The second figure replied. Very well then, but if this person continues to be an annoyance, then he shall face the wrath of a god. The first figure replied. From the darkness a Sharingani appears and narrows at the man. Don't get arrogant pain just because you have the Rinnegan, as it will be your undoing in the end, and, as I said, stay focused on our objective, as they are our first priority to bringing true peace to this chaotic world. As you wish Madara-sama. The end. Thanks for watching my video, sayonara.